Hi everyone, welcome to Crypto for the Culture, DeFi All Odds 2022. My name is Nina Blankenship. I'm the CEO of Crypto for the Culture and Crypto Tutors. In 2022, Lisa and I started the Crypto Tutors YouTube channel and interviewed over 70 diverse trailblazers in success stories in crypto. Women are in crypto, marginalized communities are in crypto, and people of color are in crypto. In 2021, when we could finally leave our homes because of COVID, we started to attend crypto conferences in person and online. And we noticed that 80% of the attendees and speakers were not diverse. When you go to the bathroom and the men's restroom line is out the door and the women's line doesn't even exist, you know there is a problem. What we found is that many diverse speakers were applying to speak, but they were actually being turned down and rejected. For attendees, what we noticed is the average crypto conference was costing hundreds to thousands of dollars, making the barrier to entry too high. In October 2021, we decided to do something more. And we made history by creating Crypto for the Culture. Crypto for the Culture was the first ever crypto diversity conference providing diverse representation and elevating the incredible innovation in diverse leaders in success stories. Crypto for the Culture is free to attend, breaking down all barriers to entry for a free crypto education. Never before has there been a diverse conference like this. The majority of our speakers today are female. Stay tuned because today we have incredible speakers, inspiring stories, success stories, careers, and giveaways. Now I'm going to hand it over to my best friend and co-founder and host of Crypto for the Culture, Lisa Francor. All right, all right, all right. Hey, thank you, Nina Blankenship. I, uh, as you mentioned, am Lisa Francor, Chief Revenue Officer, co-founder of Crypto Tutors. Super grateful for my bestie and the entire Crypto Tutors team. You know who you are. We don't have time to list all of your names, but I promise to shout you out at some point and during the day. So, folks, welcome to Crypto for the Culture. I am a proud Haitian American. Shout out to all my Haitians. The Haiti, by the way, is the first black republic and most successful revolt in history. Revolution, suffice it to say, is encoded in my DNA. And Crypto Tutors is an award-winning crypto education company dedicated to simplifying crypto and blockchain through e-learning, one-on-one tutoring, the Crypto Tutors YouTube channel, as Nina mentioned, and conferences like this where we pop out to pop off. Our mission is to empower the world, especially marginalized communities, around how they may transform knowledge into wealth. But as we all know, knowledge is potential power. It's the application of that knowledge that moves the culture on an individual level and society at large forward. Which brings us to the exact theme of the conference, Defy All Odds. A double entendre with dual meanings. One side of the coin, or shall I say token, <laughs> means going against, like what we're doing here today. Crypto tutors and friends will be discussing strategies and tactics you can employ to navigate these economic headwinds successfully. It may be a bear market, but as Crypto Hayes, who we'll hear from next, tweeted, haters gonna hate, but my portfolio about to appreciate. <laughs> Crypto for the Culture is where we're connecting global citizens with the world's brightest technological minds for free 99. Yup, that's right, free 99. 
This is history in the making. And as I, AK Fancy Fod, likes to say, if you want to predict the future, you have to create it. This is about creating a future where you become your own economy, leveraging tech solutions to do so. But how, you may be asking? Fret not, we got you. We're crypto tutors. You're about to meet the trailblazing pioneers, literally architecting and engineering the future who you may or may not know. Take, for example, our first guest, Arthur Hayes, one of the most successful crypto entrepreneurs in the world, a real OG who's been in the game since 2013. So what can you expect today? What does crypto for the culture, defy all odds, have in store for you? Well, you're going to learn how to reclaim your power. We're going to learn how to reclaim our power. We're going to learn how to maximize our earning potential. We're going to learn about retaining ownership and a whole lot more. Matter of fact, Coindesk reported yesterday or two days ago, more than a third of black and Latino voters told pollsters they were more crypto curious now because of the economy. And we heard the culture loud and clear. Thank you to all of our sponsors, including Cash App, Fidelity, Arculus, and donors like A16Z Culture Leadership Fund, and all the speakers who invested your time, energy, genius, and resources to bring this vision to life. So let's get it popping. Let's go ahead and bring on the man, the myth, the legend himself. A man, if you know him or have heard of him, really doesn't need an introduction because he's that lit. <laughs> but before we get into it, I'm going to set the stage while we're queuing up Mr. Arthur Hayes himself. I got to let him know who's who and what's what. Mr. Hayes, just for those that may not be as familiar, is one of the most successful crypto entrepreneurs in the world. As I mentioned, he's a world-class trader, fintech pioneer. He co-founded the wildly successful BitMEX trading platform, which, by the way, was the originator of Perpetual Swap, a popular derivatives trading product unique to digital ass in the uh, unique to the digital asset space got to make sure that we say it right he's also passionate about helping spread financial literacy and educating investors about crypto and digital assets which is why i know he wanted to share his wisdom today with each of us so in the in his own words right if you follow his uh his twitter crypto haze you you just he puts the lit in literacy amongst other things but in his own words, I'm going to quote his tweet. Welcome to crypto for the culture. Hello. What up, what up, what up, what up, what up? This is so exciting. I'm so happy to have you. Arthur Hayes, ladies and gentlemen. You can't hear them applauding, but I promise you, this is what's happening right now. <laughs> I can already see it. So yeah, this is going to be one for the history books. Welcome to crypto, to the culture, as you so eloquently stated. <laughs> Thank you. This is great. I'm so glad to be here. You welcome. You welcome. So Arthur, um, you know, I hope I did you justice in just telling folks Thank you. About who you are, what you're about, all that good stuff. But crypto for the culture and this conversation, you know, what does participating in a conference like this mean to you? Like, why did you ultimately choose to give us your time, your energy, and so forth? I mean, number one, I like that it's free, right? So my goal is to spread a message, right? And if the message costs a few hundred dollars, a few thousand dollars, and a, you know, around the world plane ticket and a hotel room and a Uber or Lyft or whatever to get to, then I'm only going to be reaching a certain amount of people. And at the end of the day, you know, we want to spread this virus that is Bitcoin and, and crypto in general. We want the most number of people to hear about it. And whether you can invest, you know, one U.S. cent for a billion dollars, it doesn't really matter. The more people using this technology gives us more of a network value. So this is a great platform to speak to people who otherwise wouldn't, you know, attend a crypto conference. Or maybe wouldn't even read my blog or whatever. And so, you know, we get to get into some things. That's awesome. That's awesome. You know, and that's also too why it was so important for us to bring you to the community. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself in your own words? I mean, I covered, you know, some of the highlights. 
tell us a little bit more about who you are as a person and, you know, any interesting tidbits or facts that we might not know about you. Yeah, so I grew up in Buffalo, New York, slash Detroit, Michigan, in, in the U.S. Um, Buffalo is kind of like two. Canada, though. Let's keep it real. That's not really New York. Basically, right? Buffalo and Detroit are we'll Canada, right? we'll so I, I, spent, I spent a lot of time in Canada. So, yeah, half Canadian, essentially. <laughs> um, so, you know, grew up there. Uh, my, both my parents were in the auto industry. I ended up going to University of Pennsylvania, the Wharton Business School for undergraduate went to Philadelphia and like had an amazing time. I loved it there, go Quakers. Um, and while I started the freshman year, I started learning Chinese. I had a, a desire As most to- freshmen do, just start learning, you know, Mandarin or what have you. Okay. Yeah, so every day I had Chinese class and I got okay. I wasn't really fluent, um, but I knew I wanted to go out to Asia. And so I applied to go to the Hong Kong <clears throat> inter- not internship. Study abroad at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, all the way out in new territories in Hong Kong. And I did that my junior fall. Uh, so fall of 2006, uh, I get to Hong Kong and I'm like, wow, this city is amazing. Um, great people, nightlife's amazing, you know, financial center of North Asia, to China, all that kind of stuff. And so I decided, okay, I'm gonna come back to Hong Kong um, and, and work. And you know, luckily enough, I applied to just about every single investment bank. And the only one that gave me an interview was Deutsche Bank. Um, I got an internship, came back to Hong Kong and Singapore the following summer in 2007. Um, did a decent enough job to get invited back for a full-time offer. And then I moved up to you know, Hong Kong full-time in 2008. And my first day on the training desk was the day that my brothers went bankrupt um, that, that Sunday night. And so was, I arrived, you know, sit down, I know, you know, fuck all about anything. I can't hear you. You're mute. I said that the industry was literally imploding. Like your first much yeah. day on the job. It's like everything around you is just like blowing up. But nonetheless. Exactly. And so yeah, so all running, around, running around saying, you know, don't trade with this bank, don't trade with this that bank. And I'm just, you know, you know like, oh, what the fuck did I just get myself into? And you know, that was the start of my financial services career. I spent five years doing that and you know. Looking back on it, luckily, I got fired from my job in 2013. You know, you know, junior on the desk, so big line of layoffs at Citibank. And so my number was up. And so I, you know, was told to go pack it. And at the time, you know, the what you thought was going to happen in finance, like making a lot, a lot of money. And, and really... Arthur, hold on one quick second. Uh, sure. Forgive me for interrupting, but the audio is a little bit, um, getting a lot of feedback. So maybe it's the earbuds. Hello, is this better? There's still a little bit of, okay, try it again. Hello? Bluetooth headphones sometimes make that noise. Okay, we're just looking at the chat and seeing. Okay, would you be able to use uh, the audio from your computer instead of your AirBuds or? Cause yeah, you know, this is live. So there, might, there, might, there might be some background noise, so hold on. Let's just see how it goes. Do, do, do. And thanks, everybody. People are like, you know, chomping at the bit to hear every bit. Is this better? Yes. Yes. Say it. All right. There we go. Crypto for the culture. Okay. All right. So we're going to leave off. So, yeah, I'm in, I'm in Hong Kong. I get to the training desk. I get fired five years later. And I'm like, okay, what am I going to do with my life? Uh, I, I, you know, finance was okay. I wasn't really getting to where I wanted to go in terms of my career. So, like, well, I don't really have any real skills as a, a trader, right? I know how to use um some excel blah 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 like i can't code anything i'm not an engineer so like okay i need to do something different and i read about bitcoin you know a few months back in early 2013 when the price spiked up to 250 dollars and so I dollars can we just have a moment yes. on that like that's what an og you are because i don't think people are connecting the dots on like when i said og 2013 like what kind of numbers we're talking about just three digits yeah and it went down to, you know, below $100 that summer. And, you know, I got involved and I was like, wow, this is really interesting. Um, I want to read as much as I could. So I read the white paper. I researched every single exchange that was in existence at the time. I even emailed Coinbase for a job uh, to run an Asia outpost in Hong Kong. And they said, no, we're not, we're not really focused on, on uh, Asia right now. We're going to stay, stay in the U.S. I'm like, okay, cool. Uh, and so I started trading. 
And, you know, I did okay for myself. I paid my rent with my, you know, profits from trading. And I guess applied some of the things that I knew from trading for traditional markets to crypto. And it was quite easy because it was, you know, quite inefficient market, not that many people trading. Um, and so I was taking a more, you know, market neutral approach to how I was trading. I wasn't just going long Bitcoin, which yep. in hindsight would have been a better trade, but, you know, not really how I, how I thought about the world. So I did that for a few months and then decided that I wanted to start my own exchange. Uh, and I was lucky enough to find my I, two co-founders. You literally were like, ah, I just figured out my own exchange. I need people to understand that like, okay, this is this is the caliber of individual you are. Sorry to interrupt, but I just had to call that out. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> Super casual. Oh, go ahead. You were saying you met your co-founders? Oh, yeah, so I was saying, so I found my two co-founders, Ben Dilo and Sam Reed. They, they're the guys who know how to build systems, web architecture, trading systems. And I pitched them this idea. Let's build a derivatives only um, Bitcoin in and out only exchange. I'm like, okay, let's do it. And so in early 2014, we started building. By the end of 2014, we, we launched. Uh, and, you know, then the rest is history, you know, BitMEX and perpetual swap, yada, 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 Bitcoin. But yeah, that's sort of the, the genesis of my journey to, to crypto. And not the M's, but the B's later, you know, and if you know, if they know, they'll know what I mean by that. Um, okay, cool. Because I was going to ask you, you know, you touched upon how you transitioned from TradFi, traditional finance to DeFi. Um, let's talk a little bit more about some of the challenges you had to overcome, right? Like you make this transition, you're, you know, literally pioneering an entirely new, um, arena with finance. What are some of the you know, roadblocks that you and your team encountered that you had to figure out how to overcome? I think the number one is like abject failure, right? So we launched in November, 2014. We probably did a sum total of like a thousand US dollars with the trades for the next nine months. Um, we had zero product market fit. We had an idea of how to construct a derivatives exchange. We had an idea of what the customers might want to trade, but it was not what reality was. And so we we're like, okay, well, what, what are we doing here? We're not making any money. We didn't have any VC investors. It was just our, all of our own, our own pockets. And so we had to think, okay, what do the customers actually want? Let's go back and, and think about the feedback that we've been getting from talking to our customers day in and day out for the next last nine months. And so we made the decision that we're going to focus on China, right? China, you know, was the dominant place to trade crypto. They have a particular way of um, wanting to trade derivatives. Let's take what our Chinese competitors are doing and do it better. Right. And so in, starting in October 2015, me and Ben, we moved to Shanghai for three months um, to get better acquainted with uh, with China, mainland China, not like Hong Kong and China are you know, different. And we raised our leverage to 100 times leverage. We changed the way um, we margined our contracts. Uh, we offered yeah. different things. And that's sort of what uh, struck a chord with the, the Chinese traders who were dominant uh, at the time. And that was sort of the genesis of like, okay, wow, we're actually doing millions of dollars a day worth of trading volume. Like this is a viable business. You know, we can pay ourselves, we can hire employees in the future, that kind of thing versus literally we would go whole days without a single trade on the platform. So I think being able to suffer nine months of complete failure and still have the belief that this can be successful is probably the number one thing that any you know, entrepreneur can, can go through is right. Like how much do you believe in your idea? that you can fail for so long, yet continue doing it. Um, and obviously the runway isn't infinite, but you know, luckily, you know, we didn't have kids or, or, or family to support. So, you know, quite young at the time that, that was, we had that going for us where we could suffer, you know, with zero income for, for that long period of time. That would lead you to become, you know, who you are today which is the amendment of DeFi all odds. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you, you touched upon um, just kind of the predicament on the personal level. You didn't have, you know, a family and, you know, you guys were young. Um, it's important to note that approximately 2% of all venture capital is awarded to women. And the reality is that marginalized communities in general have just a much harder time raising capital to finance their businesses. So can you tell us a little bit about like how you and your team were able to, um, you know, raise and, you know, for the founders that are out there or those that are considering, you know, starting their own businesses, what are some of the, the tips that you could share that helped you share the funding that you needed to get it popped off? Well, I guess number one is focus on the customer. I think 
you know, I now invest in a lot of early stage companies and had a lot of failures and a few successes. Um, but at the end of the day, what I think a lot of people have gotten caught up in is this, I need to have like XYZ brand name, Silicon Valley, or maybe Beijing VC fund on my cap table. And they yep. considered it a success that they were able to con convince them to sell part of their company to these, to these funds. And that's kind of looking at it the wrong way. Success is building a product that your customer wants and the customer is willing to pay the real price for it. The real price is a price that allows you to offer that service and have something left over for yourself and you know for the rest of the people at your company. It's not just an exercise in putting it together a pitch deck, creating some met metrics that may or may not correlate to actual customer satisfaction with your product and being able to sell it to a VC fund. And so I see a lot of people spending a lot of effort on that part of it and not of, okay, I have this idea okay, I need a customer to pay for it today because I can't afford to just do this forever versus I need to spend all my time thinking about how to make the perfect pitch deck, you know, go to some conference, pay these people a lot of money to have some booth. And we went to Web Summit and that's a knock on Web Summit. We paid, you know, a few thousand bucks to have a booth sitting there. It was a complete waste of money. Um, you're there with thousands of other people trying to get the same, you know, 20 VC funds to like come and just like look at what you're doing versus yep. taking that time and just spending it more on what does my customer want? How do I get my customer to pay me something? For what I'm delivering to them versus how do I get a VC for for to invest in me? So yes, I think there's definitely, you know, to that that statistic is is an issue, but I would push back and say that the object, the, the goal of being your own person and running your own business is not to basically become a working for a VC fund, which is what you'll do if you now start getting into this game of capital raising, right? Once you get on that that treadmill of, okay, I've sold, you're selling 20%, deleting yourself 20% every round to get to that eventual IPO. By the time you get to that IPO, you're not making any money for yourself, right? You're making money for a bunch of other people and you may or may not have a product that's actually viable in the market. And so I think that is a mind shift that the successful entrepreneurs are able to do. And I think this current macroeconomic environment where you have, you know, Fed just raised interest rates another 75 basis points yesterday. Joe yep. Paul got like, at the press conference basically said he's not stopping anytime soon. The the era of 0% financing for, you know, infinite duration big tech is over. And so the mentality of from 2010 to 2020, let me just raise the next round and I'll worry about profitability later. That is gone. Yep. So just don't even think about that. You should be focused on revenue and profitability from day one. And whether or not you get VC investment, that's kind of icing on the cake. And they, they come to you on your terms because you now have a real business. So I think that's what people need to focus on. You know what I love? I love the fact that you underscored how important it is to finance your business through revenue. You know, there's this mindset that like, oh, you know, I'll, I'll just raise, I'll just raise. But the reality is that if you have a viable business, then the, the revenue will speak for itself. Um, so thank you for calling that out. I, I want to touch upon, you know, this is crypto for the culture. So, you know, I want to touch upon, um, you know, what does, what does culture mean to you, right? Like we talked a lot about, you know, finance and we talked a lot about, you know, how that plays into your, you know, professional trajectory. Um, but let's d dive in a little bit to what culture means to you. Yeah. So to me, and I think it's underscores that when you start thinking about NFTs and all this other stuff, culture to me is the excess production of our time, right? So, you know, we spend, you know, our goal of a human being is to get born, eat some food, grow big and strong, have kids and help your kids yep. survive you, right? That's, that's the goal, right? But we've been able to, as a, as a society, move beyond that, where we have all this excess time during the day. And what do we do with our time? We enjoy the fruits of what other people create for us, right? We go to nice restaurants. Um, we listen to music. Uh, we go to nightclubs. We look at art on the wall. We go on vacations, right? We look. We basically enjoy the fruits of civilization. That to me is culture, and culture is the highest calling of a human being because all you're doing is providing the fruits of your creativity for others, and it's completely worthless in a sense because it costs energy to run. It doesn't produce any energy at the other end. But then, why are we doing this whole thing of being a human civilized culture if if we just can't enjoy what other people can create for the just for the sake of creating it? So that to me is what culture is. I absolutely love that. And um, I just got my two minute warning and I know that you and I could probably do this all day. And I have a feeling that we're going to, we're going to make it that we're going to run it back. We're going to run it back. Mr. the crypto days. Um, but you know, keeping hundred thou like the global crypto market has lost more than 60% of its value over, which is over $1.3 billion. Um, so it's safe to say you can't have success without failure, you know, just in general. And we talked about 
that in, in, in your career. But as we close out, uh, can you offer the audience any insights or guidance, right, on taking a chapter from your playbook and defying all odds? So I think the problem that a lot of investors get caught up in is they think that investing is a great rich, get rich quick scheme because that's kind of how it's advertised. Like, look at this person and their fancy lifestyle and all they did was they went and clicked on some, some buttons on the computer and boom, they've got a nice car, they got a house, they've got passive income to go on vacation, right? That's not how it works, right? So if, if you want to invest for the long term, you need to be patient and you need to understand things from first principles. And that's putting down your social media apps and going reading a book reading you know some a, a lengthy blog post by somebody who knows what they're talking about who is not uh, okay. maybe me maybe others i read a lot of other uh, i've spent most of my day reading um and and so it's not fast it's patient and so i'm wrong most of the time but when i'm right i make more money than all the things that i'm wrong at and so that's and that's the goal right and so i think if people can apply that sort of patience to it uh then you're not going to guess oh this is the hot thing i need to I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna make it all right now, right here. Boom! Put it all in there. You obviously buy the highs, things down 95%. You're like, oh, this crypto thing's a scam. Like, what are these guys talking about? How is this a new way for? How is this liberating anybody from anything? If yep. you know, I'm just like FOMOing in and then getting wrecked at, at the bottom. But that's just a patience issue. This is not a get rich quick scheme. Learn about it, understand it, appreciate why we're all so passionate about it, and then you'll understand and make better decisions. So that's sort of my advice. I freaking love it. I am so grateful that we have the opportunity and the privilege to have this conversation, to share you with our community. Folks are already saying, suggest some books and are trying to pick your brain. Um, we have a resource guide that uh, will direct folks, just so everybody knows, to resources like Arthur's uh, blog. And, you know, you are a living legend and we cannot, um, you know, we can't emphasize enough how grateful, how grateful we are for who you are, what you've done, and what you represent. Thank you for kicking off DeFi All Odds, crypto culture, crypto tutors. We're going to back, so don't act like you don't know us when we um, are ready to do so. <laughs> Thank you. It's been great. Thank you, Arthur. Take care. Hi, I'm your Crypto Tutor. Crypto Tutors has created Bitcoin Basics, a free e learning course. This course covers basic crypto vocabulary, the history of cryptocurrency, and steps to learn how to buy Bitcoin. This course was designed with professional animation, fully accessible, no barriers to access, and printable handouts. Complimentary learning opportunities are available to introduce cryptocurrency to their communities. Crypto tutors, crypto tutors. Oh wait, is it time? Did can I just tell you, can I just tell the both of you, like every time I hear the crypto music, I'm just so unbelievably amped, it's ridiculous. So forgive me for dancing. Um, okay, cool. So we had uh, a commercial break. We had Ray Dalio, Kendrick Lamar, uh, courtesy of Cash App, which was ridiculous. We'll, we'll unpack that. I'm sure the chat's going to be on fire. Um, Ifani, uh, talking about security, uh, crypto tutors, Bitcoin basics. Bottom line is this, right? Like the whole premise of this conversation is about defying all odds. And that's going to be interwoven through every aspect of the conference experience, which is why we are bringing you two bosses in the digital assets world. I want to welcome everyone. We got 110 plus people live watching. Um, but before we get started, uh, we're going to just define what digital assets are. I see we've got Micah and Bradley, super excited to have you guys. I'm going to give you a proper intro, but I just want to give folks a little bit of context because we've got, you know, new newbies uh, just stepping into the crypto world. You know, they may have heard of Bitcoin and Ethereum, but there are thousands upon thousands of cryptos. And for that matter, there are other 
digital assets like NFTs, which we'll be talking about later, and stable coins, which we're about to dive into. Now, Crypto Tutors has been on stable coins since 2020 when we were introduced to crypto. Stable coins help mitigate exposure to more volatile crypto, but you would go to CryptoTutors.com to learn more or, you know, let Bradley, I'll let Bradley do his thing. <laughs> uh, but everyone who's tuning in, you know, I just wanted to give you some context and welcome you to the digital assets panel with our subject matter experts, Micah Isagawa, CEO of Wazi, and Bradley Allgood, CEO of Fluent Finance. So, Micah, we're going to start off with you, if that's okay. I just want to like give you all your flowers and also set the stage as to who you are and why you are, in fact, a subject matter expert when it comes to digital assets. All right? Sounds good. Excellent. So you're the CEO of Webacy. You are listed Forbes 30 under 30. You're a former security engineer for Microsoft. And if that wasn't enough. You're a former professional acrobat for circuit. Cirque du Soleil. I mean, I, I just, okay. <laughs> like uh, you raised $5 billion in funding. Um, we tip our hats off to you. We talked about the difficulties, you know, women face in raising. So congratulations on that front. Um, but really what you're doing at Webacy is creating infrastructure that's, you know, securely enabling the movement of digital assets in the event of an emergency like debt. Um, and it's important for people to wrap their heads around this because not so fun fact, uh, Boston College reports that about $60 trillion of wealth will be transferred in America by 61. So we wanted to bring you on because, you know, like Wu-Tang says, you got to protect your neck. You know what I mean? Like you got to make sure that you're protecting your assets. Now, Bradley, Bradley, you know, I have to, I have to give him the story about how we met, right? Because Bradley is our peoples at Crypto Tutors. No lie. Nina and I met him in Miami when we unexpectedly joined a bipartisan public-private think tank, which included state legislators. Like, I can't make this up. Bradley, correct me if I'm wrong, but you develop products for governments and blockchain companies, including digital identity, government registries, and as the CEO of Fluent, you and your team are building a federated bank-led stablecoin that's fully auditable and one-to-one -one with the U.S. dollar, known as U.S. Plus. Are you on mute? Right. Yeah, that, that's spot on. Yeah, I, I can't. I don't need to correct you. Yeah. Okay, because <laughs> let me tell you what you didn't do. Send me your bio. So you know how to do a fancy five does my due diligence. Okay, so there's that. I'm glad that I'm glad I did you justice. <laughs> but what you're building at Fluent a timely solution, especially given uh, the sixty billion dollars lost in the Terra Luna implosion. So you know, thank you to the both of you for taking your time and and investing your energy and wisdom into this uh, conversation. So let's start with Micah. Micah, how do you define digital assets and when did you first get involved? Great question. Thank you, first of all, for the wonderful intro and thanks for having me, us. Um, really excited to be here and pumped for what you're doing today. Uh, so super excited. Digital assets, I think I'm the generation that grew up with computers. Uh, so digital assets, even before crypto, I think we, I have kind of grown up with. If you remember, do you remember like Webkins or Club Penguin or Neopets? It's kind of like a thing online that, as users we owned. And so I, I had a good understanding of it going into it, but uh, crypto and blockchain technology has really changed what ownership means and kind of what's going on in the space. Um, my, my first uh, an introduction to crypto was actually while I was working for Cirque du Soleil. So funny enough, um, I was an aerialist acrobat, which is completely not related to tech whatsoever. Uh, but some of my nerdier coworkers, they were mining Bitcoins in their hotel rooms as we traveled the world. So that was my first introduction to blockchain technology. I thought it was super cool and had a lot of opportunities to change our societal systems that I thought could be improved um, and have been following it ever since. So 2017 DeFi summer, 2021 NFT bull run. It's, it's all been there and started WebSC, which is in the security space in 2021. Are you on mute? I think you yeah, might be on mute. Yeah. Yeah. Am. You know how anticlimactic that was? Because I'm <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. It's going to happen. It's live. 
Um, but what I was saying, Micah, is that thank you for that context. Um, what problem is is WebSC solving? Just so that folks can kind of like wrap their heads around like the inner workings. Yeah, you certainly alluded to one piece of it. So WebSC, we're safety and security products for Web3 wallets. That's how we define ourselves now. Our greater vision is eventually for web to make a safer Web3 for everyone. So if you go to our website, that's the tagline because that's what I like. What's what I envision future of WebSC, but future of blockchain in general. Um, safety, I think two things, security and safety, and then education are two huge barriers to entry for mass adoption of blockchain technology. And so that we're working on the safety and security side. So WebSC, we build tools that work with non-custodial wallets. So we are not a wallet ourselves. We're like a security and infrastructure layer. Uh, but we have products like a backup wallet if you lose access to your assets or you lose access to your wallet. We have a panic button if you have to transfer all of your assets in one click in the case of an emergency, like you get hacked where you think you're part of a vulnerability. And then we have a crypto will. So if you do pass away, how do you pass things on to your loved ones? I think something like 20% of all Bitcoin, at least a little bit more than that, actually, at this point, which means all crypto at some point is going to lose a significant portion of the entire market cap due to loss of access and people passing away and not leaving things behind. So we're really working in that active security space uh, along all of those lines. Thank God for you. That's all I have to say. Like We uh, are going to put resources to folks to learn more about what you're doing at see. But thank you for that. Um, so, so Brad, let, let me, let me um, gather your thoughts on like, how do you define digital assets? Um, well, I've, it, it depends on to what extent. And I, and I think that uh, um, Maika really kind of pointed to that is that there is digital assets, which are just notions on databases and represented digitally. Um, non-custodial digital assets, which is the real value prop. And that's when people can take in the ownership to themselves, can take owner, ownership of private keys and access. And, you know, it, it creates a financial system that's completely distributed. And as long as someone has a public private key and the ability to store it, um, they can essentially bank themselves, right, in, in to some fashion. And, you know, I, huge, huge problem solving uh, digital wills, you know, and it's it's great to see that's coming to market and, and a really good production format. I have a feeling you two are going to be friends, but um, that's what we do. We facilitate this development of connective tissue so that we can continue to build uh, for the future, a better tomorrow today. So Brad, in your, you know, in the most simplistic terms, right? Because some of this is, I mean, it's complicated. Let's keep it real. That's part of why on the Crypto Tutors front, we focus so much on education. How would you, um, or tell us, explain, I'm like, how do I phrase this properly? Stablecoin, right? How do yeah. you define a stablecoin? Because you've got banks like JP Morgan creating their own stablecoins. So well, tell us a little bit about what is a stablecoin. So JP Morgan's not really creating a stablecoin. What they're doing is called tokenized deposits, um, whether it be on a private or a public chain. So the JPM coin is on a private chain, and they recently did a test on a public chain with Polygon. And the difference is, is a tokenized, tokenized deposit is actually just a representation of a number printed to a public blockchain or a private blockchain. So the same way that core banking systems work now is you debit that number and then you credit another and there's these general ledger accounting flows that move the money between. But what a stablecoin is, is when you issue an actual token, a fungible token that can be transferred and owned and divisible um, and that in its own right can can represent, you know, the same as you pull cash out of the the ATM. Um, and, and what a stable coin is, is taking that pulling the cash out of the ATM, but imprinting it on public chains and allowing people to take full ownership of it, where you don't need a central authority, right? You just need to work with the, let's say, the consensus algorithm or however you send and issue money on those public chains. Sorry. Awesome. Yeah. I don't know if that was too complex. Like, you, you know, Brad, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to have to, um, we're going to have to make that a whole entire crypto tutoring session. Um, but we'll, we'll take that offline and, and we'll, we'll work with you on that. But uh, no, it makes a lot of sense. And I think that that speaks to the problem that you're solving at Fluent, right? Like you're, you're building technology. And so um, let me ask you both this, right? Cyber attacks cost about $6 trillion globally. So how do you think about security when it comes to the products that you're building? And this is to the both of you, whomever wants to go first. Um, Maika, you want to go first? I have some thoughts as well. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief in mind then. I think security is the forefront of what we're thinking of because we're trying to improve security options overall in the space. Uh, so right now it's if people, you know, if you have responsibility over your own ownership of you know, crypto, then you also have to deal with the security side of that too. And right now the, the tools are kind of lackluster and that's what we're building in. So security is what we are building the future for, what we're focused on, but I'll, I'll pass it off to Bradley. To, uh, yeah, I think that... I think the basis of our security problems and most of the hacks are due to centralization, right? We have big databases that are, have, you know, access points that you can get in a whole honeypot of, you know, different people's information, right? You hear every day that someone hacked like eBay's database or something else, you know, and, and stole a whole bunch of credit card and personal identifiable information. But what we're doing with distributed distribution and non-custodial assets, whether that be a non-custodial identity, whether that be, um, you know, Bitcoin, stablecoin, whatever else, is you're making the hacking points each individual person, right? You're distributing the system to where to be able to get access, they need to steal your specific public private key. And I think that in its own right is, is leveling of the security. And, you know, with, uh, with good flows of, um, of, of transits of value that we're really been focusing on the last year, the next kind of evolution of that is data, right, is is being able to own your own data through like an app, like a wallet and be able to transact that autonomously and then block it off whenever you feel uncomfortable. Like the same way she, um, um, Maika was saying that you could uh, hit a panic button. If you could do that with your data, that would be huge, right? So I think that's, um, you know, that's kind of the basis of security and the benefit of distribution is it makes it much harder to hack. And that, that speaks to the whole concept of decentralized finance, right? And again, in the vein of just uh, acknowledging that there may be folks that are new to this space, how in your most simple definition, how would you describe decentralized finance? You touched about it, touched upon it, um, Brad, but I want you to go a little bit deeper. Like how, how for the folks, the late folks out there, how would you describe or define DeFi? So I think Eric Voorhees recently put it really well with his kind of debate with SBF. And he said, what we're doing is we're, you know, there was this process to do distribution of, inform of access information with the web, right? Where it's a protocol, anyone, as long as they run the protocol can access it. Now we're doing that with transfers of value, right? And now we're doing that with transfers of value products like Aave where it's literally a protocol that anyone with a non-custodial asset and some assets on a chain that they can deploy into that protocol can start gaining yield. They can start gaining wealth. Um, and early on, you know, a lot of those principles were based off of yield farming, where it means you move liquidity through multiple DEXs and different types of protocols, and you get a little bit of governance token or a little bit of, you know, whatever it is, like you stake it um, in many cases and, and get, you know, a, a scarce token from a protocol. But now we're starting to kind of take it to the next step where we're putting real underlining financial products and people can access them with through DeFi protocols. And that's what like a lot of what JPM did with and with Aave Arc, where they were really deploying a tokenized balance into a, a, a tokenized form of a treasury bill, right, which is gaining like four percent, meaning that people in DeFi and people all around the world, people in developing Africa can turn out their value into a stable value and gain yield on it, right? Rather than have to deal with highly volatile currencies. So I think it really is, is innovating it in, um, in a significant way. Um, and DeFi will, you know, continue to roll out to new innovative products, both on the crypto DeFi side with interesting stable coin yields and as well with the bridging into traditional finance or as they call real world assets. Awesome. Thank you for that. And, and Micah, do you have anything you want to add? I think he covered it beautifully. Yeah. I love that. I love it when a good definition and a good explanation comes together. So, you know, for again, you know, the folks that are not necessarily convinced that, you know, DeFi and just this whole world that we're living in Web3 is in fact the future or shall I say the present what do you say to naysayers? You know, like what are you saying to folks that are like, yeah, it's a fad or yeah, it's a Ponzi scheme or or just folks that don't believe, and this is to the both of you. Micah, you could take that one first. I, I think people said that it was a fad that the sun might be the center of the universe. People said it was a fad that the internet was gonna happen. And so 
Like it, I think there's always naysayers with any kind of new technology or new belief systems. And that's what we're facing right now. And so I think it's, it's a matter of time uh, before people realize that like this, like blockchain tech can change a lot of things for the better. And there's a lot of things to be done prior to that. Um, but yeah, no, I think like people who want to ignore it and, you know, be a skeptic, I'm okay with being a skeptic. I'm a skeptic myself about a lot of things, uh, including the blockchain space. Uh, but the, it's just going to kind of, we see patterns in human history and it's easy to ignore them when, when we're living in it. But this is, people are going to look back a hundred years from now and be like, it was inevitable, that sort of thing. So that's the future I'm looking forward to. Yeah. And I, I'd say, given that I work with regulated financial institutions, I've been hearing it for, you know, from banks for about as long as it's been happening. And now each and every large financial institution has invested uh, into setting up a digital asset group within the organization to figure out custody, to figure out how they're going to deal with it. So, I mean, the change is happening. They've already agreed that, you know, the, the idea of a borderless asset that can seamlessly move between jurisdictions is a powerful, powerful thing. Um, and a lot of them still want to grasp and centralize that power. But, you know, I think with a lot of builders that come from the, the DeFi and crypto space, you know, we have a chance to do a Trojan horse, right? We can ingest this system into the you know traditional financial system and empower people to hold non-custodial assets, right? Disintermediate, uh, you know, them from every other financial system. And you can do it in a regulated and transparent and safe way, you know, but Ultimately, this is like the best opportunity to have to flow wealth back to the end consumer. I love that. And um, given the nature of what you do, and even my first introduction uh, to the work that you're doing, you know, it's incredible, of, you know, how you're approaching education and just trying to get the wheels in, you know, people's minds turning around what the implications of, of, of the, you know, DeFi and what the possibilities are for Web3 from the context of how we can make this world a better place. Um, so my, my th final question is, you know, what is your long-term vision for the future of digital assets? Like in, you know, a, a perfect world, let's paint the picture for folks as to what, you know, Micah and Bradley, like, what do you envision? Um, I mean, I'd say mine's simple is just ubiquitous access to financial services, like regardless of jurisdiction, regardless of places. Everyone has ability to exit. Everyone, everyone has ability to store value and and gain wealth. Yeah, and I think um, mine is. I I would love it if the world that we live in uh, could. There's, there's a lot of systems of middlemaning. For example, you mentioned all of these boomers are going to be transferring their generational wealth to millennials, and there's going to be a lot falling away or getting uh, kind of lost within that whole transition. Um, a lot of it goes back to government, depending on what jurisdiction you're in. It's different in Japan than it is in the United States. Uh, but this can all be written in code and know that there there is no, like, uh, you know, things that are going on that were not intended, first of all, of the original people. Um, there's also a lot of opportunities to own and transfer real life things utilizing blockchain, right? So I envision a future where all of it can be done in a click of a button. It's not going to be like that for real, but that is one future that is possible. Yeah, UX is huge, huge for us. So that's a that's a huge that's a that's a big, uh, big thing that we've always had a problem with. I don't think many people know how to like go from one wallet to another wallet to staking on Solana to like leveraging an NFT to yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and that's why we wanted to um, you know curate this conference experience where folks like yourself can talk about these solutions and talk about you know how this technology can be harnessed in ways that you know are actually making people's lives better. And another thing that you both kind of touched upon, which is like the democratization of access to um, you know, wealth building engines and access to protecting our assets and transparency, you know, building on chain. You know, these are you know new concepts to many people, but without folks like yourself stepping up to the plate, building in this space, providing solutions that, you know, provide real world, you know, that solve real world problems, um, you know, we wouldn't be able to, to take advantage of this Web3 world that we're now living in. So I just want to say thank you on behalf of Crypto Tutors, on behalf of all of our, you know, partners, the community at large for taking the time to speak with us, to impart your wisdom. And we have um, resources where folks can, can uh, in our resource guide, keep, you know, 
keep in touch with you all, um, learn more about your products and solutions, and just follow your journey. So with that, I'll say thank you so much. Have a great rest of the day. And uh, looking forward to seeing you at our next, you know, whatever we're, we're doing. I, I'm sure it's going to be amazing because, you know, that's just how we roll. <laughs> thank, thank you. So much, Take care, Bradley. Me. Take care, Micah. Yeah. Crypto, totals, crypto, totals, crypto, totals, hey. It's a way. Making money in my sleep? Making money in my sleep. Step by step. Click by click. Waves, Bitcoin, stable coin, we got the tips. Get ahead of the curve, time is now. Bitcoin at 40,000. What's the new cash cow? Become a tutor, make money from your knowledge. Turn the risk into wealth. We decentralize college. Enroll today before it's too late. that song i just start to rap you know that's part of our approach to crypto tutors we edutain so we literally write and produce original crypto rap music to help people learn about crypto so forgive me because i'm just gonna break out and like raps every now and again um but thank you everyone for joining us um we just concluded our uh digital assets panel thank you to our speakers mike and bradley um, and you know, now we are going to be getting into the business of blockchain. So I am accompanied by two incredible, brilliant minds in this space. Um, before I talk about Sterling, your background and Doden, your background, I just want to help people when we say blockchain, just provide a little bit of context, right? So for the newbies out there, blockchain is a network of, you know, global and independent computers in the vein of DeFi that are validating transactions on a digital public ledger, right? These computers work to solve complex math problems. And if and only if they arrive at the same answer, will the transaction be legitimized? So once it is legitimized or validated, a new block of data is added for everyone to see. The reason why this is so exciting, everybody, is that there's a level of transparency um, that can can you can actually go see at sites like analytics platform etherscan.io just to see what's happening in the world of DeFi in relation to the Ethereum blockchain. But basically, blockchain solves real problems. You know, payments is an example of that, which are you know cheaper and faster when you talk about the Bitcoin Lightning Network, which we'll talk about later on today. But I just wanted to give folks a little bit of context before we get into the nuts and bolts of the business of blockchain. So with that being said, um, allow me to introduce you to Sterling Ingui, product area leader and next generation retirement leader at Fidelity. Um, Sterling, I got to I got to give them the back scoop because I don't know if they know how incredible you, in fact, are. And don't, I'm going to do you justice, too. So don't even worry about all that. But so kind. Thank you. <laughs> so kind. You are the North Carolina regional site leader at Fidelity Investments and the next generation re retirement product area leader. It's a mouthful, isn't it? It's yeah. You know what? It was a little bit of a tongue twister. It it is. But you did really uh, well. That was great. You know, it's not my first rodeo, but I can always, you know. <laughs> but you support the firm's workplace investing business, and this includes product areas such as digital assets and blockchain. Um, and this is super cool. You're working in Fidelity, or while working in Fidelity Labs, the firm's in-house fintech incubator, you also led development of new products and services to manage student debt 
make charitable Bitcoin contributions, and even mobilize client service associate careers into tech. And if that wasn't enough, because as I said, we're going to give you all your flowers. You're also a member of the Enterprise Cyber Security. You uh, helped advance Fidelity's cyber safety efforts in cryptocurrency. And throughout the eight years that you've spent at Fidelity, you've got passion for creating innovative solutions that leverage technology and data-driven insights to meet business priority and customer needs. We are so happy to have you and you're a phenomenon. So just sit with that, you know, just like <laughs> revel, revel in all the love because you deserve it. Um, a hundred thousand percent. And then next on deck, a man who really doesn't need an introduction. If you know anything about what he's building at the uh, London Stock Exchange, but I'm going to introduce him anyway, because that's just how we roll. So don't correct me if I'm wrong. You're the director of emerging technology at the London Stock Exchange. Um, you're a product and technology expert leader with over 15 years of combined experience across the blockchain, fintech, and video gaming, video gaming sector. Yes, yes, and yes. Okay, good. Doing well so far. Your expertise includes software engineering and architecture, product design and delivery, blockchain and distributed ledger tech, also known as DLT, as well as high performance computing. You currently head up emerging tech globally for the capital markets division of the London Stock Exchange. Did I do you justice? Pretty much. Thank you. <laughs> yes, winning. All right. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the business of blockchain. So, Sterling, if it's all right with you, um, I'd love to kick it off with the first question. Um, tell us about how your crypto blockchain journey got started. It got started when I was in our our labs and Fidelity Center for Applied Technology kind of was, we have this innovation groups or groups now there too uh, at Fidelity. And we started looking early back in 2014 and saying, this is an incredible technology. We need to better understand it. We do that with a lot of research and development. We like that scan, try, scale model. And I was a product leader and they said, Sterling, how much do you know about Bitcoin? And I was like, I don't know much about Bitcoin. And so they said, well, we have an Sterling, opportunity. What year was that though? What year was that? That was in 2014. 2014. Okay. 2014. Yep. So they said, let's, let's, we're going to look into a lot of different opportunities here and say, what does this mean for our business? What does this mean as a technology? Let's go figure it out. Right. And we do that hands-on research development. And they said, there's a potential opportunity in the charitable space. And so they said, Sterling, what could you, what could we do in the charitable space with at that time, like kind of Bitcoin digital asset blockchain, it was very much more of a Bitcoin conversation. And I said, okay. And that's when we started working. And then in 2015 launched Bitcoin contributions into a donor advised fund, which really enables people to take that Bitcoin, put it in, and then grow those funds over time to give out four different charities of their choice. And that was how I started learning about it. And then fast forward a couple of years later, when I was moving out of the labs group and going into our enterprise cybersecurity team, and I was becoming an information security officer for our Fidelity Digital Assets business. And that was because of, that's 2019. But in 2018, that business started Growing out again from that 2014 work where people are saying, what does it mean to have a wallet? What does it mean to hold this coin? And who would be interested in holding this or having someone hold this coin? And we've had institutional investors saying we would like someone to hold our coins securely with us as we're looking at these opportunities. And that became our Fidelity Digital Assets business. And then I became an information security officer for that business in our cybersecurity group. So then I got to come back into this space, which was very exciting. And so much had changed and so much has evolved between 2014, 2015, 2019. And then even now, after the pandemic, I feel like it's just taken this next leap. And I get to come back in and do some really fun work now, but within our workplace investing or our retirement business for employers to say, how can we responsibly offer exposure to something like Bitcoin or digital assets in your retirement plan. I love that because that's such a progressive 
approach, you know, like actually providing access for retirement planning and exposure to crypto. Um, we're going to dive into that a little bit deeper, but Dotan, I pose the same question to you. Tell us about your, your, your crypto blockchain journey. Um, how did you get started? And also what appealed to you about this space? Yeah, yeah. happy to answer these. I mean, so my journey largely started, I would say, maybe sort of similar time frame, 2014 ish. I was kind of at Barclays Investment Bank, um, uh, front office IT and futures execution uh, as an engineer. And I kind of randomly, someone sent me an email with a, you know, kind of link to the Bitcoin white paper, which I read at the time. Thought, oh, this is interesting, and kind of largely ignored it. And then, sort of fast forward two years later, um, I, was, I was working as a quant developer in a prop, prop trading firm, and um, the Ethereum kind of came along. Um, and so I, you know, read the white paper, thought it was really interesting, and kind of, you know, having had a, a background at, um, in the in the video game space, um, having been sort of work, working in that, that that space for about six years prior, um, I, I, my, my mind started to race. Right, it's like, okay, hey, this is this is like a technology that's a generalization of Bitcoin, where we 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 ignore the currency piece and we we generalize the underlying tech such that it effectively it becomes like a decentralized computing model that you can then apply to any problem domain, right? You, you're basically writing applications on this layer that can do anything you like. So I started thinking around kind of about applications in the video game space. Um, and that was kind of the point where I was able to then sort of leave the firm. Um, I started, co-founded my own uh, startup. So we were building sort of NFTs for gaming pre NFTs, right? This was sort of 2016. Uh, and we kind of scaled the technology, we took it to market, we were kind of in early evaluation with a number of sort of video games development firms. And then that business kind of disappeared largely because I started the business with three other guys. They, it was kind of around the time that you had the first crypto rally, they got massively, massively wealthy from, from that rally when they liquidated. And so they kind of moved on and so did I. Uh, and then I found myself in a, in a kind of a CTOing a, a, a cryptocurrency exchange platform. Um, helped kind of build the platform, build the team, scaled that, and then transitioned after some time into my current role in the LSEG. Uh, and it, it, you know, it's been an interesting ride. I mean, they brought me into the organization largely to figure out initially, you know, on a, on a kind of business case by business case basis, this is an interesting technology. It's kind of maturing in the space. What are the interesting use cases? And then since then, it's kind of evolved into, you know, collectively as a group, what is our position on, on this technology? How do we see, you know, tangible ways in which it can transform our, our ecosystem, our market? And how do we want to sort of stand at the forefront of that? And what are the kind of initiatives and program capabilities that we want to bring to bear in order to support not just our customers in that evolution, but equally, how do we want to position ourselves within the, within this new market? So. I love how just you just casually dropped that we got crypto rich and decided, ah, do we really want to work? Um, maybe not so much. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately that, i wasn't i wasn't i wasn't completely in that bucket it was mostly my co-founders that kind of like ended on that journey but i did okay i did okay okay at the time no i love to see it and i also think that the fact that both of you you know your origin stories start almost 10 years ago speaks to just the expertise when we talk about subject matter experts you know we're bringing people to this conversation that actually have you know, the technical prowess, the, the the sophistication to truly be providing guidance. Not that this is investment advice, right? This is all educational purposes. Um, but the reality is the biggest barrier to entry to this world is in fact education. So it's critical for us to have folks like you to see, to hear. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the inefficiencies in, you know, financial markets. What are the problems? And this is to the both of you. What are the problems you think blockchain is solving in your respective industries and even at your organizations? Who do you want to go that, first? Yeah, I was just going to say, I'll start for a little bit, but I think the, the big one is it's opening up access, right? For those that it, across financial services, if you look at that, right? If you are unbanked or if you are in places where you have your cell phone and a mobile phone, your cell, or why, sorry, the internet and a mobile phone, you can really start engaging and doing a lot more and getting more access and exposure and connections and to do more with different currencies. So that borderless aspect is huge. But I also think that you need to think about the efficiencies and how we are doing our business. And that's where the blockchain business really Peaks. It's not just that currency exchange of people being able to move value. It's 
um, what kind of things that you're tracking and moving value with. And it's not just the coin, it's the supply chain aspects. It's the efficiencies of moving away from um, the older infrastructure that is very much tied to the to more brick and mortar and institutions. So I think it's bringing us forward in this digital space in a way that connects to how people are living today and how the ease and speed in which they want to transact and share value and have that data back and that history of that data, of what's been happening so that they can understand the whole life cycle of a movement of value. I love that. And I appreciate that um, perspective. But Sterling, can we also dig into, you know, at Fidelity, how does that play into, you know, the, the, the products that you're building and, and spearheading and what the future may hold? For us, it is, we're, everyone lives in a digital world. We want to get rid of any of those checks, those paper checks and the long times it would take for, so if I speak for purely in a retirement lens, right, if I go to that perspective today, we have so many people that are relying on the mail system to receive a check and then to be able to send that check and then to move funds into, say, Fidelity from another record keeper, or if it is how you are looking at um, the what happens behind the scenes with, with your history of savings and how can you get that longer history of data back for all of your savings and not just from one record keeper to another. So there's a lot of opportunity there. And then I would say in terms of the time it takes to kind of bring um, transactions across individuals is one thing, but transactions across bigger institutions, that's where I feel that we have more opportunity to leverage the blockchain and to get into more of a digital world and efficiencies. Perfect, it's also, I, the last thing I would say it, beyond that, if you for the blockchain, it's also leveraging that with the digital asset space and then what that means for how you can diversify investments in the future. So there's the two sided. So I'm trying to stick more to the blockchain piece on efficiencies and, and but there's certainly that huge play in the digital asset space. And, and Doton, uh, thank you, Sterling, for your for your thoughts. And Doton, what, what, what's your take on it? Yeah, yeah, no, I think I think uh, Sterling touched on some really good points there. I mean, uh, again, sort of, you know, coming back to the crypto piece, um, you know, we we see in the crypto asset space a proliferation of new asset classes, but 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 more and more importantly, a ubiquitous infrastructure, right, that allows anyone to transact with anyone else anywhere, and it's you know it's such a powerful proposition where you're able to take this technology and enable this kind of access that when we think about that from a financial inclusion perspective, for example, it really has some very, very interesting ramifications, right, for how, you know, that can scale. And where the, 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 the technology itself, the infrastructure is entirely mutualized, right, and it, it makes it really easy for even, you know, businesses, small businesses to set up and provide new, new services on, on top of these types of technologies, which is really, really cool. Um, on the on the on the kind of tokenization side, right, which is really kind of what we as an, an institution sort of see as our bread and butter, right? We we live in a world and we play in a world in capital markets where we're supporting businesses, we're thinking about the sources and uses of capital, and we're we're, we're helping organisations understand how they can raise money to scale their businesses and grow and develop. And you know, much of that when we we look at the kind of processes and the 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 the, the um, kind of workflows that these organiz organisations have to participate in. It's, it's very heavyweight, right? There's a lot of inefficiency in the market today. There's lots of, you know, email emails and forms and checks and balances and reconciliations and affirmations and lots of processes. And, and that process can be protracted, it can be long, it can be costly, it can be complicated. And one of the interesting things about blockchain as a technology is twofold. One, it provides a means of, of giving you this kind of automation of multi-party workflows in a way that allows you to maintain a level playing field where you're not saying hey let's just roll all of this technology into a single you know big tech firm that's going to come along and solve everyone's problems all at the same time but suddenly you're throwing all of the power and all of the data ownership into that one organization and they become a trillion dollar company and then they you know start to struggle on everyone else in the market right you're not doing that with, with blockchain you're saying let's 
incorporate and bring all of these actors onto this into the, this te the technology world but everyone gets to play and sort of preserve their roles right within the, within the within the value chain and you can kind of evolve that together it's, it's a really interesting um uh technology for like the the, the kind of digital transformation of, of markets like ours where there's a lot of existing incumbency but but also where there's a big appetite for investment in building efficiencies in, in some of these some of these areas and the other key piece is really thinking about you know from a, from an asset lens tokenization and what is the value that that brings suddenly you have a technology that yesterday we couldn't do this we couldn't digitize value right and we couldn't provide a means to say you know here's a here's a unit of value that can be represented economically with the preserving the properties of economic rivalry um in the technology but with blockchain you can do that and that gives us some really interesting ways to say let's figure out how we can take an equity for example and digitize that right at the beginning right of the issuance process when a company wants to incorporate and we can suddenly manage, you know, all of the cap table management and administration. We can manage cash flow distributions around dividend payments. We can manage proxy voting technologically. And we can do all of that all the way through its life cycle. So as a company goes through C, through series A, through series B, and we can systemize all of this. And we can not only do that, but we can do that in a way where it becomes very democratized in terms of how other service providers across the ecosystem can plug services in and can interact with these assets and, and allow these these customers to get much closer to these 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 products and services over time. So it's a it's a really interesting technology. It really kind of leans into the you know in a kind of innovation lens, the sort of disruptive market play, right? And the the but the ecosystem development play, and it's really all about kind of commu community building, um, a co opetition, and it, it's it's yeah, it's real sort of radical departure and paradigm paradigm shift in that respect. Sterling, was there anything you wanted to add? No, I, I love, I mean, I think we're saying similar things. It's breaking down the efficiencies of how things happen today, opening up that access and connecting more. And I think that that is so critical because, you know, part and parcel to the, you know, reason why we've curated this conference experience, Crypto for the Culture, and, you know, why we focus as well on providing access to, you know, trustworthy educational resources is because oftentimes, you know, the people that look like us, you know, you know, we're, we're from, or I speak for myself, you know, being from a marginalized community, it, it, it can be very challenging to get access to, to resourcing. You know, we talked about uh, women founders getting less than 2% of venture capital. We talked about, um, you know, people, you know, black people in the United States having disproportionately higher, um, you know, interest rates for their mortgages. And these are just a few, even what it means to be an accredited investor and how a lot of folks that they don't have the, the means to be eligible to participate in these wealth generating engines. And, you know, I think that's one of the most exciting aspects, too, of like this Web3 world that we're, we're living in. And I think it was you, Jotun, that spoke about the disintermediation of these, you know, central authorities that are really hoarding, you know, the profits um, you know, what we're seeing right now in this Web3 world is a, you know, technological infrastructure being built that that enables, you know, everyone to participate and and, you know, by owning their data, you know, being compensated. And we'll be talking about crypto rewards later in, you know, the vein of being compensated for, you know, our data and how it's used and what have you. Um, so this is a really exciting time, and these are really important conversations that we're having. Um, so, Lisa, so much, yeah, I'll go ahead. Say one thing: what I love about what is happening though right now, and with what you guys are all all here and promoting, is there is this opportunity to open up the access, but it has to be closely paired with education, because as you said before, education is like that number one foundation that will enable. And that is something that we have been honing in on and really working on across Fidelity. So when we bring forward innovation, especially in this digital asset blockchain ecosystem, we are tying that very closely with a lot of education because you have to understand it. And we don't want people to not be able to take advantage of the access or to feel kind of reserve because they don't understand it. So we partner everything. Like I have a team, a, a, a group focused on education for, for workplace specifically. Our other groups have education focused on their specific um, users and customers, because we know you need to take that education and, and, and tailor it for what you're bringing forward and your audience. 
and the opportunity for people to hear there's such a wide variety of careers. There's such a wide ways of our huge opportunities and how you can learn about this and then where you can dive deep because taking that first step and saying, I'm not scared to go learn. And by the way, it's a continuous learning journey. I am constantly learning, right? I've been in and out of this space and I am always learning more. Every minute I turn around, there's something new to learn. So you're not alone if you're starting here today or if you've been in this space for a while, we're all learning together, but that's how we're gonna make that access turn into reality for everybody. Yeah, and and you know, don't I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well because you know you talked about um, you know economic empowerment, financial inclusion, and and financial literacy is I think and and Sterling, correct me if I'm wrong, sort of at the like um, you know that's like the linchpin that 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 notion of like okay, what are we doing to uh, you know help upscale, help up level? And I, I pose that question to the both of you. What are some of the you know strategies that you're employing? to continue to keep yourself, you know, abreast of what's happening within this space. Um, yeah. Tell me, tell me, how are you sharpening the saw, as they say? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, it's, it's, it's a, it's a tricky one, right? Cause, cause I think, you know, to, to, um, to some of the points raised already, I mean, it, it, it's such a fast moving space and it's such an evolving space. I think, you know, you, you, you just, you have to kind of keep your finger on the pulse and follow, you know, some of the major news sites. You've got kind of Coindesk, Cointelegraph, there's there's lots of them, right? The block, I mean, and, and then separately, you know, for, for myself personally, I tend to um, stay very connected with the, the kind of crypto and, and blockchain event scene to meetups, et cetera. And, and it's just really getting yourself out there, understanding kind of what's going on, Who's building stuff? Where are they building stuff? What are they doing? Um, you know, every time you know you see a, a new protocol emerge or a new De DeFi platform, you know, you really want to ask the question, get to the, the bottom of you know, what's interesting about this? What's unique? What is it? What is its differentiation? And all of this is just, you know, it helps you get closer and closer to understanding how this space of evol is, is evolving and then and then equally where you know new opportunities are, are gonna come up. So So I, I agree. There's when I started, there was not a lot of information. I always joke back to the Bitcoin for the befuddled book I was given to first start learning about what Bitcoin is in 2014. And now you can open up and you can find YouTube videos, you can find podcasts, you can find a number of different uh, daily news briefs and, and updates. And I think that's what's really important is that find what works for you, given the amount of time you have to stay up to speed. We have an FCAT crypto brief that happens weekly as a podcast that, um, you know, they're a great group that share and it's on Spotify or Apple and, and everywhere. But like, that's like one example of, hey, that's where I'll get my weekly kind of update from some of our groups, as well as reading some of the things that Dujan referenced. But I also take a class and we, um, you have to keep taking classes. I just finished the Oxford blockchain strategy class to say, is this a class that is going to teach us anything? Can I get the rest of my team doing that? Is it going to help us? And then, and, 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 it's that continual learning. We also have programs at Fidelity where we are trying to bring forward this technology understanding and business understanding of what it, blockchain is and what digital assets are through our um, just being an associate at Fidelity or if you're in a special program, like I have a blockchain accelerator program that we're bringing forward someone who's been working technology but wants to learn how to work in blockchain specifically. And we can upskill them and then bring them into roles after they're done. But that can happen. We have people doing it on the side. We have people doing it from different resources. And I think those are, you know, go to go to crypto for the culture, go to crypto tutors, go to all of these things and take a little nugget here and there whenever you can, because there's so many resources that that um, I love that you had free education resources right here. So anyone who's here, they can go and start go through the glossary of terms, figure out what those new words are. And then when you listen to those podcasts, you'll be like, I get it. I get it. I love that. And, you know, both of you are, you know, tenured and, and seasoned executives who continue to truly defy all odds, literally building on chain and figuratively being that you're both from communities um, that that are underrepresented in tech and finance. So, you know, what advice would you give to anyone watching this about the steps that you've taken to advance your career? And, you know, we talked a lot about education. We talked about the networking. 
Um, but, but tell us a little bit about, you know, for someone who wants to get started, what would you recommend or how would you recommend, you know, they start in this space from a career's perspective? I'll let, I'll let you go first, Stanley. So for me, it's be really curious and start just taking little chunks. It is so overwhelming to be like, oh, I'm going to sign up for this big course and I'm going to go all in here. You don't have to do that yet, but figure out what makes sense to you. Do you like the digital asset space? Do you like the blockchain space? Do you like the you know cryptography space? Like, What is it that is appealing in this area that kind of leads to more and you don't have to have it all figured out. But as you start reading and listening, you'll see what kind of piques your interest and then you can apply it back to a real world scenario or opportunity of how you might want to grow and evolve yourself. But if you don't understand what gets you excited and how you like to work, then it'll be really hard to consume all of this information. So I would say take little nuggets, give yourself a chance to dive deep, and then you'll be surprised at the doors that it will open and have those conversations. Go speak to people because that was one thing that I, I never thought I would go into cybersecurity. But because I had worked in emerging businesses, because I was comfortable with technology, because I'd worked with Bitcoin before, it was a, an a opportunity for me to move into the space, right? And I think that's where you have to just start taking little little bits and pieces and then you'll connect the dots to open doors and conversations. I'll tell you, I'm excited about that Bitcoin IRA, but um, we dropped it in the chat so people <laughs> so people could learn more about it. Um, and and Jordan, what what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I think I would, I would echo Sterling's sentiments, but, but equally, I think I would say, you know, uh, you know, if you're starting new, I think, ask yourself sort of key questions, right, that you need to kind of uncover the answers to. And it's really, you know, where, where do you want to, what, what do you want to do in, in, in terms of the techn technology domain? I mean, a, a lot of people think, when they think about blockchain, they think about it as a technology and they think, you know, well, I don't, I don't have a technology background, so maybe there's no opportunity for me, right? But there's so many different types of roles in this space. I think one of the really interesting aspects around the kind of blockchain and, and crypto, crypto asset space is it is very community driven. And I think that's one of the, you know, to its credit, one of the reasons why, you know, within this, this space, having spent like an entire career in technology, whilst, you know, we are, you know, we are as minorities still in the minority, but actually we're much better represented within the crypto community, to my mind and from my experience, than I've seen across the broader technology communities, right? And I think a lot of that is just, it's, it's, it's kind of gra that grassroots connectivity where everybody's on the same journey together, right? It's, it's kind of a level playing field from, from the get-go because it's so esoteric. Everyone's walking in with a, whether you've spent 20 years as an investment banker or whether you spent, you know, five, five months as a, as a, as a dustbin man, everyone's walking in with the same level of knowledge about this, right? So just, you know, feel encouraged, you know, learn what you can take things, you know, as, as a step at a time, even if your starting point is like signing up with a Coinbase account and playing around with crypto, you will learn so much in six months that, you know, it, it, it helps you to get onto that journey and really familiarize yourself with the concepts, the terminology, and then you just keep going. And, and, and the other, the last point I would make is just wh wherever you can find local communities, local meetups, crypto groups that you can kind of you can you can really connect yourself in a, in a community and in a network because sometimes that's the fastest way right to really kind of build that that that, that knowledge and, and experience when you can connect with people when you can share ideas and understandings and learnings it's a really powerful tool you know what i love about what you both said you know this is the business of blockchain and you know we're talking a lot about tech but the whole ethos of crypto is is you know it's about the community and like i have my little you know what I mean? The eat, it's a, you know we're all gonna make it. Yeah, you know like when we when we take that stance and we recognize that like we're in this together, um, yeah. and this isn't about you know any one or the other. This is about the community elevating. Like that's why it's so important to be having these conversations, and we're so grateful to have people like yourselves speaking about the power of this technology in such a unifying way and building connective tissue for for global citizens uh, to benefit. So thank you to the both of you for, for spending time with us here today. We do not take it lightly. We're extremely grateful and excited to continue to follow your journeys. Um, we're dropping a slew of resources so folks can learn more about what you're doing independently at Fidelity and the London Stock Exchange, respectively, uh, but also in your personal journeys. Uh, we thank you, we celebrate and elevate you, and we appreciate your participation in helping us defy all odds.
Thank you, Thank Lisa. You. Thank Great. you so much. All right, all right, all right. Oh, this is so exciting. Yes. You know, ladies, you know, I got to tell you, I love an all-female panel. I mean, you know, not that I'm picking things <laughs> out of my children, but <laughs> I love an all-female panel. Um, you know, welcome, first and foremost, to Crypto for the Culture, DeFi, All Odds. A lot of the conversations that we've been having today are you know, designed to help folks, you know, learn how to earn, um, which is so apropos given what we're about to discuss right now as far as careers, you know, in crypto. I think that uh, it's an interesting time. You know, there are, you know, we're in the midst of an economic downturn. Um, you know, what does that really mean? That means that there is, you know, business growth is slowing. That means that labor costs are increasing. Here in the U.S., for example, we've got a global audience, but here in the U.S., for context, um, there have been a wave of layoffs from, from Twitter to Peloton, Gap, and 7-Eleven. But, you know, there's hope, right? In this panel with these incredible ladies, we'll be chatting with leaders at super innovative companies, including Trust Machines, Tally Labs, um, and, you know, Manifold, it's incredible what you're building at your respective organizations. It took me a minute to just be like, damn, like, that's like, wow, like, this is a real dope. Uh, but every function in a traditional company, and this is something that we really want to hone in on, every single function, whether that be sales, whether that be marketing, whether that be HR, accounting, et cetera, you know, lives within these these Web3, you know, DeFi world. And we want to dispel the notion that, like, you have to be an engineer only. Like, these companies won't look at you, won't consider you if you're not an engineer or you're not technical. Um, and, and that's why we wanted to bring you incredible, uh, you know, thought leaders to discuss, you know, what within your organizations, what are the opportunities within your organizations? Why are you excited? But we're going to get into all of that. First, though, first, right? Because you know the energy is on a hundred thousand million. I don't, I didn't, I didn't, I don't know if you guys knew. I don't know if you knew that like this conference was going to be one in which like we're just like firing in all cylinders and we're just like super hyped. And you know, sometimes you go to conferences and it's kind of like, eh, especially like online, it's no energy. You like where the energy at? That's not an issue that we have here. All right, so let me introduce you, you ladies. Okay, let me make sure that the audience knows when we talk about what makes you experts and why uh, you're building incredible tech and, and what you're doing for the industry in the industry. This is what we're saying. Okay. So Rena, Rena Shaw, I will start with you. You are the head of operations and strategy at Trust Machines, 
a company building the largest ecosystem of applications on Bitcoin. Previously, you were the head of exchange at Binance US, where you grew the exchange from 30 million to 3 billion. Yes, ladies, gentlemen, other <laughs> billion would it be. Okay. In daily trading volume within 18 months. You're not playing games. You're not. Rena spent No time one plays games in the crypto world. I mean, honestly, can we say it again for the people in the back? Are they, listening? Are they picking up what we're putting down? Okay, sorry. I digress, Rena. You spent time on the commodity side. You have a unique background, though. And this is what's so cool. You went from being a drilling engineer on an oil rig, a drilling rig, right, in Texas, to, like, spinning up Bitcoin mining pools. You know, you, you, you managed a $300 million energy portfolio for a family office in, in for the family office of the Houston Texans NFL team. Am I? Okay. I just need them to process that. Can we just have a moment on that? Okay, cool, cool, cool. We're just going to let people like ruminate on that. Next on deck, Nicole Osborne, head of people for Manifold. Nicole has extensive experience scaling multinational tech companies from startups through to IPOs while maintaining, and this is a really critical part, while maintaining triple digit year over year growth. Nicole, if that wasn't enough, right? Like you're averaging a 90% employee retention rate. Is that, cause that's what your LinkedIn profile said. <laughs> Is that right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, cool, cool, cool. And our last speaker. Okay, I don't have your bio. So I'm gonna, if you're okay with it, let you do the honors and tell us who you are. Is that all right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, hey, how's it going? I'm Robes. I'm the head of product and design at Tally Labs. Uh, my background is in tech, um, first as a product designer, then a product manager. Um, I previously was at Peloton, as you just mentioned. Uh, and yeah, I have experience in high growth tech startups as well as um, big public companies. Uh, I've been with Tally Labs since day one. I uh, previously worked with our, our co-CEOs and head of engineering. Um, and uh, and have been based out of New York for the last 10 years, but uh, I'm in the process of moving back to Canada, which is where I'm from. Oh, I mean, I left New York too. That's a whole nother story though. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much to each of you. I really appreciate, and on behalf of the culture, on behalf of Crypto for the Culture, Crypto Tutors and Family, uh, we thank you for being here. So, you know, Rena, in a few words, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what Trust Machine does? Yeah, absolutely. We are building the largest application ecosystem for Bitcoin. Um, it's a contrarian view. Most people think of Bitcoin as a rock that you invest in. It's not productive. And we're challenging the norm of, you know, there's billions of dollars of locked capital in Bitcoin. How do you make it work for you? How do you use it in everyday life? And that's really the spirit of Trust Machines. In that end, we're producing a lot of different products that allow you to use your Bitcoin in daily life for human good and all of the things. I couldn't unmute fast enough because I was like, damn, that's so dope. You know, like so many people think that Ethereum, like, you, you know, people don't necessarily associate like Bitcoin and building on like dApps on Bitcoin, right? The, so it's kind mm -hmm. of a novel concept. Um, and, and we're going to, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into that momentarily, but I want to make sure that Robes and Nicole have some time to talk about, you know, what's happening at Manifold and Tally respectively. So, um, you know, Nicole, can you tell us a little bit about what's popping at Manifold as the kids say? Yeah. So at Manifold, we enable creative sovereignty for artists and creators, and we do this by giving them the tools they need to navigate web three. Um, our flagship product is Manifold Studio, and this allows creators and artists to mint on their own smart contract, and this is codeless minting. Um, prior, This is important because prior to Studio, everyone was minting on shared contracts for marketplaces, and this really stifles creativity. So you're beholden to the whims of the market, you can be delisted, uh, you don't have control over the creative tools that you're building with. Um, one of our co-founders, Richards, likes to explain it as, 
if you imagine yourself as Picasso and you're painting on a canvas and that canvas is constantly changing and you have no control over that canvas, that's clearly problematic. So what we're doing is really allowing uh, the creators to own their toolkit. Um, and we're basically at the highest level, just building an ecosystem of tools for creators that are owned by creators. I freaking love that. Can we have a moment on the fact that like Manifold is enabling creators with virtually zero code to mint NFTs, to, you know, commercialize their intellectual property and to, to retain that ownership, you know, like this is such, these are novel concepts in relation to how we do things in the traditional environment, but this is why we're in web three. This is what we mean when we talk about DeFi all odds. Sorry, I just had to have a moment on that note, but Rose, talk to me, talk to me. What's going on? Tell us a little about what you're building at Tally. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so at Tally, we're building a platform that enables communities to co-create content together. Um, I think the best way to explain it is sort of with, with how we got started. Uh, so we're the team behind Jenkins the Valet. Um, if you've seen him on Twitter, he's a, a, a character uh, in the Board Ape Yacht Club that is telling the stories of, of everything that happens uh, at the Yacht Club and what he's, what he's seen as a valet. Um, and yeah, it really just started as like a fun project where we were telling stories as if we were this character on Twitter and it really, really took off. Um, and since our background is in software, uh, we saw a number of things that people really wanted that we saw that we could productize. Um, so people can co-create stories together. Uh, they can license those characters back to different creative works um, and then connect with one another. So today we're building a platform that allows people to do all of that and scaling it out to other creators so that they can have the same suite of features for their own projects. How exciting and riveting is that? You know, um, part of why we're having this conversation as well is because your organizations are hiring, right? Like you are, you know, looking for great talent. And that's one of our specialties of crypto tutors. You know, we're connecting opportunity uh, to talent at scale, which is exactly what each of your organizations um, have to offer. And it's really exciting. So let me ask you each this, right? What is the most, you know, like what, what drove you to join your organizations? You know, like Nicole, what, what drove you to join Manifold, Rena, your trust machines? I mean, like what got you so excited, Robes, about Tilly? Like, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, I can jump in. Um, so uh, I, as I mentioned, I previously worked with both of our, our co-founders, um, one at Peloton and then one just uh, on, on side projects. Um, and when they started doing this, I was not a part of Web3. I was like, it's a talking monkey. Like, this is crazy. You guys have totally lost it. <laughs> and by talking and, monkey, you mean was it a board eight yacht club? Yeah, it was a board oh, eight. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, that just shows how much I knew. I was like, a board what? Um, but... Uh, and then they were like, we really need to build software to support this. Like, can you and uh, Othan, who's speaking later and is our head of engineering, can you guys help us? Um, and we started as contractors, just sort of like really focused on the, the initial project. Uh, but then we both got really excited because the community was so excited about what we were building. And the last time I saw excitement like that was like early days of Peloton, like where people just kept talking about their bikes. And it was just this really niche thing that everybody loved. Um, so then immediately realized that this is what I wanted to do full time and not understanding a lot about it, uh, enthusiastically joined the team and really haven't looked back. Love that. Rena, Nicole wants to go next. I can jump in. Um, for me, I hadn't seen a company like Trust Machines before. Um, there really has been very little activity on the Bitcoin side of thinking of like, what do you do next? And when you think about the market size of Bitcoin's like market cap is exponentially bigger than every other chain, every other token, it made me realize why are we ignoring the thing that brought us into crypto in the first place? It's the most decentralized blockchain, it's secure. And it got me thinking about applications and building trustlessly. And it really made me gravitate towards Bitcoin. I think it's no secret that I came from a very centralized exchange. And so coming the other route of doing something community governed, community owned, working on that level really appealed to me. Yeah. So for me, um, my personal career path is that I'm a people leader. I've been in tech startups, high growth for over 10 years. Um, I'm not technical at all. 
And same as, as uh, some of the others, I started out knowing nothing about crypto. Um, and something I've learned in my career is that I like to look for opportunities that aren't mainstream, that are ahead of the curve. And I noticed in my own personal network that there are very few people in the people space who are also in the crypto space. So that was the first sign to me that something very interesting was happening here. I dove in. I was learning uh, through crypto school, actually, with, with A16Z. Um, so when I was approached by Manifold, I was just super compelled by the mission. I'm really into art in, in my personal life. So the whole ethos, the entire mission of artists owning and retaining their work really, really spoke to me. And so I knew I could bring my people skills and my experience to the table while also learning a whole new space. And that was the most exciting part. You got to love the fact that like, you know, in many, no one, none of you thought or envisioned that you would be in like Web3 in this like DeFi world. And it was like, each of you jumped feet first, like and said, okay, well, you know what? Like, you don't know what you don't know and you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. So why not, right? And I, I think that that's something that we really want to hone in on the fact that like a lot of people think that they must be technical or they must, they must come from, you know, um, uh, DeFi and, you know, they sort of discount the fact that mm, these skills may not be transferable. Let's dispel that myth a little bit, a little bit more, right? Like, let's talk about, you know, what are the, what are the types of roles that, that you all are hiring for at your respective organizations? Happy to jump in on that too. I mean, I think uh, my background itself is that I'm an oil engineer. There is no, in most normal circumstances, there would be no role for me in Web3 crypto whatsoever. And I think it kind of shows goes to show that you can chart your own path however you choose. Uh, Trust Exchange is a company that's extremely supportive of that. Um, on our career site, we actually have something that's like a moonshot for pitch us your role and let's talk. And that's actually where I got my role by sending a DM on Twitter to kind of pitch where I would be. For what we're hiring right now that's posted a lot on the engineering side, it's a, no secret that Bitcoin development is tough and we're looking for people that are curious enough to want to rise to the occasion and take on a challenge. On the other side, we're looking for a lot of marketing roles is the Bitcoin narrative is difficult to explain. You have maxis in one corner, you have people that are getting their first foray into crypto into another corner and kind of sharing the narrative that anyone can build on Bitcoin is really important to us. And Robes, thank you for that, Rina. And Robes, tell us a little bit about um, your thoughts on that. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, uh, I mean, personally, um, as I mentioned, I didn't have any experience in Web3. And I think I uh, um, was lucky to have like a supportive team that helped guide me into it. But I mean, looking back, like I wish I had just sort of jumped in a little bit more, more fully. I really felt like I had to be an expert in order to take this job and grow this team and uh, like meaningfully contribute. Um, and then eventually I just realized like we're all new to this. Like this is such a new industry. Like nobody really knows what's going to happen. Um, and everybody has varying degrees of expertise and like all of the little verticals that make up Web3, but nobody's an expert on all of it. So just sort of like embracing that beginner mindset and saying, okay, like I'm here to learn. I'm going to share my learnings with the community and like lean on the people around me, uh, I think can be really empowering. Um, and then for Tally Labs specifically, we're hiring uh, full stack engineers right now with a focus on uh, on front end and the curiosity to work across the whole stack. Uh, and you'll notice like none of that was, we need like Web3 specific knowledge. Like it's really like building products that you would build at Peloton or other tech startups and in other industries. Um, uh, and then we're like here to support engineers on growing and their their technical expertise to like learn more solidity and other more like Web3 specific technologies. Awesome. And so uh, just so that I, I think we all heard you correctly, you're saying that uh, there are opportunities to grow into the role, you know, like definitely, you know, it's great to have solidity experience. Um, but, you know, if you if you know Java or what have you, you can grow into the role. Is that safe to say? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like really looking for people with a focus on on front end. Um, like a lot of our stack focuses on TypeScript, uh, uh, CMS, CSS, and animations. Like 
you know, the things that you would build at, at any company. So if you have experience as an engineer, you're going to fit in well at Tally. But if you are interested in learning more about the Web3 side of things, um, we have engineers today that are working on learning like within our, our team more about that technology. So there's also support there as well. Love it. And Nicole, what are your thoughts? And who are you hiring for? Yeah, so we're also hiring, also hiring uh, across engineering, but a huge role for us is our head of engineering role. Um, this is critical. Currently, we have three teams. These three teams are led by three of our co-founders. So this person really has an opportunity to come in and lead our engineering team. Uh, they'll, they'll partner closely with our founders, um, but they'll have an immense amount of autonomy. And that will be in all aspects of the product, the tech stack, team building, bringing in best practice, developing the skills and the career, uh, the career paths of the folks on the team. Um, it's also a really fun role for someone who really likes getting their hands dirty. We're a small team of 20. So this person can really dig into the technology, do coding, as well as managing the people on the team. Um, and we're super passionate about hiring a diverse team at Manifold. So we're looking for someone who's equally passionate about building and leading a diverse team. That is, um, you know, and I think that that's part of why we're also super excited to have each of you, right? You're not only like representing, you know, underrepresented communities um, and leading in an industry where we are grossly underrepresented, but you're also being proactive in like, you know, going back and bringing forward, like creating opportunities, creating companies that the, you know, makeup you know, in terms of your employees is reflective of, you know, the, the people, the customers that you serve and the people that are using this technology and creating an inclusive, um, you know, crypto ecosystem. So, so tell me a little bit about that, right? Like how within your respective roles are you proactively helping to create, you know, um, diverse teams within your organizations. I mean, you're participating in Crypto for the Culture, which speaks volumes. But I would just love to understand, like, why is why is diversity such a critical, um, you know, component on a personal and organizational level? Yeah, uh, I can jump in. Um, so I think, like you said, uh, we're building for diverse customers and diverse users and making sure that the people who are building reflect the people who are using the product is really important because you can consider different people's uh, perspectives and needs. Um, and then also uh, like internally, it creates like the best conversations when you have people from a diverse set of, of backgrounds with different opinions. Um, I think we, we have a really big focus on collaboration, like making sure everybody's voice is heard and having like regular places for people to voice their opinions about things that are even like a, totally outside of your your de department to make sure that we're uh uh have a lot of different voices um uh giving input into our major decisions so all that to say like both internally it's important for making the right decisions and then those decisions lead to like better product for for our users awesome nicole rena I can jump in here. So yeah, I, I echo what's been said already. Like we're building products and tools that are used by a wide diverse set of people and of artists at Manifold. And so we need to make sure we have a diverse team to build those best products and that we have all these varying experiences and ideas being put into that. And that customer empathy and that customer understanding is so important in order to do that. And we also believe that you know, we're still very small, we're only 20 people. So we want to build in a diverse way from the beginning, instead of chasing that goal uh, further down the line, we can really uh, set the tone from, from the beginning and lay the foundation in the right way. Um, and yeah, this is exactly why we're here today because we're really committed to this um, as a company and it comes from the founders and myself and everyone on the team. And we've done other kinds of partnerships with Boys Club and trying to onboard diverse creators onto our platform, uh, trying to help uh, partner and educate people in this space who are new to this space or crypto curious. Um, so we try to, to really um, do this work from all angles. Love it. And I hope folks can check out the collaboration you do with Christie's. Just saying, just saying, if they want to know what's up. Um, Rena, close us out. I feel the exact same way as um, everyone on this panel. 
Um, in my like humble opinion, innovation has no bounds, nor should our team. So we should be reflective of that and foster opportunities for people to create their own growth opportunities within a company. Um, you know, the ethos of Web3 is that we rise above, we are a community, we do as we please, and we govern together. And for me, having the inclusivity aspect of how we form our teams really comes into part for like the ethos of Web3. So, yeah. You, know. you ladies rock, okay? Like, honestly, I just have to make sure that like people understand, you know, you're, you're not only um, building within these organizations, but you're leading, you know, you're, each of you sit within the executive suite. And I, I, I think I said it earlier today, and if I didn't, I'm gonna say it again, just in case. You're architecting and engineering the future and you're creating opportunities for people that look like you to uh, to participate in the development of the future. And I thank you. Um, I'm excited to see kind of what happens next for you. And I'm sure a slew, uh, a ton of people are gonna be interested in uh, learning more about trust machines and manifold and tally. So thank you so much, ladies, for your time, for your genius, and uh, we'll continue to follow your journeys. Thank you Appreciate so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. You're awesome. Make it money while I sleep. That's the Crypto Tutors theme song. <laughs>your crypto tutor. Crypto Tutors has created Bitcoin Basics, a free e-learning course. This course covers basic crypto vocabulary, the history of cryptocurrency, and steps to learn how to buy Bitcoin. This course was designed with professional animation, fully accessible, no barriers to access and printable handouts. Complimentary learning opportunities are available to introduce cryptocurrency to their communities. All right, all right, all right. Let's see, let's see. All right. So, so Michael, before we get into it, you know, we want to make sure that the chat is activated. You know, we want to make sure that folks are walking away with actionable takeaways. So let me just make sure that, you know, the folks that are, that are tuning in live are, are walking away with some takeaways. What are some of the takeaways? We had the business of blockchain. We had, um, you know, DeFi all odds with Arthur Hayes. We just had a careers panel. Talk to me. Let me see. Let me see in the chat. Let's make sure that the chat is activated and we are uh, sharing our learnings because sharing is caring, right, Michael? I mean, that's like the whole, that's what Bitcoin 101 is all about, right? Like that's what we're about to get into. Now, I've been excited all day, right? You might adjust the headphones because I'm like projecting, screaming, um, but I'm just, I'm just really enthusiastic. You know, this is fun stuff that we're talking about. You know, I, um, where's my hat? Where's my hat? You'll appreciate this. Okay, not that this is investment advice, right? But let's keep it real. <laughs> I am a believer in the tech, right? The technical infrastructure behind Bitcoin. It's not just, and as Arthur Hayes said earlier, this isn't about getting rich quick. It's none of that, um, you know, and it's not investment advice. Everything that we're discussing is for educational purposes. Um, you know, but how could someone like Michael, you know, Haitian descent, you know, I have revolutionary uh, blood pulsating through my veins. You know, how could I not appreciate the first cryptocurrency in history, you know? But a lot of people are asking, okay, so what does Bitcoin have to do with revolution? What makes Bitcoin so revolutionary? Well, before we dive in, um, you know, we're going to talk about the concept of decentralized finance. So a lot of people, you know, being that this is Bitcoin 101, a lot of people are like, okay, but what does really, what does DeFi mean? And Doton from the London Stock Exchange, the director of Emerging Tech, he, he, he talked about it a little bit, but I like to consider it, um, it's like a Google Doc, you know, it's like a Google Doc that everyone can kind of, kind of work on, right? Like that's like the blockchain, the idea of blockchain. And what's also super exciting is that nobody owns it. And anyone, you know, can can contribute. 
So like drop a BTC in the chat because we got to make sure that we activate the chat. Drop a BTC in the chat if you're tracking, if you're picking up what we're putting down, right? If you're picking up what we're putting down. Now, Michael, another thing that's interesting and correct me if I'm wrong, right? But, you know, Bitcoin has never been hacked. Like it's just, it hasn't happened in its entire history. Now on the flip side, $6 trillion in cyber attacks have been lost globally. Yet Bitcoin has never been hacked. But we're going to dive into that, right? This is the Bitcoin 101 with Mike Rihani, Bitcoin product lead at Cash App. Welcome crypto for the culture. Yes, we're super excited to have you. Hello, I'm 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 drinking my coffee to get as excited as you. Normally, I'm the excited, hyped up guy, but I feel like you're gonna you know challenge me today. So I'm excited to be here. Thank you for everything you do, Lisa and Crypto Tutors, and and thank you for inviting us. This is awesome. Um, I'm I'm excited to chat. So very excited to have you. And you know, we talked a lot about um, you know trustworthy crypto education, and so I always preface who I'm speaking to with what they've accomplished in their careers, who they are. So with that being said, and correct me if I'm wrong as I go through the accomplishment, the accomplishments, your achievements, et cetera. But I wanna make sure folks understand when we say subject matter expert, what we mean. Stay with you, Michael. It's good. Go for it. All right. So you led product at Tesla where you helped integrate Bitcoin as a payment method on tesla.com, check. You that also happened. Yep. It happened. Okay, okay, okay. You also worked at Apple, where you launched and scaled Apple Pay on the web, Apple Cash, and Apple Card. Check. Okay. You now serve as the Bitcoin Pro Lead at Cash App, which is part of Block, a global tech company with a focus on financial services. But a few things that really struck a chord with me about you is your passion for individual liberty, economic freedom, sustainable energy. I saw some folks asking about that in the chat, sustainable energy. And this is the part that, you know, cause I'm just like a happy go lucky person delivering happiness. Like who doesn't want more happiness in their life? That, that sums that sums up everything, uh, both professionally and even tied in some of my personal uh, keywords there, I suppose. But yeah, that's everything what I'm about. And I uh, I would say the only thing I would add is I have the pleasure of saying I, I, I truly believe I have the best job in the world, uh, working full time on Bitcoin at an amazing company like Block, an amazing product and team like Cash App, with an amazing CEO and founder like Jack Dorsey. So. Uh, I'm extremely fortunate and grateful for where I'm at today. And I'm, I'm just here to share any knowledge that can help others. So let's go. Let's go. Well, super excited to have you as well. And uh, this is the Bitcoin, you know, 101 fireside chatty chat, as I like to say. Um, but before we get into the nuts and bolts of crypto and, and Bitcoin, let's start with something easy. The definition of money. How would you define money? Yeah, so money is a really deep, uh, complicated thing that we all kind of take for granted when we're born and just live throughout, right? And uh, money is really the way we store value, right? So we go to a job, we work, we provide goods and services for others, and then people give us what's called money. And if you study history and look back, I'm a big futurist, but I, I learn a lot about the future by looking backwards as well. If you, if you look back in history, we've used all kinds of things as money. We use salt, seashells, coins, silver, gold, gold coins, et cetera. Uh, it's, it's changed over thousands of years. And recently, uh, and all of those aren't perfect money. That's why we changed, right? Um, you know, gold had issues. And it's really hard to lug a, you know, a, a big you know, block of gold to go pay for a house or to buy groceries, you know, sl sl slivering off pieces of gold. So it just wasn't that portable, as an example, as, as a spendable daily currency. So money is where you store your value. You know, you, you do your job, you put that value somewhere. But it also needs to be used for everyday spend to buy groceries, to buy coffee. And that's where kind of gold uh, didn't really work out. And, you know, today, fast forwarding a little bit, we're in this kind of era of what's called fiat currency, which is 
government issued dollars uh, here in the United States or other other places around the world, the government often kind of pr pr prints money on pieces of paper and says, this is the money you have to use to pay your taxes. And this is the money you'll use um, around the world. So I, I would say those are kind of the two main pillars of money. It's you know, store your value and be able to use it to exchange goods and services. I love how you touched upon the different variations, right? You know, there was gold, you know, there was tulips, you know, there were seashells, you know, all of, you know, all of these examples throughout history kind of play into, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's what we decide has value is what has value. Like we as a collective. And that kind of brings me to my next question, which is, you know, how would you define cryptocurrency? You know, before we get into Bitcoin, like how would you define cryptocurrency in general? Well, before I answer that question, I want to double click on something you said was really money is a human belief system. If we all woke up and believed uh, tulips were money, tulips would be money. Uh, so that's what's quite fascinating about it. And we as human beings need to evaluate what is good money. And if we're going to move towards a digital money, there's all kinds of traits that we need to think through on what's good, hard digital money. So. Coming back to your question here is what is cryptocurrency? Uh, honestly, I'm gonna take uh, a few pages out of your book, Lisa. Last time we were talking, I loved your exam, you know, you, your, your definition. So if others have already heard it before, but you know, cryptocurrency really is a hybrid of two words, uh, cryptography, which is what is behind Apple Pay. It uses cryptography or iMessage or Signal when you do a cryptographic um, communication it's very secure and secret. So cryptography means the science of secrets. I love how you describe that piece. I think there's a great book called that, right? Um, and so it's this really complicated technology to make something secret. So communication, your message is secret. Money, your money is secret and private. And then cryptocurrency, the second part of the hybrid word is currency. So in this case, you know, we're meaning a digital money. And if we want to talk specifically about Bitcoin, which is a Bitcoin 101, and that sounds like you want to double click on Bitcoin next, is really Bitcoin is digital money that's protected by energy, computers, and passwords. So it's a very, to your point, it's never been hacked. The, the Bitcoin blockchain has never been hacked. It is arguably one of the most secure technologies that human beings have ever seen. Uh, so it's, it's a fascinating computer science um, innovation and, and creation. Why do you think that there's just such a, um, you know, there, there are so many people in the world that are so pro Bitcoin, you know, like, why do you think that they are so excited? I mean, you've got countries like El Salvador uh, recognizing or adopting Bitcoin as legal tender. You know, um, you, you have this global accessibility with Bitcoin. Why do you think people are so excited? Like, what is it about Bitcoin that gets people so like, just, I don't want to say obsessed, but yeah, like what gets them so excited? Yeah, I, I am 100% obsessed. Uh, if you look at my own personal Twitter account, I have a tweet thread pinned, uh, 21 reasons I'm dedicating the rest of my career to Bitcoin. Uh, and you can see the 21 reasons. Personally, I am pumped and dedicating decades to this technology. I, I think one way to sum up why obviously i can't speak on behalf of everybody um but i think one of the major things that's happening that a lot of people aren't really maybe fully attuned to and you do have to i've you know full disclosure i've gone down what they call the bitcoin rabbit hole for five or six years the first time i heard about it i thought it was silly i kind of wrote it off i was like oh that's never going to work um and and that's okay that's part of the learning process it took me five well, what, or six years to get to where i'm at what made you think it wasn't going to work though when you first heard about it like what was off yeah yeah it's um the main thing that i thought wasn't going to work was really the user experience of it so i'm a product guy i'm, I'm a customer obsessed person and i i really always want to make everything super easy and simple which i think cash App does a great job hence best job in the world um and when i looked at bitcoin's addresses i was just like nobody's going to copy and paste these long scary strings and email it to each other like this just isn't going to work right and yeah i i think even maybe a partially naive uh, westerner living in america you know and having full financial privilege I, I don't think i fully appreciated how 
how broken money is. I never studied the history of money and 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 fiat currency. And yeah, the the way I say, you know, the reason I say, you know, kind of checking in my own financial privilege in the West is I would say half of the world, billions of people uh, deal with double digit inflation with their currency every single year. And that's that's really challenging. And and I am half Lebanese, um, so I'm 50 percent. Uh, you know, my, my father's from Lebanon and the World Bank, you know, declared I don't know if everybody's been following the news, but the World Bank has declared the economic collapse that happened in Lebanon uh, to be one of the f worst economic collapses in the past 150 years. So, for example, my friends and family have lost. 95% of all of their net worth in the past two years, uh, which is just terrible. And, and, and it's because they don't have good money. And, and so the more I researched, so I, I didn't see any of those things at first. I just said, oh, that's a clunky user experience. That's not going to work. And then I went on to my day job. Uh, but when I really paused and I studied a lot, and I learned a lot, uh, a lot of things started you know, making sense to me. So one other point, your, your question was why, why, are people like me, you know, dedicating my life and or career to this? Why are people so passionate about it? You know, probably even why is Cash App and Block so passionate about it? I can probably touch a little bit more on all of those. You know, one, one analogy I have is, so not only did I wake up to money feels broken and or can be better, but when you dig into the computer science and technology of it, my analogy is Bitcoin as a technology has been the largest software invention or creation since the creation of the internet. So as a technologist and somebody who enjoys computer science and product development, it, it's a masterpiece. And, and, and if we all just pause and go, well, how much has the internet changed all of our lives? Well, we're all on the internet attending a free virtual conference, streaming 4K video with thousands of people all because of the internet. It's changed every single industry you can think of. And I personally believe Bitcoin is, is, is likely to change every single industry a uh, similar way that the internet has done. So obviously, if, if you believe that statement, you know, that can put you in the shoes of folks like myself who are, are really kind of seeing the potential um, and, and, and what that can do for not only communication and knowledge, right? You know, think about the internet. We store our knowledge on the internet. You know, Wikipedia, <laughs> email, all these websites are storing knowledge. Well, now we can store money on the internet and, and create a native currency of the internet. And, and, and that could be Bitcoin. And if you had a native currency of the internet, you could even have a global currency that's really going to bring down borders, you know, and create more accessibility and fairness for more people. And so Bitcoin's values are deeply aligned with Block's purpose of economic empowerment. And we can go more into the core principles of what makes Bitcoin Bitcoin. But uh, yeah, I can I can go hours on why Bitcoin is going to be a big deal. I love that because, you know, a couple of things that you talked about, um, you know, accessibility and financial inclusion, you know, uh, there are something like two billion people in the world of what nearly eight billion that are unbanked. They're completely excluded from the, the, the financial system. You know, and that is one of the opportunities that we have in this space to solve for with Bitcoin. And I, I think, too, you know, you mentioned being Lebanese and I'm Haitian. And so I feel like we personally know what it is to be exposed to like hyperinflation and, you know, the debasing of value of our currencies and, and what have you. You know, how does Bitcoin counteract that? You know, like how how is Bitcoin um, helping to solve for that with the kind of universality of the universal nature. Yeah, there's probably two kind of principles. There's there's probably dozens we can talk about, but just to keep it simple and, and really focus on kind of the economic empowerment, accessibility, and global aspect of Bitcoin. It is one of Block's core principles is that anybody should have the ability to participate in the financial system, right? I work at Cash App, a sister kind of company and business unit of ours is Square. And you know, when, when you look at the history of Square, it was the, 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 the flower shop at the corner couldn't accept credit card payments because she wasn't able to get a um, credit card reader from her bank. She had to apply and it was this big whole thing. And so Square was created to kind of 
allow the small businesses to participate in the financial system. And what I think Bitcoin does, it allows any individual to participate in the system easily without discrimination, nothing required. You just need an internet connection, right? And so we believe, you know, Bitcoin can help deliver on the vision, on that vision by allowing people worldwide to make payments efficiently, securely, and at a low cost, right? There's a lot of middleman services and companies that do provide efficient and secure payments, but they are often slow and very expensive. And so as Bitcoin is designed to be that native currency of the internet, it really unlocks a lot of potential. And another analogy is just like communication, right? I don't want to date myself or others, but you know, 10, 20 years ago, if you tried to, if I tried to call Lebanon, I had to pay $2.50 per minute on the phone. Or if I wanted to send a text message, it was 25 cents per SMS text message. Well, communication went to zero. Now in WhatsApp, Signal, Telegram, I can call my family in Lebanon for free. We can talk for hours. And so that innovation was phenomenal and great for communication. That same innovation will be great for billions of people for money. And so who doesn't want more efficient, more secure, faster and cheaper money movement around the world? Who doesn't want a better place to store their value where I, I would say the, the, the second thing I want to touch on. So that first one is really around the, the payment layer and, and, and access. It's accessible by everybody. There's no, there's no rules. The second thing I wanted to touch on uh, was there's no single point of failure. There's no one company. There's no one CEO. There's no one government behind it. So many areas, you know, we can all point fingers on what happened in Lebanon, whether it was the banks or certain politicians, or we can all, you know, speculate on what happened in countries like Venezuela, or Argentina. We can even point fingers here in the United States on why we're um, experiencing such inflation, right? Um, but and, and, and there are certain mechanisms that governments uh, participate in to manage their own money. Well, there is no government. There is no company. There is no single point of failure. Bitcoin is just running. It is a network of computers, just like the Internet. You can't turn off the Internet. You can't turn off Bitcoin. It's just going to run forever. So, um, yeah, it's uh, one of the clear use cases is international remittances where borderless and secure nature of Bitcoin shines. Um, you can look as well on my uh latest uh twitter my uh, i sent uh, ten dollars to my friend mary in nigeria in under 10 seconds and the money traveled over ten thousand kilometers and it was practically free and instant like that's a real thing she took a video she posted on her our twitter a few days ago and and, and you can really see actual use cases and how it's actually working and and that was powered over the lightning network i sent from my cash app to her uh, lightning enabled wallet, but it was not Cash App, uh, but a different Bitcoin lightning wallet in Africa, which is really cool and powerful to see. I absolutely love that, right? Because a lot of the conversation today is DI all odds. And, you know, it's a double entendre I mentioned in the beginning of the conversation. Um, and, and in the context of like the decentralized finance arena, you know, this is creating opportunities for everyone to participate in, in, you know, a financial ecosystem that is not, you know, beholden to authorities that, you know, corruption is an issue, right? Uh, you know, like there's just so many problems that can be solved. And, you know, the interesting thing about Bitcoin as well is that like, that's the on-ramp, like, you, you know, that's like people's introduction to the whole, you know, crypto uh, ecosystem. And, you know, even at Crypto Tutors, you know, Cash App actually has the easiest like on-ramp to buy Bitcoin, right? Like it's literally a few steps to get access to this, um, this revolution, this technological revolution. And that brings me to my next question, Michael, which is, you know, tell us about some of the cool products that you're working on at Cash App, you know, like you mentioned the Lightning Network. Tell us about what's going on and, and, and what you're building for the future today. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. We have so much. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Uh, let, let me double click a little bit on what you said, kind of uh, being a simple and easy way to buy Bitcoin, because I think that that's you know an easy way to get in and start playing with it. Um, and then I can uh, explain a little bit more about the Lightning Network, which is more of a kind of technical solution. I'll, I'll give you more of the benefits of it. So yes, yeah, so you can buy Bitcoin on Cash App or other exchanges. But what's cool is with Cash App, you can buy as little as a dollar. So a lot of people 
uh, incorrectly think you need to have $20,000 uh, to buy Bitcoin. And that's not true. That's just the price of one Bitcoin. And so you can buy as little as a dollar and you'll receive sats, which are short for satoshis, which is a fraction of a Bitcoin. So you can go to Cash App, link your debit card and just buy a dollar and you'll have 4,953 sats. That's what my clock is showing over here, how much you get for a dollar. Uh, so you get about 5,000 sats worth of Bitcoin, but that's like option one, you can just buy. There's another option that we have within Cash App, which I'll call set it and forget it. You, you can just set it up once and not really worry about the stress of, am I buying at the high or the low? And there's two new features that I'd like to talk about and highlight there. One is called Bitcoin Roundups. So when you use the cash card that we have, which is our debit card, you go buy anything, you, you go get your coffee, you go get your groceries, and we'll automatically round up your spare change into Bitcoin for free with no fees. And so what that means is you go buy your $3.50 coffee and we round up to $4 and you get 50 cents of Bitcoin. And you don't even need to think about it. You just live your life like you normally would. And then you come back a month later, and you'll probably have 10 or $15 of Bitcoin. You'll be like, cool, now I'm into it and I didn't need to stress. Another did, way did of I, doing I, it. I, well, well, I'm sorry. We, we, need to, we, need to, we need to drill down. You know, as you say, yeah. double click. That's like such a tech expression, but we, we got to drill down <laughs> to that. <laughs> did I hear that uh, any purchase that you make, uh, it's rounded up and you get rewarded essentially? So it rounds up with your own money. So sorry, there's no fees, right? So you spend, you know, so you'll get charged $4 on a $3.50 coffee and the 50 cents is set aside and invested in Bitcoin. And that investment is free. We don't charge any fees, right? So that's, um, it's even easier and more seamless than, you know, what I'll call smash buy, right? Going in and hitting the buy button. Uh, another kind of set and forget it feature that we have that we're super excited about is called get paid in Bitcoin. So instead of, when you buy things, you could get you know, auto invest into Bitcoin every single time you get paid. So let's say you have a paycheck that comes in every two weeks. You could say, hey, when I get paid, when my paycheck lands, put 1% into Bitcoin automatically. And, and, and so that's a new feature we launched. And so those two, I would say, are the set it and forget it. Uh, we also have auto buys. So you can do custom schedules. And then the third way to buy Bitcoin or, or get into it is actually not buying it, but it's just getting straight up free Bitcoin, <laughs> which I think everybody, Lisa, is not going to be upset about uh, if we're going to give you free Bitcoin. And the way to do that is to use your cash card and then you activate what we call uh, uh, is a Bitcoin boost. And so Bitcoin, you know, boost are kind of our rewards program. And you'll, you can activate a Bitcoin boost. You need to look into your kind of carousel of rewards um, once you have cash card. But then you can get five or ten percent off your coffee or groceries or a restaurant. So I go buy a fifty dollars worth of groceries and I get five dollars of Bitcoin for free. I don't even need to do anything. So we have free Bitcoin, we have set it and forget it Bitcoin, and we have buy. So I just wanted to extrapolate a little bit more and and not have everybody assume that you just need to buy twenty thousand uh, dollars because that is a misconception in the industry. That is so important. And I'm so glad you call that out because a lot of people are intimidated by the fact that they don't think that they have the means to participate when in fact, like, you know, we spend money on, um, you know, getting our nails done, you know, the ladies and, you know, we spend money on just frivolous things that like, if we had that pause, we could invest in an asset that in the long term will, will pay us back in dividends. So thank you for calling that out. And, and that actually kind of touches upon like, you know, at cash, like, you know, and at block, for, uh, financial inclusion is so important, you know, organizationally, you know, you're creating a lot of products that are helping drive that. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about like, what does the future look like? You know, what what's coming down the pike or what's on the horizon in terms of, you know, the, the you know, products, you know, services, solutions, that, that you're, you're building to kind of drive more inclusive, a more inclusive, you know, financial um, ecosystem. Absolutely. So we're doing a lot. It's hard to keep a track, uh, keep track of them all. So I'll have to check my notes and come back on all the amazing things that we built and are building. You, you also mentioned the Lightning Network, which has uh, been something I've been very focused on. Uh, so I'll, I'll touch on that because that's rolling out and is available now to 100% of Cash App customers. And we'll, you'll, it will be more uh, announcements uh, happening in, in, in the near future. But what, what the Lightning Network does is... It's it's kind of a technical integration, but let me just say what it gives people because that's what people care about. The Lightning Network makes 
Bitcoin extremely fast and with Cash App, it's free, but there's a very small fee if you use other wallets. And why that's important, and, and maybe you thought, oh, well, I thought Bitcoin was fast and you know, it's internet digital currency. Why would it be slow? Uh, <laughs> that doesn't make sense. And so the Bitcoin network itself is what we call a layer one and there's blocks every 10 minutes. And so that means it will take 10 minutes to verify a transaction. So I can send you, Lisa, te- you know, $10 on the Bitcoin network but it may take 10 minutes. And, and that was that video I was alluding to where I sent my friend Mary in Nigeria, Bitcoin instantly. Well, that was over the Lightning Network. And the reason why that's important is because if we want, you know, we talked about right at the beginning, you opened up what is money. Well, money is a store of value. Well, we can put our, we can get paid in Bitcoin, but then we need to spend it. Well, if I need to spend my Bitcoin at the local coffee shop and I have to sit there and wait for 10 minutes before they give you the coffee, one, I'm gonna have cold coffee and two, nobody's happy, right? It's just not gonna work. And so for, for Bitcoin to be used as a currency, we need a faster way. And you know, we believe the Lightning Network is that best kind of scaling solution uh, to make it fast and free. And I, I can just end on a, a simple analogy that also, I think, kind of helps explain the future potential of it as well. So I, I, we talked about Bitcoin being as big as the Internet from a software just creation standpoint. Another analogy is just like the Internet is like Bitcoin. I believe you know lightning is like email and the reason i say that is email is a layer two application on top of the internet layer right you you, you're sending communication over the internet well lightning network is a layer two on top of the bitcoin network it is secured by the bitcoin network you get all the benefits of bitcoin never being hacked being one of the most secure technologies on the planet and but you get the the layer two application benefits that it's you know, practically free and nearly instant. And and the one thing that I didn't really click on, another tech term, double click, clicking on, uh, <laughs> is that it's interoperable. And that's why I bring up email, right? Because if Lisa, you use Gmail and I use Yahoo, we can still email each other. It doesn't matter which company we choose to use, right? So with the Lightning Network, it's interoperable. It doesn't matter. It's just an open standard. It's a payment protocol that can move Bitcoin. So um, if you think email was going to be a big deal uh, back in the day, I think we're going to see something very similar with the Lightning Network and what it enables for, for Bitcoin and money. So we are super excited uh, to announce that it's available to 100% of customers and it's just the beginning. I love it. I love it. And, you know, um, the simplicity, you know, of the interface, like we don't need to know like what all goes into, you know, the, the, the tech uh, but just having products that make accessing this Web3 world easy, like that's a lot of what you spoke about today and, you know, the work that you're doing at Cash and Block. We, uh, we thank you for, you know, facilitating the onboarding process of so many people that are like intimidated to get into the space. You know, we're talking about in a couple of clicks, you're in the game. Um, And that's really exciting. And I also love how with the Lightning Network, you know, you related it to or likened it to, you know, um, email for money. You know, these are concepts that people can understand. You know, there's there's a a general kind of, you know, consensus like, okay, yeah, I get it. Email, whatever. And that's why we, you know, named this panel Bitcoin 101. So, you know, with that being said, we're, we're closing out. I don't know if you have any final words you'd like to share before we wrap? I I would say um, thank you all for your time. Thanks for having me. I hope this was helpful and interesting. I I would say as a next step action item, you know, if you're attending this session is I would truly urge you to just keep investing in yourself, right? You're, You're coming to these, you're trying to learn, learn more about Bitcoin. And there's a saying in Bitcoin and cryptography and cryptocurrency it's just specifically in Bitcoin uh, that says, don't trust, verify. So don't just trust what I said, like go fact check me and, and, and go make your own opinion. Go read your own books and watch your own movies and talk to other uh, subject matter experts and see if they agree with what I said and, and see if that aligns with what you're looking to get out of this, right? The internet plays multiple facets in people's lives, just like Bitcoin is gonna play different roles in different people's lives. So. Yeah, keep learning more. Keep attending conferences like this. Um, you know, feel free to add me on LinkedIn and or Twitter. You can DM me if you have any questions. I can send you links to some of the things we mentioned. 
Um, or if you just want to learn more, just uh, feel free to ping me. I'm always here to be a resource. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. And uh, thank you. So unbelievably excited to have had your genius and, and share your genius with the Crypto for the Culture community. We do not take for granted how important your time is, how important the, the technical infrastructure you're building is. And just the fact that like you want to, you know, you want people to have experiences with tech that bring joy and happiness. Honestly, who doesn't want to work with this guy? <laughs> like, Cash App has over the jobs you're hiring. So definitely, you know, uh, stay connected to Michael. Um, he's definitely somebody that, uh, you know, you're going to want to follow the journey of, you mentioned Twitter, uh, your Twitter is lit, you know, Twitter seems to be the spot where a lot of these, you know, crypto conversations are happening. So people need to stay connected, but, um, thank you, Michael, for joining us. We are happy to have had you and have a great rest of the day. Crypto totals, crypto totals, crypto totals, hey. It's a way making money in my sleep. Making money in my sleep. Step by step, click by click. Waves, Bitcoin, stable coin, we got the tips. Get ahead of the curve, time is now. Bitcoin at 40,000, what's the new cash cow? Become a tutor, make money from your knowledge. Turn the risk into wealth. We decentralize college. Enroll today before it's too late. All right. Oh my gosh. What a phenomenal panel that we just had. You know, it was so interesting because on the heels of, um, you know, Mike Rehani. Uh, over at Cash App, you know, talking about what got him excited about being in this space uh, and, just, you know, working at Cash App. It's like the perfect segue into careers because, you know, even though a lot of organizations are, um, you know, there are a slew of layoffs, it's so exciting to be able to share and to be able to hear about opportunities at the U.S. Coast Guard and Fidelity and, of course, Cash App. Um, so I'm very excited to be welcoming each of you to Crypto for the Culture. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. Uh, but before we get started, I just want to set the stage. So, you know, ZipRecruiter reports the average crypto salary nationwide is approximately $144,000. So all I'm saying is that, you know, they know that we know that they know that this is what's happening in our space. Uh, this is our second uh, careers panel of the day. And just kind of, you know, segueing from, you know, Michael at Cash App to Millie at Cash App. Let me give the folks that are tuning in a little bit of background. And I'm going to do this for each of you, just so when we say subject matter expert, they know exactly what we're talking about, what we mean by that. So Millie, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, I want to make sure that I'm doing you justice. Um, you're an engineering manager at Cash App. You're leading a team in crypto abstraction. You're working to increase access to Bitcoin and crypto across the world, all noble causes. So check, check, check. Yes, yes. Okay, great. Got it. You're got based it. in Perth, Australia. God bless you. I don't know what time it is there now, but you, know. you do not want to know, Lisa. <laughs> That's why I'm giving you all the energy. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you for being all the way around the world but joining us. Um, you <laughs> recently, though, Millie, this is super exciting, moved into management, um, and you're learning in public, you know, what it means to be a leader in tech who's true to herself and who helps create teams with high trust and autonomy. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. That's a beautiful introduction. I just want to make sure that you all know how appreciative we are and you know those that are listening get to like celebrate you as well so next up we have ashley glover welcome ashley so good to see you again so good to see all of you again uh you're currently the talent acquisition leader for fidelity investments you manage the crypto recruiting center of excellence as well um you also uh are involved in several 
of Fidelity's business segments, including Fidelity Digital Assets, Fidelity Labs, the Fidelity Center for Applied Technology, and Fidelity Charitable. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes, we could go on for uh, across businesses forever, but those those are some of the fun ones that people may have heard of. So, and also, I love how we have two power two female powerhouses from Fidelity. Can we just like have a moment on that? We had Sterling earlier today, and now we have you. So, um, love celebrating that. Ashley, we're not done yet, though. Hold on a second. Hold on. Hold on. You also lead the strategic talent sourcing function for Fidelity. And what's also stood out and is so in line with like everything we've represented, Crypto for the Culture, that also includes um, a diversity sourcing team aimed at generating talent for underrepresented communities. So thank you for all of that. And we're happy to have you. And this is definitely the place where you're going to get some good people. I don't know how that feel about it. Thank, thank you. I do want to clarify, I have passed off the strategic sourcing team. I've got my hands full of all of the other stuff. Hey, I, I built it and handed it over to um, one of my colleague, colleagues, Hernan, who is a fabulous leader and doing amazing things with it. So, but I, I would take credit for it, but he deserves it more than I do. See, like, that's what I'm talking about. Open, honest, constructive, all of that. Excellent. Thank you for clarifying and uh, super happy to have you. Uh, and, and last but certainly not least is the decorated, honorable Dr. Ronzel Green, captain of the U.S. Coast Guard. Now, Captain Green, uh, you're also a senior executive and IT leader who's previously held the chief information officer role at the U.S. federal government. Yes. You know, I had to do my due diligence. I couldn't come to this conversation and not make sure I knew what I was talking about. Yes. Um, yes? Yes? Okay. Yes, yes, and the government. Captain Green, your experience spans across system engineering, policy, acquisition, and program management in government and at Fortune 500 companies. Yep. Wow. Great. I mean, listen, you all are great. And it's so apropos that we're talking about careers at each of your respective organizations, because if, you know, you're there doing the work that you're doing, how you're doing it, who doesn't want to work alongside you? So thank you, everyone, for joining us in our careers panel today. Super excited to have you. Um, Ashley, I'm going to kick things off with you. So this is what's interesting. You began your career working in television at ABC. Uh, you were production associate at Nightline, you know, rubbing elbows with Ted Koppel. So how did you transition from television to talent acquisition, to a talent acquisition leader at Fidelity managing? Because I feel like, you know, crypto recruiting center of excellence, like that deserves an honorable mention. <laughs> so how did yeah. you do it? Yeah, great question. Um, some days I wake up, I'm like, how, how did this happen, right? Um, I will tell you one of the common themes of those two things is that I love to learn. Um, and I am nowhere near an expert in anything that I do, but I am passionate about always seeking to understand and um, love, you know, just asking people questions and learning on a daily basis. So I, I would say that's that common theme there. Um, you know, the time in television was amazing. It's It's something I had dreamed about doing all through high school and um, prepared for. But um, the, the transition really came when the economy tanked in 2008. Um, and I found myself looking for a new role. I didn't want to move to New York with the company. It wasn't in my cards. It wasn't in my future. I was engaged and moving south. Um, and so I really started to look at what was out there, what was happening in the market. And so technology really was one of those key components to that. Um, and I found an organization that was willing to teach me um, the X's and O's of recruiting. And so I just immersed myself in it. And it's amazing how something that you you have no idea what to expect from it, you just dive in head first and um, embrace it and grow with it. And, and that's kind of how it all transpired. You know, I moved then into contingent labor uh, at the company. Uh, I've had an amazing leadership team that has supported me for all of my career at Fidelity and helped develop me into who I am today and um, really just kind of grow that potential for me. I love that. And I also love the fact that like that career arc is, you know, it seems like they are diametrically opposed. Like we're talking about yeah. two different worlds. I mean, yes. and we are, right? Yeah. But yeah. you were able to, you know, kind of find your way. And uh, 
it's exciting and also inspiring because a lot of people, again, may think that there aren't places for them in crypto because they're not engineers and what have you. But I love how your story dispels that myth. That's one of the common themes that we've heard from tons of our speakers throughout today. So um, thanks yeah. for echoing yeah. that sentence. Yeah, I'll tell you. So, you know, I was supporting digital assets, which was kind of the foundation and, and the building block of digital assets at Fidelity. And it's, you know, it's growing and expanding across all of our products and areas, as you heard from Sterling earlier today, right? Um, it, and it was one of those things where I, I didn't know crypto. My husband had been investing in crypto on the side and I heard him talking about it. I knew nothing about it. Um, but it was an opportunity to learn and, and challenge myself in a brand new way. And the people were fantastic. And I loved being able to lock arms with people who had that same mindset. They were you know, not as, as risk averse as, as some people might expect from a financial services organization, right? Um, and we're all learning together and embrace that kind of concept of not knowing what is coming, what's next, but believing in meeting our customers where they need us to meet them. I love that. I love that. Um, and, and so, Millie, I'll uh, pass the baton to you. Tell me a little bit about your role at Cash App and, and your career journey. Like, how did you get to where you are? Sure. Uh, and then first off, I love that story also, Ashley. Um, I, I feel so excited and humbled to be in this room full of amazing people already. Uh, like, the imposter syndrome is creeping in a bit, but I'm, I'm going to do Millie, you're still. awesome. I already said it. I, already, <laughs> I love it. Uh, if you say so. Thank you so much. Well, I guess, you know, before I joined Cash App, I, I spent, you know, about a decade in multimedia um, and engineering. But honestly, there, there was no other company like Cash App in Australia uh, that was doing this kind of fintech at scale. And, and that's really what made this job and this opportunity so interesting to me. So, you know, if we rewind a little bit, you know, I, <laughs> I studied multimedia in university, which is, you know, I like to say it's the the degree for people who don't know what they want to do. Uh, so it's a little bit of animation, it's drawing, video production, games, you know, you name it, I, I probably did it. <laughs> so I learned some basic coding and I, I made some terrible, awful, awful WordPress websites. Uh, and that's kind of how I got started. I wasn't very good at it, but it wasn't until, you know, I, I kind of interned at one of Australia's largest real estate websites, kind of like the Zillow of Australia, but obviously smaller scale. Uh, where I kind of, you know, I actually realized, well, there are people who I just relate to and jive with here. Like, you know, they're awkward, they're nerdy, they're just lovely, clever people. And I was like, wow, this is the tech industry. This is for me. Uh, and so I felt like I belonged for the first time uh, because, you know, it wasn't just the kind of men in, in, you know, basements kind of sweatily typing on keyboards, like a lot of, the, you know, the stereotype is. It was actually just like normal people. So, you know, Cash App, you know, it, it's quite, you know, the actual app itself isn't available in Australia. So not many people know about it, but, you know, a couple of my friends went to work there and they couldn't stop raving about it. And so when I interviewed and the recruiter said, uh, would you like to join the machine learning team or the Bitcoin team? You know, I kind of sat and said, well, they're both incredibly nerdy and I know nothing about either of them. So... My wife is very into personal finance. She's taught me a lot. So I thought, well, if I join the Bitcoin team, I could teach her something. So that was kind of my inspiration for joining this team. I joined as an engineer and, and I've just recently transitioned to management, which is a whole is a whole journey, as you probably, as everyone on this call probably knows. <laughs> I love that. And I love that you uh, decided, you know, to just, take that Bitcoin opportunity because it would make you seem smarter to your partner. Like, that's excellent. Like, whatever the model. A little cute. <laughs> Look, we all do it very different ways, Lisa. We all take our own journeys. <laughs> no judgment, okay? Like, I'm, we're just happy you're here and we're happy you're helping build the future. So thank you for that. Um, and Captain Green, I think you may be the only person, at least that I know of, in the U.S. military speaking at this conference. So Thank you for your service, first and foremost. And um, tell us, I mean, I think that a lot of people are maybe curious about what brought the U.S. Coast Guard to want to participate in this conversation about careers in crypto. So maybe first, Dr. Green, what does the U.S. Coast Guard do? I think that might be a good starting point. Yeah, no, no. For, uh, thank you. First of all, Lisa, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, I, you know, I do really appreciate it. You know, and, and these sessions, I usually like to start with something funny. Uh, but my kids tell me I'm not remotely funny. So I'll, I'll boom, boom, boom. 
Um, no, the Coast Guard is, uh, you know, it's a, one of the five military services, um, 11 statutory missions, so search and rescue, defense, uh, aids and navigation, you know, you see the hurricanes um, um, come through, uh, definitely a humanitarian service, um, really uh, focuses on helping, helping people domestically and also internationally. Um, crypto and our folks, you know, we're, we're, we're investing a lot in the background and technology and looking for talented people in crypto. So, for example, I had an opportunity to serve at a cryptological unit. So we're looking for those talented, uh, talented people to, to come and serve the country. And for me, you know, my, my journey definitely was, you know, my, my father served, my, my grandfather served. And when I, you know, they weren't able to go to college during that time period, but I was able to finish college. And at the time I was working for a great Fortune 100 company, but I always wanted to serve. And so I had the opportunity in the Coast Guard Reserve to sign up and serve um, part time. And so giving people the uh, opportunity to serve the country part time so they still can do their uh, professional career, but then they can also serve the country. And of course, there's benefits from Coast Guard Reserve, from pay and college for the kids and all those type of things. So we're definitely looking for talent. We're looking at a lot of opportunity uh, for people, um, you know, definitely from gender and people of color. We're looking for all types, but we're looking to recruit, you know, the next generation, people that are looking to serve, serve the country. I love that. And I also love the fact that, you know, the flexibility aspect, right? So you've got, you know, part-time opportunities and, you know, the, the benefits and, you know, a lot of people who are, you know, crypto world, whether they're, you know, traders or what have you, they may not consider uh, the U.S. Coast Guard as a place where they can have the option to work on a part-time basis and still, you know, work on building uh, their companies and what have you. Uh, so that's really excellent. My my next question is, you know, Ashley, let's talk a little bit about I think you've been at Fidelity for maybe like over four years now, or is it longer? Uh, than you? I just hit 10 years this month. So yeah, <laughs> it feels like four years. Well, I like, just not feel like I've been here for 10. But <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm sorry, over uh, almost 10 years. Congratulations on your decade of you. awesomeness and amazing work at Fidelity. I started when I was 10. You all know that, right? <laughs> Actually, I'm like, go do the math. Go do the math. How could it be? Like, I don't know. Are they, are they hiring, <laughs> uh, you know, teenagers now? Um, but, but saying that to say, you know, you okay, 10 years at Fidelity. What yeah. do you love the most about the company? And what do you love yeah. the most about all of the jobs that you've held? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to hold back the like excitement and like screaming it out to you all. Um, I love Fidelity. Fidelity is my home. Um, it is the type of place where... I, I actually left briefly a, a while ago, um, and when I left, I realized the people and the leadership are remarkable, um, and it's unlike any place I've ever worked. Um, and you can't put a value on that, in my opinion. Um, you know, and that's what's kept me here for ten years is that we have really smart people to work with first and foremost, and I feel challenged and like I can learn from everybody that's uh, whether it's my leadership team or the people on my team that report to me I learn every single day from the remarkable people around me um, and fidelity really is just an entire culture of that I also feel like our leadership is just so thoughtful of what is coming down the pike and we have a history of innovation and it's really unique to be able to say you have a history of innovation. That's a really unique combination that you have where your company is, is A, established enough that it has a history and B, has been a leader in innovation. And so, you know, for me, those are some really key components to my career at Fidelity. Um, I would also say, you know, that we have um, a leadership team of like very underrepresented groups and our, our leader is a female, like the owner of the company is yeah, a woman. Oh, yeah. No. Yes. So, and Abby is one of those people who like, it's a culture of supporting one another, no matter what your background is. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm from a really tiny town in the middle of Kansas, right? Like I am not a new Englander from a, a high prestigious college or anything like that. Um, this is my second career, like all kinds of, of areas where you would feel inadequate in so many ways in an organization like um, the size of Fidelity or the scope of Fidelity, but I've never once felt like that. Um, and I think that's a credit to our ability to think and react differently to the talent that we have in our hands and develop them really, really well. 
I love the fact that, you know, um, Abigail Johnson, your CEO, right? Like being, uh, again, a woman in a industry that we are grossly underrepresented and, you know, leveraging that platform and, and leaders like yourself that are representing, uh, you know, representing inclusion, you know, and, and making a concerted effort uh, to create an ecosystem within your organization that's reflective of the the co your customers, you know, like that is so vital to, you know, our ethos here at Crypto for the Culture, which is why we're connecting our community with opportunities and organizations like the U.S. Coast Guard, like HAP and of course, Fidelity. So so thank you for sharing. Um, Millie, let me ask you this, right? You mentioned um, you were an individual contributor when you were first recruited to Cash App, and now you're an engineering manager. So can you tell us a little bit about that experience, like the transition and maybe even some of the uh, upskilling you had to do to be, you know, um, you know, uh, prepared to take on that managerial? Sure. Look, there are so many things I could talk about in transitioning to this role. I, I really thought when I chose to be an engineering manager, when I was given this opportunity, that I was like, oh, I'm already, I'm already doing it. It's fine. It won't be that much different. And uh, boy, was I wrong because, you know, at, at Cash App, the parallel tracks, you know, a, a promotion from IC doesn't make you an EM. So you actually have to move sideways. And I think that's really important because they are different jobs and they do require different skills. And, you know, to me, one of the most important things is hiring. You know, I mean, Ashley knows, right? Uh, as an engineering manager, I get to be responsible for building, you know, a diverse, an inclusive team for the first time. You know, in previous roles, I was always put into teams, mostly with guys, uh, and I didn't get to kind of choose who I work with. And, and now I actually get to make those very deliberate, conscious decisions about, you know, who I think can help build the future of finance at Cash App, right? You know, when I became an EM, you know, December last year, my team was two people. It was great, but, you know, I was tasked with grow this team from two to six. And I thought, well, I want to be very deliberate here. I don't want to just pick the first people in the pool. I wanted to create a very diverse, you know, not just not just gender as well. You know, we talk about intersectionality when it comes to diversity, right? So I wanted to make sure that people from different career backgrounds, you know, we have medical researchers, we have um, civil engineers um, and, you know, cultural as well. We have people from Iran, Israel, Vietnam. You know, my team is just amazing. And we have a perfect kind of, you know, 50-50 gender split. And that's one of our superpowers at Cash App is that this thing is first and foremost the most important thing when it comes to building teams at Cash App. And now I get to be at the forefront of that. So honestly, that is actually one of the most exciting things about my job is building and growing those kinds of people. So if I could leave, you know, you with just one more tip about, you know, becoming an EM and hiring, it's, you know, avoid hiring the brilliant jerks. We all, we all know them. We've all worked with them, you know, great at their job, but honestly, no one wants to work with them, right? So, you know, at Cash Out, we definitely value lots of different skills. And, and some of those are, you know, technical skills, but a lot of them are communication and collaboration and different ways of thinking. So, look, people can learn and grow, but you can't teach kindness, right? So, Honestly, that's the most important thing. You're like, I just want to work with good human beings. Is that too much to ask? It's not that hard. <laughs> it shouldn't be. I think we could all. It goes a long way. <laughs> it really does. Oh my God. No, thank you for that. That is so important. And I love the fact that you, you also too mentioned, like you have folks from such different, you know, backgrounds. Um, you mentioned, you know, civil engineers and, you know, like people that are not necessarily, you know, you wouldn't necessarily think like Ashley was saying that you would find yourself, you know, um, in the financial arena and in, in, in tech and what have you. So it's just so exciting to see how, you know, there's really space for everybody. Um, mm. Oh, definitely. There's yeah, exactly. And, you know, each of your organizations, there are quite a bit of roles. And we invite our audience to uh, look at the resource guide and go and learn about what opportunities there are at Fidelity, learn about what opportunities there are at Cash App, learn about what opportunities there are at the U.S. Coast Guard. And actually, are there any particular roles that um, you want to highlight in terms of like prioritization, just so folks know? 
to I would say from, from Fidelity's from Fidelity's standpoint, right? We have we have a plethora of roles open, so I can't I can't choose a favorite child. <laughs> that wouldn't be fair to anybody. Um, but I can tell you, even if you find a role that's not posted and tied to crypto, or that's posted and not tied to crypto, we are developing our our entire associate population in this area. We're rolling out learning um, resources for all of our employees um, and growing the knowledge base. And so, even if you come in the door and you want to learn crypto, but it's not something that you're signing up for day one. I encourage you to explore a career at Fidelity because there are opportunities to grow and move within the organization to that point down the road. Like Fidelity has a huge focus on mobility within our organization because you can bring so much value and knowledge from the skill set across the firm into different areas. And that really makes you a really well rounded um, employee. So I would suggest, right, um, even if it's not your dream job day one, there's a lot of opportunity to grow within the walls too yeah and, and you know one, one thing on the on the coast guard side you know definitely various roles and it depends if you want to vers- uh, diversify your skill set you know definitely we have crypto um but there's other roles you can do and the great thing about the coast guard you can do it part-time and still kind of concentrate in your career and one thing i, I did mention so our, our commandant the person that leaves her service uh, over the summer uh linda fagan is the first woman to lead a military service so the air force marine corps um, but she has a quote. She says, uh, tomorrow looks different and so should we. So tomorrow looks different and so should we. So as we're looking at different, you know, diverse thoughts and diverse viewpoints and all those type of things, bring them in the Coast Guard. And so we can make better decisions for the country. So, you know, definitely a career, but definitely for your folks to reach out to the website, um, figure out if they want to diversify their skills. You know, definitely leadership and taking care of people. It's kind of one of the trademarks of the Coast Guard. So looking forward to it. Yeah, Love that. maybe I can just underscore here what Ashley uh, and, and the captain said here. I mean, I want to join the Coast Guard now. This is very, very cool. <laughs> but honestly, crypto has opportunities for people with all kinds of skills, you know, marketing, design, communications, recruiting, accounting. You know, there are crypto accountants. You know, you don't have to be an engineer. I work with all kinds of people all day. And, and code, honestly, is just such a small part of it. So like Ashley said at the start, we're really trying to dispel this myth and bring everyone into crypto because the future of money requires everyone's voice. And I really love that quote, uh, that tomorrow looks different and so should we. I mean, that could be the slogan for Bitcoin, right? Like that is just beautiful. Oh my God, this is touching. Oh, wow. <laughs> Guys, I want to just give you all virtual hugs. <laughs> this is a virtual hug, okay? I'm literally giving you virtual hugs. That was so inspiring and just so like, it gave me pause because it got the wheels in my mind turning around how many people need to hear this conversation so that they can also calibrate their 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 future, right? We're talking about industries of growth. You know, there are a lot of industries that are contracting and the reality is tech and, you know, blockchain, just like the Web3 world in general, like it's exploding with opportunity. And it's so exciting that the people that are watching this get to hear about the incredible employment opportunities at the U.S. Coast Guard, at Cash App, at Fidelity. I mean, it's a, it's amazing, and there's a lot of people out there that you know might be needing a, a a jolt of inspiration, might be needing to be reminded that you know there are a lot of things happening in the world that we may not like, but you know there are things that are happening that are in fact. Um, uplifting and thank you for being a part of a conversation that reinforced that yeah i i would say you know um one of the cool things about this is everybody who's attending or watching this has taken the first step to really explore a new career and that takes courage and so i applaud everybody who clicks on this later or is on here now, it really is an exciting time to embrace what's next for you. Fidelity has an investor mindset. And so when things dip, we really lean in to meet our customers and to come out um, you know, with that investor mindset ahead in the market. And so I think that that's one of those things where if, if your career dips, don't take it as a knockdown, take it as an opportunity to lean forward and step forward. Um, and so I think that that's, they've done the first step in that just by joining here. I love that. And I invite the rest of you, Millie and uh, Captain Green, if you want to share any final thoughts before we uh, wrap up. Captain Green, do you want to go first? Sure, sure. No, so, so first, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. I knew we were def- definitely wrapping up, but I, I do like I like the comments. 
you know, this is the first step, you know, even, in, you know, Coast Guard kind of part-time employment or fidelity or cash hat, you know, kind of move your career forward um, because, you know, that's the opportunity. And, you know, the, the goal is to make sure everyone has opportunity. And, you know, this is definitely a space that you can get the opportunity and move forward. Uh, kind of is up to you. So thanks. Yeah. And, and, and thank you, Lisa, for organizing. This is amazing. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Captain Green. You know, I will just maybe end with, you know, technology is constantly evolving. A lot of people think they need very specific skills to like get a job right now. But honestly, it's about that growth mindset. It's about passion and excitement and just um, the ability to learn and grow is the most important thing. So honestly, if you don't know Solidity or C++, like it's, it's okay. There's, there's room for you here and, and we'll embrace you. Like we'll embrace you as you are. So please join us uh, and yeah, join the future. Join the future. Well, I, uh, I'm going to close out with Ebony who said that she needed to hear that. She needed to hear this panel today. And, you know, that's the kind of feedback that really reminds us how critical it is to be having these conversations. So thank you again for taking the time to uh, speak with us and sharing opportunities at Fidelity, at Cash App, at U.S. Coast Guard. Thank you for being the people that you are and really embodying the, the defy all odds, right? That, that ethos that we've been talking about today. Thank you for being the personification of that. Um, super excited to continue to follow your journeys and we will make sure that everyone, including the team at Crypto Tutors, stays in touch with you all. We have a resource guide where folks can uh, learn more about your opportunities and also uh, educational resources that you're offering. Uh, so with that being said, thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of the day and uh, we're going to go to a commercial break. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you, everyone. Did I ever do the rap for you? Did I ever do the rap for you? I haven't heard the rap. I'm ready to hear the rap. Yeah, that 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 track right there. That okay, okay. Because we're waiting for uh, Letta J to join. Uh, who's actually gonna? Hey, hey there nice. she go. All right, all right. We got a full out. Summer, what's up? Summer, what's up? What you up? Hey, girl. Yes. Okay. Um, it's a trans it's a it's a it's a it's a transition, right? Like. They've been kind of having the the you know crypto tutors fancy pod experience, but Letta J, I'm going to be passing the baton to you. However, yes. before I do, I got to make sure that they know what's good. I have to make sure that everybody that's tuning in understands who, in fact, is Letta J and why she's running point on moderating this discussion. Okay, so modern to to say modern Renaissance woman is kind of like okay, but what does that really mean? Well. Grammy nominated, champion gamer, Stanford alumni of Stanford University, uh, engineer grad. You're the founder of a video game startup that became the first offline subscription based gaming society in the world called Coexist Gaming. But you know what? They, they, may, they may have seen you. They, they may have actually seen you <laughs> on Netflix on the Netflix docu-series, The Future of Gaming, a woman after my own heart who's dedicated her life to empowering and motivating marginalized communities through education and activism. My soul sister from another mister. <laughs> I love it. I, I am so honored and, to be here. Thank you. Wait, wait, are you in the car? I feel like, are you like in a cab right now? That's all I know. I am. Name. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, yes, I literally just left Women Impact Tech. Uh, I was speaking on a panel. So I'm like one panel to the next and I've been excited all day and trying to make it work. <laughs> oh, my love. I am going to pass it to you. I love how this is how gangster and real crypto for the culture is. She's in Uber <laughs> doing the thing. So you know what, lady, I'm going to let you, uh, I'm going to let you point. But one other thing I had to add, though, because this is super dope. Um, you're going to be anyone that attended Crypto for the Culture attendees will get an ultimate day pass for coexist the coexist game house in the NYC. So just had to call that out. Um, that's the kind of love you're you're showing. So without further ado, I'm gonna let you 
do your thing and I'm gonna drop off and let let a J get it popping with OP and Summer. Peace. I love it. Yes. <laughs> so I'm I'm super honored to be a part and to be moderating. And I'm really excited. Thank you for that amazing intro. I want to reciprocate and give an amazing intro from Ms. Summer Watson who is the president and co-founder of the WYE Media Company, which is home of the NFT Native Young Black Digital Explorer Aku. Just like, we'll get into that. But the president of Volume One, a joint venture with Epic Records, focused on developing pop artists, uh, AJ Mitchell, Eddie Benjamin, Kid Culture. Summer is a consumer tech veteran, literally having led content, uh, marketing, and product at Playdom, inspired by Disney, Tune in episode Pocket Games. I mean, literally the list goes on, guys. But some of previously founded fashion, beauty, luxury industry leader CS Global as well, and is a heir with Pusha T. So she's just here to explain the NFTs, and she's here to stay. So don't get it twisted. The brains behind the coup. Please welcome Summer Watson. Great to great to be here. Thank you. And then we'll throw to OP as well. Or do you, do you need, or we might have lost. Uh, oh, I'm so sorry. My mic wasn't on. I think we lost. You're raving about. I'm raving about <laughs> me, okay? Yes. We hear you now. Okay, perfect. So Tally Labs, yes. Uh, so OP is the head of engineering at Tally Labs, which is uh, building a home for commu future community generated franchises and content. So co created communities, uh, Jenkins, Valet, the, the Valet, and Board Ape change the, own the ownership dynamic with NFTs to have equity in the project and allow people to drive the project, the drive um, the project and create content together. So previously to Tally Labs, he worked in engineering leadership uh, at multiple late stage consumer startups. He's been in the crypto field since 2016, but really made a deep plunge into the NFT world through NBA Top Shop in early 2021. So please let's introduce Tally Labs. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for the intro, Lil uh, I love it. Whew. We got we got New York in the background around you. I love it. First of all, I, I just want to say, I'm I'm so honored to be here. I I immediately recognize I'm not worthy to be on this panel with the two of y'all. Y'all are amazing. Also, shout out to Lisa for bringing the energy like she always does. Everybody, yes. everybody, Lisa's Lisa. I want I Lisa we has the most infectious. Lisa has the most infectious, infectious energy ever. I want to bottle it and I want to take injections of it daily. But we're gonna we're gonna get this thing kicked off. So for those that are watching and do not know what an NFT is, can you all please explain it or just describe it? Um, I had an experience recently. Um, a videographer who I adore um, and just for the life of him has been absolutely confused by NFTs for a year straight. We're really close. He came to Aku World in Miami, sat in on panels. He met all the people and he still came away and said, he was the only person that I knew that came away and said he still didn't understand. Um, so fast forward a little while, um, he actually went on the road with one of the volume one artists. Um, he had not traveled very much ever in his life. Um, and so this was a huge moment for him. He went, um, they were opening up for Justin Bieber. So he got to see a lot of different places and it just, you know, obviously a, a, an, a, an experience he really wanted to remember. Uh, we sat down for lunch and he was going through, he was showing me something on his phone. And I saw that he had dozens, like way more boarding passes saved in his Apple wallet than I thought was uh, healthy. Um, I am obsessive and I delete mine every single time I'm done. And I said, what are you doing? Do you need to delete those? Do you need help? Here's like, I know the shortcut to delete them all at once. And he said, no, this is, this reminds me of all the places that we went. And I said, oh, amazing. OK, so what happens um, if you don't back up your phone and you drop it in some water or Apple stops supporting the wallet? He was like, man, that sucks. I'll, I'll I lose them all. Right. I'm like if they had been the NFTs and written minted on the blockchain, uh, then no, they'd still be in your wallet. And immediately after like a year of him struggling to try to figure out what NFTs were, he went, oh, I get it. Um, so that's my favorite explanation so far. Um, and I'd love to hear obviously, uh, OP, OP's opinion, but, uh, that's been one of my favorites so far. Cause that was someone I really, really having a hard time getting through. 
I love that. I feel like uh, so many times you have to make a connection to something that someone already knows to kind of define what an NFT is, right? Non-fungible token, that means nothing to, to 99.999% of people uh, in the space uh, and outside the space, in all spaces, right? Like it, it's, it's not a, a great descriptive name. Um, I, I, I've, I've used a few before. I've talked to my parents about kind of trading cards or things that you can kind of think about. Um, I really like to distill it down to this idea of a, a little more abstract of a unique item on the internet that has, you know, some attributes around it um, that you can define at any point. And it can really have any value that you want. And I think one of the things that I think about how we've used them at Tally Labs is we've used them, um, we thought about them as characters, right? An, an individual NFT or a PFP, a profile picture as a character. We've thought about them as access tokens, right? We owning an NFT to get into a website. Um, and those are just kind of two use cases that, that, that we've used immediately. But I think in general, it's really thinking about uniqueness and this individual kind of item that, that you can own and pass around um, and can use for a multitude of purposes based on what community you're in. So it's uh, in many ways, it's a blank box. But yeah, I love getting back to like the really concrete examples when when you're with people who 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 have ideas of what NFTs may or may not be. Those are great descriptions, really informative. Thank you both for providing that. So for those watching that may not be familiar with Tally Labs or a coup, uh, what are you most known for and what are you solving for? I'll let you go. I can jump in first really quickly. Yeah, so Tally Labs uh, is basically, as you so eloquently put at the very beginning, building IP and software uh, for communities to really engage and mainly right now through storytelling. Um, so Tally Labs was essentially born out of our two co-founders buying a Bored Ape NFT, right? Uh, with the intention of storytelling through it. And that blew up, right? They created a character called Jenkins the Valet. He looked like a valet, he had the valet hat, valet, valet, uh, valet vest, um, and started telling stories about you know, this fictional world that was the Board API Club through, through Twitter mainly, um, and attracted a lot of the uh, original Board Ape community. People really wanted to contribute their creation, their creative ideas to what this work could be. And so as you think about that, what is, what is, what is the next level of this community? Um, we've turned that into a book called Board and Dangerous, which is the first community generated work that's come out of the NFT world. Um, it was written by Neil Strauss, who's a 10 times New York Times bestseller. Um, so it's an amazing power behind this book. But it was directly contributed to and created by a lot of these, these apes and these mutants who had, you know, founded their creative streak, created a backstory, really contributed to, to exactly what the arc or what the story or what kind of the next items in this universe were going to be. Um, and seeing the success of that has really taken us to the, to the level of, okay, this is something that we've done. There are tons of creative people in this universe, in this world, in the Web3 world, not. How do we continue to support all of these kind of initiatives that we think that we want to continue to do, but also we think that so many people um, can kind of use their, their, their creative juices to do so. And so we've, we've kind of channeled that into two things. One is Azurbala which is our own IP uh, universe that we're creating and storytelling um, through the technology that we're creating. And this technology we want to use to enhance this, this experience in Azurbala, right? To allow people to, to, to vote uh, on lore and kind of blur the line between fan fiction and kind of um, any sort of creator canon uh, and lore and really drive this community forward. And so, our, our hope is that we continue to do this uh, on our own, but also build these software tools in this platform that allow others in the community um, to see this same kind of shift within theirs. Uh, I think the fundamental part of it is, is for us, NFT like ownership has kind of changed the, the structure of ownership and relation between fans and creators. Um, and so like that's, that's a lot of what we're building on right now. I love that. Thank you. And so just in the interest of time, Summer, I want you to answer that, but I'm also going to kind of couple another question in there for you. Because so, you both run multi-million dollar NFT businesses. I'd like Summer for you to also answer, what is your secret to success? Even after you tell us a little bit more about what you're solving for. 
so Aku's a young uh, black kid with a space helmet. He's a digital character um, that we launched last February um, of 2021. So it was a little bit before a lot of the hype um, cycle that people caught. Um, and we launched him differently. So we launched him um, in a series of uh, episodic chapters. Um, so short animated uh, videos that um, that give you um, sense of Aku and start to tell some of his story. Um, he's running around in the real world with real clothes and just a space helmet. So when you see him, you immediately wonder what's going on with this kid. Why does he have so much confidence? He walks with a lot of swagger too. Um, and we've really stood him up to be what he naturally has been, which is a symbol for empowering people to dream without limitations. Um, he was created born out of uh, a very interesting question, um, hopefully many of you have heard by now, uh, that my partner uh, and the creator of Aku's nephew had asked if astronauts could be black. And Micah's immediate reaction was to go to his garage and start painting his nephew with a space helmet. Art Micah's a, an artist. Um, and quickly realized that, you know, art has some, uh, physical art has some limitations in how much reach it can get, but we were, but was seeing how um, people resonated and thought, how can we get this out to more people? Um, and so that's how he came to be a digital character um, launched, um, you know, through NFTs. Um, so for us from day one, it's been much more about Aku and what he can bring um, to people who frankly are like us. We both um, come from very different backgrounds where, um, we haven't necessarily Community followed is really huge for you. path um, where uh, we, we, we have dreamt outside of the box and we want to empower um, anyone to have a lot of confidence in what they, they dream for. Um, we um, may be known for a few things. Uh, we did uh, one of the first, if not the first, uh, big uh, physical installations. We took over 30,000 square feet um, of space over three days in Art Basel and just brought um, people together to learn tech, culture, um, crypto, art, music. Uh, we had physical art curated. Um, emerging Black artists had a private uh, event with Kehlani and AJ Mitchell performing Halik Mall, uh, but also had these activations where people could go into a larger than life helmet and uh, see some of Aku's world. Launched um, Akutars this February with brand partners. A big part of what we do is really try to stay in touch, stay. Um, stay relevant and meet people where they are. So we brought uh, people from our network. Pusha T was one of the first people to ever um, uh, talk about Aku outside of crypto, but we also brought in Puma, Billionaires Boys Club, Paper Planes, Upscale Vandal, Who Decides War, um, and have since uh, just built out all of those um, channels to help bring Aku um, expand his reach even outside of NFTs. So for us, these NFTs have always been, you know, one of uh, several um, ways that we want to get him out into the world. Um, and uh, Aku made the cover of Time Magazine in August, uh, which was a wonderful image to see on the cover of such an um, amazing um, uh, publication. Um, while we wait for, for uh, to get Le uh, Letta back, um, uh, I would say we have a long way to go. Um, so we've, you know, it's been, a, it's been, a, it's been a crazy couple of years. So um, blessed to have been in front of um, as many people as we have. There's been over $100 million in volume of sales and hockey, so there's been a lot of energy around who he is and, and a lot of support for where we could take him next. And the number one thing for us, I think, is just to always remember that everything we do is much bigger than us. Um, this was never about Micah or me. Uh, we have an incredible team. It's not about them. It's about all of us. When we, when we hit the cover of Time, uh, Push was actually in L.A., and um and you know immediately like this biggest grin on his face big hug and said we made time and that like that was the moment right it is we like we all you know, all of us all of this space everyone who comes across auction all the people that are yet to um that, that is, um, keep, keeping that humility and knowing that um you've just got to take it step by step ups or downs uh it's 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 more important than you i love that Thank you, Summer. Okay, so just to kind of switch it up a, a little bit, we're now gonna actually hear from Sandy Carter. Um, so Sandy Carter is a leading voice in technology, social media, Web3, Metaverse, who's been recognized as the top 10 most powerful women in tech for CNN. She's currently the Senior Vice President of Business Development and Channel Chief at Unstoppable Domains, 
And in this role, she's really responsible for driving new partnerships, integrations for Web3 uh, and in the metaverse. And her mission is to onboard and the world actually into a decentralized web by building blockchain based identity platforms. She was a general manager at IBM, a Silicon Valley startup founder, vice president, Amazon Web Services. Please welcome Sandy Carter. Okay, I am extremely excited to be here today. It's amazing what um, these two amazing women have accomplished. Let me just tell you a little bit about Unstoppable and what we're doing and why we believe that a commitment to education is so very important. Um, at Unstoppable, what we do is we really focus on a digital identity. Now, what is a digital identity? Digital identity is different in Web 2 than in Web 3. In Web 2, your identity is actually tagged to an application. You have a different ID for Google, for Pinterest, for Twitter. In the Web 3 world, though, those uh, that digital identity actually travels with you. So if you think about it, in Web 2, people started by getting an email address. In Web 3, we believe that you'll start by getting that Web 3 digital identity or a domain. And we do believe that that will be as ubiquitous as email was in Web 2. And here, that digital identity is something that you own and you control. You can do so much with that Web 3 digital identity. I wish I could show it to you because not only can you use it to pay or transact with in a human way using something like sandy.nft versus a long stream of letters and numbers that nobody really knows what they are. But in addition, you can use it in the metaverse to log in, to tag your avatar, use that as your avatar name. In gaming, you know, I love to game and I want that leaderboard not to say some crypto address, but my name, sandy.nft. So you can actually use it as your leaderboard name. You can also leverage it to do encrypted end-to-end -end email, which is so freaking cool. And you can build out that digital identity by linking all your social media accounts to that domain and put a picture, like I have a BFF picture and a fame lady picture that I set that profile for. I think it's pretty amazing that today I have about 20 use cases that you can do with that particular digital uh, domain. Now, that data stays with you. It's owned by you, which for me is so powerful, so incredibly powerful. I actually think it's not just something cool to do or even essential to do. I think owning that digital domain is actually a human right. Now, because we think this is so important and there's so many amazing use cases that you can do with it, if you did RSVP for crypto for the culture.io, we will send you a recording of the conference along with a link to register for that domain credit, which will then be used to get your unstoppable digital identity. Now, when you're doing that digital identity, make sure you think about, you know, using your name because that will stay with you. It will travel with you through the metaverse. So choose carefully as you look at that. They're also addicting because, you know, I also own um, Pink Lady, uh, which I'm always wearing pink. Today I'm wearing red, but Lady in Pink versus Lady in Red. So think carefully about how you want to be known. Again, it was such an honor to be here with, with um, two incredible founders who are changing the world. And that's what this is all about. Grab that digital identity. It is your human right to own your own data and own your own digital identity uh, and, and really enjoy the conference. Thank you. gold standard for women environment like i came back and we're planning a training and i'm like we have to add more hey Claire. hey there hi everyone how y'all hey, doing man. nice to meet you nice to meet you as well yes 
So Adrian, you met Courtney in Charlotte. Amina mm -hmm. works with Courtney. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm, I kind of put that together. I was like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> now I met Courtney. Now I met Amina. Y'all yeah. doing it over there at uh, Cash App. We're trying to, you know. I see you all. I see you. And making dreams come true. That's right. <laughs> so I am not uh, moderating this panel. You know, um, I'm going to be passing the baton to Clev. And before I do, I just want to set the stage. You know, many folks know who she is, uh, but I just wanted to give a little bit of um, context again around, you know, all of the accomplishments and what makes you, Clev, so uniquely qualified to, to moderate this powerful and timely discussion. So if I may, uh, you are the executive director of the Blockchain Foundation, an industry-wide crypto education platform. Another sister in education, love it, love to see it. You're also an advisor to the Blockchain Association. You are a Web3 expert, again, why you know we're bringing you to Crypto for the Culture. Uh, you've been profiled in ABC, NPR, Washington Post, Time Magazine. You're a Washington insider. You've previously served as an Obama presidential appointee and senior staffer in Congress. If that wasn't enough, you know I got it, you know I got it, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> the revolution. revolution. <laughs> I love it. I love also, it. Author of the Clevolution, my quest for justice in politics and crypto. I have my signed copy. Where is it at? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I paid her to do this. Not <laughs> you know. I need one now. I need a signed copy. You need a signed copy. I feel like I you know. Do. Out. Adrian, I might know somebody who knows somebody to get you that signed copy. Because we'll, we'll, we'll you know, I think I know who you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but truly, uh, before I leave the virtual stage, it is my honor and distinct pleasure to introduce my Haitian sister from another Mister, the legendary uh, Clev Mesador. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that introduction. Oh my God, Lisa is amazing. And before we begin our session, I just want to acknowledge how amazing Lisa and Nina are and commend the work that they've been doing with this conference and with this level of thought leadership. So on that note, I'm excited for all of you to hear from our very, very dynamic speakers as we talk about legislation and governance. So I'm going to just share a little bit about them, but they'll get an opportunity to actually talk a bit more. But today we will be hearing from Amina Ross, who is the head of policy at Cash App, mm -hmm. an ecosystem within Black. She is responsible for strategic policy decisions across Cash App at the local, state, federal, and global mm -hmm. level. Amina is also a managing director for federal government affairs at the Securities Industry Financial Markets Association, FEMA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and previously, like me, she served on the Hill. She served in the office of Congressman Al Green, who is a member of the House Financial Services Committee and mm -hmm. also chairman of the Financial Services Subcommittee and on Oversights and Investigations, where she served as Chief of Staff and also in previously as a Legislative Director. So it's always great to have women from the Hill, women of color from the Hill, join the crypto revolution. Yes. <laughs> yes. But it's also nice to have some brothers as well. So sure. Adrian, <laughs> Adrian Hill is he is at Foundry, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite companies. Adrian is the director of economic and community development. He joined them last December, but has been doing amazing things. Adrian is a proud son and champion of Rochester, New York, for those of you who are out there. That's right. <laughs> he previously created and oversaw the Office of Workforce Development, regional Title Strategy and Education Initiatives at the Greater Rochester Chamber of Commerce. On that note, you know, I, I want the audience to understand that there are lots of access points in crypto and there are lots of different players, but today you're going to be hearing from two 
industry leaders who are executives at top companies in the crypto realm, right? So they have that u- unique perspective, right, working in these companies. So I want to kick off by having them share what they do at their companies and their role. So w- ladies first, Amina, tell us a bit about, you know, what you do at, at Cash App and the intersection of cryptocurrency. Yeah. So thanks, Clef. Um, I want to thank Crypto Tutors for putting together this fantastic conference and for making it accessible to everyone, which is right in line with Cash App's core mission, which is to redefine people's relationship with money by making it more relatable, instantly available, and universally accessible. So as head of policy for Cash App, what do I do? I'm responsible for the local, state, federal, and international policy development and strategic priorities for the platform. Um, And I also wanted to uh, acknowledge Clev and all of the amazing work that you've done over the years to make this space so much more accessible to everyone so that they can be a part of the movement as well. So kudos to you. Um, Cash App is an easy way for people to store, send, receive, spend, and invest money. Our platform provides a variety of personal finance tools from peer-to-peer payments, investing in the traditional stock market, But more specifically for this conversation, we also provide our customers with a way to buy, sell, transfer, and even gift Bitcoin. We've also allowed our customers um, the ability to use uh, an overlay uh, to the Bitcoin network called Lightning, and that started earlier this year. So at Cash, we see Bitcoin as an instrument of economic empowerment, providing a way for anyone to participate in a global monetary system through more efficient, cost-effective remittances to financial tools and creating opportunity to build wealth, which I know is a big passion for you, Clev. It is a global, decentralized, deflationary, and secure method of payment. And Block is investing in technologies that lower the barriers to entry, reduce the cost, and improve the utility of Bitcoin. And we prioritize these investments because we believe Bitcoin is for everyone. All you need is an internet connection to engage with it, no matter who you are, where you live what you look like, your financial institution or situation, or your credit history. So with a borderless internet-enabled monetary system, financial information can move quickly with low costs and be open to all. So that's that's kind of ethos at cash, but I'll turn it back to you, Clef. Oh my God, you have an amazing... Um, right. Amazing, amazing job. <laughs> right. And you know, I'm I love that they've integrating the integrated the Lightning Network, which is amazing. But one of my favorite things to tell people about Cash App is COVID. During COVID, you remember all the stimulus checks people got? There were articles upon them articles about how many people direct deposit those stimulus checks right into their Cash App Bitcoin accounts. So mm-hmm. amazing. <laughs> Well, you know, Adrian, you have an interesting story. Rochester is really positioned interestingly in the work that Foundry is doing. And, oh, my God, this apprenticeship program that you guys have is amazing. So tell us a bit more about what you're doing and some of the things that you've been able to affect in in terms of change at Foundry. Yeah. Yeah, so first off, I want to just piggyback on what Amina said, and I want to shout you out, Clev as one of the original OGs for people of color in this space. Because if it wasn't for pioneers like you, we would not be in the roles that we're in doing the work that we're doing. So thank you so much. I was super excited to leave my role at the Chamber of Commerce overseeing our economic workforce and education office when Mike Collier, the CEO of Foundry, came over to the CEO of the Chamber, a man named Bob Duffy, for a meeting. He was our Lieutenant Governor in New York State, and then he was the Mayor and Police Chief of Rochester. But he's been a mentor of mine since I was about 23, 24 years old. So I was there most of my career. 
Mike came over and said that Foundry was seeing exponential growth. They went from three employees to 180. And he said, we need to figure out a way to connect what we're doing to some of the challenges in Rochester. So I'm like, uh, I hear you. I'm not sold on Bitcoin. I'm not really sold on this man, right? So a couple meetings into it, I see his sincerity and his commitment to it. And so I left to come over here and oversee the economic and community development portfolio for Foundry. The first program I launched was called the Mining Engineer Fellowship. And for you, I'm over here, y'all. Let me see y'all. I got the fellows in here right now, so they're listening. Teresa in there, right? So the Mining Engineer Fellowship launched, and what we did was take young adults in Rochester who graduated from our city school district and plug them into Foundry. And what that ended up becoming was a business line called Foundry Deploy. So earlier, right before the Cash App commercial, if you saw the Foundry Deploy fact sheet, that is now a business service that the Mining Engineer Fellows run, and they're going to take it over at some point once they upskill their way to do so. But they're leading that whole effort. And what that is, is for, if you don't know what Foundry is, we are the infrastructure arm of the digital currency group, right? So you probably know Grayscale, Genesis, Coinbase, HQ, uh, Trade Block, all the other stuff. But for them, we are the infrastructure arm. So all the proof of work mining, we support about 10 different proof of stake protocols. Foundry Deploy is a huge part of that effort, right? It's getting, getting miners to actual miners or machines to miners and then getting them up and running and making sure operations are taking place. So aside from that, now we're also working with our local school district on a blockchain 001. And I say that because blockchain 101 oftentimes is way over folks' head. So right now, myself, one of the other OGs in this space, uh, Josh Bynum on our team and a, a curriculum writer from the school district are putting together a curriculum that hopefully will allow young people not just to take it and get exposed, but they can use it for graduation credit. OK, so they'll actually get credit to graduate. And then last but not least, and I know, Claire, we talked a little bit about use cases. So a local non for profit. So let me step back. Context. There's a huge effort right now called systems integration, which takes government agencies, workforce preparation, and workforce training organizations, nonprofits, um, and other civic institutions who all have data of priority population folks and say, how do we give them sovereignty over their data so that they can control it? And so a nonprofit reached out and said, hey, we heard about blockchain. We know you guys are in town. Systems integration is going on. They're going to start transferring data between all these different institutions. How do we give these families sovereignty to make sure that they own their data and maybe even tokenize or economize it? And so now we're collaborating. So this, this is early, but we're collaborating with a nonprofit to see if we can get folks to own their data, select the blockchain that makes the most sense, maybe create a token like Claire was telling me about Oakcoin at the the last event we were at, right? But maybe a rock coin, right? <laughs> Where every time folks' data is transferred, that they can have ownership. And that's conversations, everything from actual hardware. Is it a watch? Like, how is it going to be stored and housed? What blockchain makes the most sense? What's the most secure? So a bunch of different things in our portfolio right now to see how can we apply these technologies, this blockchain technology to solve some of our greatest socioeconomic challenges. And I'll close with this. Just so you know, Amina, right? Rochester is the third poorest city in the United States of America. Childhood poverty, we are number two. So one out of every Hispanic and Latino young person in our city is born into poverty. We are fifth in homicides. We lead in males of color dropping out and having single female head of households, right? So we're one of those communities. So it's really important that an organization like Foundry do as much as it can to not just do its part, if you will, but also find ways that work so we can scale them and share best practices. And so that's pretty much what I'm trying to lead up here at Foundry. Amazing, amazing, amazing. When I say amazing, I, <laughs> you know, I, I love Foundry, but I also love mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, we know Black and Latino communities lead national adoption of cryptocurrency. And we know as we build a decentralized economy, a decentralized industry, we have to lead with inclusion in mind. And that's exactly what Foundry is doing, right? And that's what we, exactly what we've seen with Black and some of their initiatives. 
So yeah, that is a great level set for this conversation. Now, we're talking about legislation and governance, right? Mm -hmm. Why that matters for, the, for exactly what you both described is because right now, because of decentralization, ownership is possible. We're seeing you know, adoption, the nerve center of adoption in communities of color but we know that there are policy implications that might affect that, right? And for the first time, communities of color are leading, but the policy considerations are having a direct impact on those early entrepreneurs. So just to level set really quickly, for those of you, you know, tuning in virtually, crypto is regulated, right? Don't sit there being scared, right? It's regulated at the federal level, at the state level, right? And, and you'll hear about some of the federal and state issues. If you, the IRS looks at cryptocurrencies as a property, there's a, there's a question on the IRS form. The CFTC looks at it as a commodity. The SEC looks at cryptos as securities, right? So, so that is the lens that the federal government is coming from. The White House the order on cryptocurrency, the Federal Reserve is looking at a central bank digital currency. So I think people need to understand that the issue is not whether or not crypto is regulated or should be regulated. It is more about how do we get regulatory clarity because we don't have a regulatory framework that fits for crypto, right? Yeah. Crypto is not traditional banks because we know there's regulations that that are for traditional banking. The 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 the, the Wall Street and the financial markets, when you look at derivatives, there are policies that govern those markets and those areas. But let's face it, you know, financial services is regulated by 1930s policies. Yeah. We didn't have the word, you know, we didn't understand crypto as we define it today now, 20 years ago, let alone since the 1930s. So for those of you at issue is, what is the regulatory framework, right? What are the policies? Who leads at the regulatory agencies? Where, what is Congress's role, right? And then at the state level, we're having similar conversations, right? States are figuring out, should they create regulatory sandbags? Do they need safe havens so that entrepreneurs can innovate within their states? So to, for people to understand that at issue is, can innovation thrive here in the U.S., right? Can entrepreneurs, creators, micro-enterprises really continue to build here? So those are the, that's the lens we're looking at this in terms of legislation and governance. So my first question for, you know, both of our speakers is to really understand, right, what are the most pressing policy issues that your company is facing at the federal and state level. And I know, Adrian, you're gonna be coming at this from the state level, which is really complex. And I know, Mina, you know, the federal level, you, your company is leading there. So why don't we start with you, Amina, and then we'll go into the state. Yeah, so I think the most pressing policy issue for us is one that you just defined, Clev. It's the idea that we need to define guardrails for the space that both protect consumers and also protects innovation, right? And I think a common concern that I run into when I speak to regulators and policymakers is that they need to protect consumers from any and all activity in the space, which I personally personally believe is incredibly paternalistic and is often rooted in an idea that only rich people have the ability to discern what is a good investment and what is not. And that kind of goes back to what you were saying about uh, a space that has been regulated by antiquated regulation for quite some time. And so at Cash, you know, we offer Bitcoin on our platform you can buy it, you can sell it, you can transfer it, you can gift it. Um, but we don't offer any other coins on our platform because we want to give people a space where they can explore responsibly and not feel uh, that they have to have uh, in-depth knowledge like what you have of, of the space to buy their first um, Satoshis or their first small $5 value of Bitcoin. And so um, 
it creates an, a, an environment where people can share, people can explore, and we can even, you know, uh, make this like a family and community environment to build and grow. So that's what we're trying to kind of protect at cash. Uh, and it's something that we run into obstacles um, on a regular basis, both at the federal and state level. Yeah, no, well said, Amina, because consumer protection doesn't, it should, but it doesn't include empowerment, right? It doesn't equ equal to empowerment. And right now we need empowerment, right? I, I, you know, I think for, for regulators, they would love for people who've been locked out to be able to finally buy a car, but keep it in your garage, never drive it because you might die, <laughs> right? And <laughs> And so we need to move away from just patri patriarchy, which is protection, and move towards empowerment. And I love what you said about, you know, the experience at, you know, Cash App and Black and being able just to buy Bitcoin and being able to buy just $10 of Bitcoin. It is that entry point that is so important to people. Right? So let's, let's talk a bit about Foundry, right? Adrian, right? The, uh, New York State is just hostile towards crypto, but it is the backyard of wall street let's not pretend mm -hmm. wall street doesn't act like this is our turf <laughs> right backyard in the front yard <laughs> Dude. yes so but you know new york state has to make a decision just like the u.s has to realize does it want innovation to re re lead here new york state has to decide do does the state want to continue to be a financial center and allow mm -hmm. people to build here so tell us what's going on there yeah, so first off, I'm going to shout out um, my tag team partner, Kyle Schnapps, who leads our uh, public policy and advocacy work here at Foundry. Um, but our role has really been to try to get policymakers in New York State to see us as a part of the economic development strategy, as you know, the goal of Foundry is to become a center of blockchain excellence and house that here in Western New York with both Buffalo and Rochester being the primary hubs of the work that we're trying to do. We have a presence in both spaces. I'll say that there's a strong environmentalist presence here. I mean, if you've never been to upstate New York, it is absolutely beautiful. Even more so, Rochester is the center of the Finger Lakes region, which at times can give you views of the French Alps. You look like you're in Europe somewhere. Like, it's just stunning. But I think misinformation and FUD, you know, yeah. Just fear, uncertainty, doubt has really launched a crusade where our industry is being treated very differently than other industries, um, predominantly around our inner sea uses. So I'm talking about proof of work, right? So there was a huge mining operation up here in upstate New York um, at a facility that we are, um, you know, in relationship with. And I think our government tried to split the baby in the bathwater here by saying, if I use a regulatory body to shut down that, that uh, operation, then I won't have to sign legislation that said that there can't be crypto mining at a power plant in New York state for at least two years, right? Well, we all know that sends messages to the industry to say that this isn't a place to invest, to try to set up operations. And the thing is, the, the government narrowly tailored the law, so it was obvious that it was more about looking like it's doing more than it did, right? Because the headline would be Bitcoin mining, crypto mining ban in New York State. It wouldn't be only for power plants that aren't grandfathered in, right? It, it would be a different headline, which would obviously send a message that New York doesn't want to send. Recently, myself and a delegation of our organization went to some remarks that the governor gave, she was hosted by my previous place of work, the Chamber of Commerce. And the governor tried to differentiate crypto, which she also talked about as a New York City presence and how it was thriving, and crypto mining. She didn't mention Foundry or DCG. So we took that as shade, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but she sounded very supportive of crypto and not so much supportive of crypto mining. And what my fear is, in the absence of knowledge and information, I can hear, you know, egregious recommendations like, why doesn't Bitcoin just go to proof of stake? We know that proof of work and proof of stake are very different consensus mechanisms. They play very important roles 
However, when it comes to the crypto space, um, Bitcoin, the, the most common and most accessible form of crypto is mined. Okay. So the idea that New York State doesn't want to send a positive message to the industry, even more so that it wants to treat us differently, trying to regulate our access to energy, which, you know, there's no precedent for that, right? Like how can the government tell a particular industry that it can't have access to energy, number one. And number two, for a company like Foundry, which has expanded exponentially over the past three years, we are not eligible for economic development agency grants. We're not eligible for capital investment grants from the state. Our workforce efforts are not eligible for WIOA dollars or any other workforce development dollars. So it's also getting our, our industry treated like any other one, right? Treating jobs in mining or tech uh, or our staking team or our networking team like you would treat anybody else. I can tell you the mining engineers that you just got to see, right? These are middle skilled workers. They are electricians, warehousers. They're proficient on different types of equipment, right? These are real middle skilled jobs. And oh, by the way, they're gainfully employed. So if you think about just the upskilling, right, of a program like this and the jobs that it can really promise and how accessible it is, it's important that the state takes that into consideration before it tries to send out a message to a special interest group that might not be thinking about a holistic you know, strategy for the state. And I'll, I'll just close with this. For me, one of the things I'm most excited about, you know all the data, right? African-Americans and Hispanics are most optimistic about crypto. We hold it more than our white counterparts for many different reasons. But it's really important that we recognize that because we are a part of the proliferation of this industry from its genesis, we can infuse diversity, equity, and inclusion. We can infuse the need for a more inclusive financial system from the beginning and then not have to do the catch-up work later like we're watching the entire world of work do and financial systems do, right? Where now they have to try to undo the damage that was inherently intrinsically baked in the way they did business. Right. So it's so important why folks like us really understand that responsibility and do what we can at this time as our industry is just forming. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Oh my God, Adrian. You are absolutely right. This is a workforce issue, right? What crypto presents is an opportunity to train and prepare people for the jobs of the future. And people like to say that, you know, we technology and innovation doesn't solve problems, but neither has a hundred years of financial right. services policies. That's right. It has not closed the financial exclusion gap, That's right? right. I tell people when you look at inequities, don't just follow the money, follow the policies, right. right? So we have to hold these people accountable to make sure that their policies will not make it harder for diverse innovators in the future. I, I know we have to close. I want to give these dynamics. Oh, not this we just, we just, oh, we just got started. We got started. I, I agree. You should see the, the chat. It is blowing up. So I, I know you all, you know, folks would be following you both, but I do want to give you both an opportunity to close out. Obviously, as we're talking about these, these policy implications, you know, there are, there are policy implications, not just for innovation, but for entrepreneurs, right? So right. we can no longer build in isolation as entrepreneurs. We have to be cognizant of what's happening at our city, at our state, even at our federal level. So, you know, Amina, let's go ladies first and we'll close out with you, Adrian. Do you want to close us out, Amina? Oh, okay. Um, so, yes, I, I think one of the things that you said is so important to this conversation, especially with elections uh, coming up next week, mm -hmm. is that we have to be very vocal as a community of folks that are interested in cryptocurrency with our policymakers, with government officials, about why it's important to have regulation that protects consumers, but also protects innovation and allows for everyone to access this space. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that you focused on was, uh, you know, the laws that have governed 
the financial system. And one of those is the accredited investor definition. And that has uh, gatekept people of color and, and middle income and low income people from being a part of the capital formation process for 100 years. And we don't need that type of regulation in the cryptocurrency space. So we have to be vocal. We have to let our policymakers know we are interested in this space and we expect that you allow for that balance of innovation and consumer protection. Mm -hmm. Very, very well said, Amina. Um, I love the way you put it, right? That you have to protect consumers, but you also have to ensure that you protect innovation, which is what our big fight here in New York State has been. I'll only close with, I am extremely optimistic about this space. Mm -hmm. I love that we have crusaders like you, Clev, on the front line, constantly talking about use cases that is partly crypto, but it's also that this blockchain technology has a number of things it could potentially do. And we have to take those who've been affected by the problems, put these instruments in their hands and say, what is it that you can do with this? Which is mm -hmm. another thing that we're doing here at Foundry. Um, I'm excited about the future of our industry. I only hope that lawmakers and policymakers recognize that it's not about trying to fit us in the box, right? Is it a stock? Is it a bond? Is it a commodity? Is it, right? That this is a future focused industry where these are entirely new products altogether with brand new uses and that it's okay to form and shape laws and legislation around them uniquely. I also think at some point our industry is going to have to you know, because there's so many tech strong folks who feel like their, their, their faith is marrow deep in the technology so much they think they can ignore the government. And the government can maybe not ban us, but they can make it uncompetitive for people to use yeah. Bitcoin or any other state coin against some government CBDC, right? Which is what I think we're going to run into at some point, right? They will try to legislate us out of competition which obviously will take away the, the democratizing and the decentralization of these networks. So it's very important too that our, our industry recognizes that we will more than not have to raise up champions who we don't have to persuade, right? They know the space, they know the issues and they can take the work that Clev has been doing and or Clev yourself, right? <laughs> Lead this charge in the halls of decision-making because I think at some point we will have to do that. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, Adrian. The industry is gonna have to change, but you know what? The, the the speakers on the panel with me, as well as those of you watching virtually, we have to look at running for office. We need new mm -hmm. new talent. We need new folks. So as we're innovating, as we're looking at a new future, we have to think. Well, you know what? Maybe mm -hmm. I should run for city council. Maybe I should run for mayor, right? Because as entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. as the next generation of the innovation, as the next generation of the innovation economy, we can't mm -hmm. we can afford to be left behind. Mm -hmm. So thank you both. I'm so excited. Thank so you. proud of the work that each of you are leading. So proud of the legacy we're seeing evolve. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, Adrian, the folks behind you, so excited about them. Mm -hmm. They will actually commercialize the space. And Amina, oh my God, the folks that Cash App is training and investing in, right? They are the future. So what we're doing right now is putting in the rules of the game. So thank you, mm -hmm. Nina thank and you. Lisa. Thank you, Crypto Tutors. Thank you for this opportunity. It was a pleasure. Welcome to Crypto Tutors. Crypto Tutors, Crypto Tutors, Crypto Tutors, hey. It's a way. Making money in my sleep? Making money in my sleep. Step by step, click by click. Waves, Bitcoin, stable coin, we got the tips. Bitcoin or BTC, a trillion dollar CAP, don't sleep on crypto. Take it, you made it. No more to FOMO to the moon we go. No more to 
All right, all right, all right. That was incredible. That was incredible. I uh, don't know if you two were able to tune into the uh, previous panel on crypto governance and legislation, but um, I just wanted to acknowledge our speakers, Amina from Cash App, Adrian from Foundry, and the living legend that is Clev Messador. Um, and, you know, as we wrap up that panel, just really quickly, Sunil, um, I just want to say that it remains unclear whether it remains unclear when Congress might pass crypto regu. Hold on, let me get, gather my thoughts because I want to make sure that I'm articulating this correctly. So it remains unclear when Congress might pass crypto related legislation. But one thing is for certain legislation is not a matter of if it's a matter of when. And it's important for each of us to exercise our civic rights, uh, challenging our representatives to educate themselves, um, you know, to craft thoughtful legislation, and we ourselves to consider running for office so that we can participate in the crafting of this legislation. So just wanted to tie that up with a nice little bow. I am super duper excited to welcome you two to... Crypto for the Culture, DeFi, where we are defying all odds. This is a very important panel, a very important conversation related to overcoming the crypto culture. Uh, but before we start this panel, let's define for folks that may not be familiar with this terminology, what do we mean when we say crypto winter? Well, this is a term that we use in the industry for a long downturn in cryptocurrency prices. Um, you know, this is not unique. We're having an economic downturn, you know, across the board, tech and so forth. Now, our friends at NerdWallet report the total value or market cap of the largest 100 cryptocurrencies in July of this year was $1 trillion. That's a 62%, 62% drop from the market cap of last November when we had nearly $3 trillion dollars across the cryptocurrency market. So this is an investment advice, but a few good rules of thumb for folks is one, never invest what you can't afford to lose. Two, it's important to diversify. When you spread your wealth around, you're less likely to suffer a major financial blow if one of your investments doesn't pan out. So we just wanna make sure that folks are able to walk away with actionable takeaways. But you know what though? That's why we have YouTube. In our next panel, we've got experts from Upland.me, the largest Web3 metaverse mapped to the real world, and Abra, a crypto borrowing and lending platform. And you both will be discussing on-chain tactics to, for us to potentially add to our arsenal in order to overcome the crypto winter. Danny Brown Wolf is the chief of staff of Upland.me. Danny, I have to, I've been doing this for all of our um, you know, illustrious panelists. So I've got to, for you and Sunil, just do you both justice and give folks a little bit about your background. Is that all right? Is that all right? Excellent. Go for it. Cool. So Danny, you are the chief of staff for Upland.me and, you know, you lead strategic initiatives. You've been in Web3 since 2017. You formerly uh, were the head of partnerships at Orbs, a blockchain infrastructure L2 and L3 solution. You served in the leadership of the Hexa Foundation, a nonprofit leveraging blockchain tech for social impact initiatives. Your background is in policy and international affairs. You've worked with the United Nations. Um, and I just want to give you a warm, for the culture, welcome to the virtual stage. And thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. A hundred thousand percent. We couldn't do it without you. All right. So before we dive in, Sunil Daluvi. Did I pronounce it correctly? Daluvoy? Daluvoy, you got it. All right. Daluvoy is currently head of global partnerships at Abra, a borrowing and lending app. 
Sunil, you were previously the director of BD or business development at Uber. You may or may not have heard of it, everybody who's listening. <laughs> and you were responsible for partnerships for Uber Eats and Uber Rush. You spent six years at Google's business development team where you work closely with the engineering teams as well to launch products, including uh, Google Fiber, Google Voice, Wallet, Google Wi-Fi. But before entering tech, you worked in the federal government as a policy attorney at the FCC, charged with advancing broadband networks. Thank yep. you. Yeah, you got it right. Listen, it's really important for folks that may or may not be familiar with you to understand the uh, orders of magnitude associated with your experience. You know, it's really important at Crypto Tutors. You know, we focus on education. We think that's a big barrier to entry for many people, especially for underrepresented communities. So when we bring on, you know, subject matter experts, we need the folks that are tuning in to understand what makes them that. So thank you to the both of you for taking uh, the time to talk about what it means to overcome the crypto winter. So my first question is for you, Danny. What is Upland? Um, people are probably like, okay, huh, huh? But what is Upland, and can you give us the inside scoop on your unique value prop? Sure. So Upland is a Web3 metaverse mapped to the real world. We sell virtual real estate, so think about virtual monopoly, but with true ownership. So it's, it's mapped with real parcels from the real world. We open it city by city, depends on uh, the supply and demand of the, of the community to make sure that it's not inflated. So a first city we opened was San Francisco. So you can buy an actual parcel in San Francisco in the Upland metaverse. And that's just the, that's just the beginning. Now the question is, how do you develop your property, your presence and your community in Web3 through a metaverse experience? And when people usually think about metaverse, um, they think about the Zuckerverse. So maybe they think about, you know, VR headset um, or the, the Facebook meta version of what the metaverse should be. We look at, uh, first of all, the immersion doesn't have to be VR. It can be a social and economic immersion. And we believe that's the way to start to build a metaverse before jumping into technology that uh, just isn't available on mobile. And that's where the, that's where the people are. That's where the mass market is. And the, the idea here is that you don't just invest in an asset. You don't just invest in your, um, you, you buy a plot of uh, virtual real estate and you speculate and you're waiting for a few years for winter to pass the next hype to come and uh, maybe it will be worth more. The idea is just like in real life, you'll buy a house, you'll maybe you'll you'll decorate it, you'll uh, furnish it better, you'll make a, you'll you you work in your neighborhood and the community aspect of that neighborhood actually increases the value of your real estate. The same is true for Upland. So people develop their their property their properties. They can build structures. They build shops where they sell NFTs, where they create N NFTs um, in showrooms that they, that they show them off. And they create, most importantly, communities. So we have, uh, whether it's expat communities, so we have our Brazilian player communities take over Queens, uh, a neighborhood in Queens and decide this is little Brazil inside of Upland and they build their structures and they have the elect a mayor and they have their own governance structure. We give them the tools and the people just have organic initiatives that are pretty amazing. That's awesome. And I love that there's just such a strong community component to it, which is so like intertwined in like the whole crypto ethos. Um, we're going to definitely dive deeper into just what the Upland experience is like and, you know, how to build equity, right, in, in these properties, because these are actual assets. But before we do that, I want to uh, pass the mic the virtual mic to Sunil. So tell us a little bit about, you know, Abra. What is Abra? And and same for you, what is the unique value proposition that Abra is offering? Before I dive in, I just want to thank you, Lisa and Nina in the Crypto Tutors community for welcoming me to speak here today. Um, it's quite an honor. And uh, I think what you guys are doing is remarkable and very well needed for the industry. Uh, so Abra, Abra is a modern crypto financial bank 
We're trying to promote financial independence and well-being for anyone and anywhere, basically. That's kind of the mission statement. It's broad. And how we hope to accomplish that is to be first fully regulated, globally licensed, and to enable digital asset ecosystems like the one Danny's building. So enable people to easily participate in the NFT ecosystem. And currently, we have a few products that are available. We have a crypto trading platform. We have a borrow platform and a lending service that allow people to. These are similar to what we have today in your traditional bank. But in the back end, it's all crypto infrastructure. It's all crypto rails, so to speak, to make this happen. So the terms, rates, and conditions that we are able to offer can't be matched by the, the, the typical bank. That being said, we're not trying to replace your checking account or savings account. We're trying to be supplementary to it. And to, like what you guys are trying to do here, uh, even though I can't wrap that terminology like you did, Lisa, but what we're trying to accomplish here is make the, to demystify this access to capital, which we call crypto, right? As long as we're going to preserve this distinction between labor and capital in, in this country, the question is, how do we keep more people into capital? And crypto is one of the really interesting ways to get more people interested in capital. NFT is an interesting way of doing that as well. What Danny's trying to do is also an interesting way of doing that. He's, he's really making real what it is to participate in capital rather than watching CNBC. And so it's really making real for all your constituents, all your members, something they care about, whether it be the home they want to purchase, they grew up in, like in Danny's case, or a memorabilia, or maybe it's even a board ape, whatever it may be. These are capital asset instruments that also appreciate in value. And what we're trying to do here in Abra is make it easy for people to buy these assets, store these assets, trade them. So we want to be the bank that powers the ecosystem to enable all this to happen. That's a very, um, that's a very ambitious uh, aspiration, and it's an exciting one. And to be candid, just to kind of help people understand, you know, what your what the capabilities at um, Abra, you know, enable. I had an experience not too long ago where, you know, one of the crypto tutors on our team, a gentleman by the name of Sean Gill, you know, he walked me through um, the process of, you know, depositing my um, ETH on a platform. And then with that, I was able to convert a portion of it to a stable coin, USDC. And then I was able to convert that USDC to fiat, you know, US dollars, and then transfer those dollars to my bank account. Once the funds were available in my bank account, I was able to pay off a balance, a credit card balance. It's about $5,000, you know, like paying off that balance, uh, eliminating those high, you know, high interest rates th that are compounded. And, you know, having this like $5,000 debt eliminated that in and of itself really proved to me that the power of decentralized finance is really revolutionary. You know, like that's an example of how in the real world too, we're able to leverage these tools to create positive changes in our lives. So I wanted to dive in a little bit deeper. You know, Danny, you, um, you know, the concept of Buying real estate, you know, we, we tend to associate that with, um, you know, real estate is an asset, right? That's like one of those when we talking earlier about like diversifying our portfolios. Tell us a little bit about how in Upland are folks able to, to build their own economies? How can how can Upland kind of facilitate that? Sure. So other than the real estate economy, we also create that that has been stable since we launched in 2020. We also launch different mechanisms and we see how both the community and partnerships allow for additional economies to grow around that. So cars is a great example. In Upland, trying to mimic the real world, you can't be teleported from one place to another. You actually have to travel either with your game piece or with, let's say, uh, an actual like airplane flight uh, within the Upland game. It's part of the, it's part of the game mechanics. And a couple of months ago, we introduced cars into the Upland metaverse. So you'd initially think in the in NFT marketplaces, okay, NFT, an artist created an NFT of a really cool car. I'm going to own it because it's cool art. Maybe I, it's a maybe it's a cool background. In the Upland metaverse, there's actually utility to that car, which means I can travel around with it. Um, eventually I'll be able to drive other people around and have virtual Uber inside Upland. 
and uh, and have 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 other players pay me fees to get me from one place to another. And we also we also opened up racing. So Upland opened up the possibility for racing, and we saw how the community took those tools and those mechanics and just went wild with it. So now they have created their own uh, user generated uh, league for racing there they have every neighborhood Danny, when you say racing what what type of racing are we talking about so think about if upland is if upland is the base layer of the world you can think about it some people describe it as a layer one metaverse um even uh ios app store type of type of scenario where you ha where you have the the basic you know the the economy the payments the ability to mint nfts um, and and the liquidity the liquidity and the players, and then that serves as a gateway to additional experiences in layer two that can be games, can be businesses, can be experiences. So one of those experiences is racing. So they take the NFT from Upland and they 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 actually race with it in a layer two game that either professional game developers just connect to Upland. Or in this case, our community actually developed from scratch the the game and the entire uh, ecosystem around it for racing. So now you have all the neighborhoods submitting for racetracks to be in their neighborhoods. They started creating NFTs to decorate those racetracks and deck them out. And all of and by enabling this one feature, an entire economy in the metaverse grew around it. That's incredible. And, you know, I definitely love how there's, you know, the word unlocking is so powerful. You know, like as I'm listening to you, you, you're, you're, both of you really are talking about unlocking access. And, you know, Sunil, I, I would love to learn a little bit more about, you know, the work that you all are doing, right? How are, or what are some of the maybe practical uses? I have the example of like, paying off a credit card balance, what have you. But what are some of the practical use cases that you can share with folks just to help them understand how Abra can help with solving real world problems? Yeah, absolutely. It's basically being providing access to capital at the time you need it, when you need it. You know, it's like whether you buy a car, pay off student loan debt, buy a home. Uh, if by participating in this crypto in universe, you're able to acquire capital and then to access capital as well. And that borrow experience you, you, you offered is pretty powerful in and of itself, right? So if, if you, you know, if you didn't have like an Abro or a company like ours, you'd have to sell your ETH, you pay a tax on it, and then you pay off your credit card. Here in this case, you didn't have to do any of that because you don't pay taxes on, on a borrowing product, you're on a loan, and you get to preserve the long-term capital of that potential value of ETH. And you got terms, rates, and conditions you wouldn't have got otherwise. So I use that $10,000 example. If you have $10,000 um, and you wanted to borrow against that to your bank, they wouldn't even give you that option. But they will give you they will give you a option. They'll give you their credit card as a way to do it, right? That's how they do it. That's how the game is. It's not worth the transaction cost for them to do it. But if you have $10,000 in Abro, you could borrow that $5,000 at a 7 or 8% interest rate, not 20 25%. You could decide the payback period, whether it be six months or three years. And you... Uh, and you get the money within a few minutes in your Abra account, maybe take a day to get to your bank account. And there's no credit check. We're not, you know, we're not, we don't need that because we have custody of your crypto. We know it. So and then if the value of the crypto goes below, we work with you to, to margin calls. So we're not trying to, you know, be a usury about it. But the, again, these are things that you can't even get in the traditional thing. It's not because they're evil or they're nefarious. They just don't have the financial incentive or the ability to offer it. This is the arbitrage moment that we have. They will maybe, hopefully, if not, then we'll still be around, hopefully, to provide these types of services. So that's like one great example of how you can access capital in a way that um, you could do it. And also, by the way, you could that $10,000 example, you could borrow 15% loan to value, which is $1,500 at a zero APR. We're, it's basically a personal line of credit. And you can just roll it over. And you wonder how we could do that? Because we have a lending book that takes your crypto and rehypothecate it to other borrowers on a short-term basis. That's the real secret. How We're not doing any magic here or going to Vegas. It's pretty much like we're doing what traditional banks do, but we're doing it in an asset class that only we understand, at least for now. So that's the really arbitrage moment we're doing. And this isn't even that different what traditional banks do, but the difference is you need $100 million. 
If you go to Wells Fargo or Citibank with 100 million bucks, well, what they'll do, they'll give you a personal line of credit, one or two million bucks at least, just to keep your money in their bank. We're offering those types of services to any bank account level. And that's the power of this thing. So people often talk a big game about de democratizing access to technology and finance. We're building it. You can sign up right now and have everyone doing it. You can do it right now and today. So that's what really gets me excited. The other products we have is also an interest earning product between your ETH and other crypto coins you could do. And uh, we also are going to be launching soon, which is going to be right in Danny's wheelhouse, an NFT product. We're not, it's not an NFT mint or an asset. It's enabling people with our wallet to easily purchase NFTs without going through the complexity of a DeFi wallet funding process and MetaMask and all the other complexities that are involved. It's reducing number of steps from 20 to like two or three. And again, broadening the ecosystem, people could participate in NFTs uh, or whatever it may be. You know? So that's the kind of stuff we're trying to do. Is we're trying to like, what I think the common goal between crypto tutors and what we're trying to do here at Abra is to make this accessible to a broader range of people and demystify the terminology and the acronyms that often plague the industry that scare people away. Exactly right. And um, I'm grateful that we were all able to connect because these are the types of conversations that will prove to people that, you know, one, this isn't a fad. This isn't something that is going to like disappear overnight. Like we're in the midst of a shift and the more understanding, the more knowledge that we have, but also, and I said this in the beginning, I'm like, you know, knowledge is just, it's, it's just potential and until the actions, you know, taken against it, you won't get results. So speaking of results, how do people get started? You know, where do I begin if I want to participate in Upland? I want to um, open up an Abra account. Walk us through that process. Danny, you want to go first? <laughs> Sure. We made it really simple. Uh, we've developed uh, for a long time proprietary technology that also obfuscates a lot of the crypto nuances, uh, the wallet, the seed phrase. There's still complete ownership of the assets that we don't have access to. It's not custodial, but the sign in process looks like a web two app and is very intuitive. So you go to Upland, you go to uplandme.me you create an account and you start roaming around for your first property or you we have some in detroit uh, in detroit one of the benefits of upland as opposed to other web3 metaverses is that it's very tiered so you can buy a four dollar property and a forty thousand dollar rockefeller center in in uh <laughs> in manhattan right but there's something for everyone and it provides access for uh, for everyone. So that's how you get started. So basically, upland.me, <laughs> number one. <laughs> yep. Start roaming. Start roaming around. Start looking at the the actually. The, today's a good day to go because the Halloween decorations are still up. So a lot of our users actually created and bought skins for their houses that are Halloween themed and they did a competition between the neighborhoods and which one is more decked out for Halloween. That also goes to show you how active users are on a platform, you know, like Halloween was yesterday. Oh, by the way, too, this is, or two days ago, um, I can't keep track of time. This is crypto literacy month. So thank you also for helping us kick off, kick off crypto literacy month. November is that. So thank you. Um, we are about to wrap up. So Daniel, Back to you before we do wrap up. Um, where do folks get started with Abra? It's very easy. You go to the Android Play Store or the uh, Apple, uh, Apple iOS App Store. You can download Abra, A B R A, on your thing. It's a pretty straightforward process in which you could, uh, through your mobile phone, have a whole new bank at your service. And that, my friends, is how you overcome the crypto winter. You know, <laughs> like I hope, I hope that folks, and I want to see it in the chat. I got to make sure that, you know, well, people are. The, the chat is activated and the feedback. Okay. So I've got umbrella house productions, by the way, um, Danny, I've been in upland for almost a year now. So there's that. And then Coop DeVille says, what NFT exchanges have you partnered with to work with Abra? So it's like there's some side chats that need to happen, but clearly you got folks excited. So thank you for that. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your energy and wisdom. And we look forward to keeping the conversation going, but uh, that's a wrap for overcoming the crypto winter. Thank you. Take care.
And we are back. All right. And we are back. I just, we just saw your commercial. Um, we're going to have to unpack all of the goodness. <laughs> but Kristen, you know, we had uh, Arthur Hayes on the, uh, join us at Crypto for the Culture earlier today. And, you know, I don't know if you follow him on Twitter, but if you don't, just like everybody needs to follow him because he's just hilarious. But he said this, he said, haters going to hate, but my portfolio about to appreciate, right? <laughs> hilarious. Uh, but that's the East ethos. That's the wave of crypto for the culture, defy all odds. But here's the thing. You know, we talked a lot today about tactics and strategies to, to earn, you know, regardless mm -hmm. of the, uh, you know, the conditions. Now we're going to talk about protecting your earnings. Here's a stat that I read that I was just kind of blown away by, and that is Forbes Crypto reported, Kristen, that uh, in 2022, or excuse me, 2022 on pace to be the in hacking. So I think something like $3 billion has already been stolen through hacking alone. So we are just super excited to introduce you, Kristen Paki who is the R&D engineer at Arculus, a next generation cold storage wallet. And before we dive into the conversation, I've been doing this for all of our panelists. So hopefully it gets excited and, and it's up. Um, it's me, because I'm like, damn, they did that? She did this? Oh my gosh. <laughs> so you began your career after graduating with a bachelor's degree in mecha mechanical engineering in 2020. Uh, since then, you've been developing new designs and processes in the metal payment card industry uh, at Compo Secure, which is Arculus's parent company. Um, I am so excited to in to, not in to welcome you for the culture. And uh, we've got a lot to unpack on the security side. So welcome, Kristen. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Oh my gosh, we're super excited to have you. You know, when you think about the billion dollars that people are losing, it's like, where's Arculus been all my life? Yeah. Uh, but that's where we have this conversation, you know? Yep. Um, I have Maddie in the chat saying, Arculus is so dope. So clearly you've got fans. <laughs> um, but Kristen, tell me a little bit about you. You know, how did you get started in crypto? What got you interested? Honestly, Arculus. Arculus is the reason that I have any, you know, interest or knowledge in crypto. I was very like surface level. I knew general knowledge about crypto, but I started hearing about Arculus and I heard about self-sovereignty and cold storage. And I'm like, what do these things mean? So I started doing some research into what that actually means to control your assets and, you know, generating private keys and what all this means. And the more I learned, the more I wanted to continue to learn. Um, so it just spiraled and snowballed into getting more and more involved in Arculus. And now I continue to learn every single day that I work on Arculus. So. You know, I was going to ask you a little bit about, you know, what do you find so thrilling in this space? You used a word, self-sovereignty. I mean, mm -hmm. that really strikes a chord with me. But, you know, what does that mean to you? And what makes you so excited about being in this particular um, vertical within the industry? Yeah, I think the industry in general, what's really exciting about it is the potential um, the potential to be applied to so many other industries, you know, it, it can change the way we do finances, the way we hold and share art, um, you know, it can be applied to supply chain and all kinds of different things. So I'm kind of excited to see how the industry grows and expands with other industries and how it, the technology can be applied to different areas. Um, but when you're talking about self-sovereignty, what I think is really important there is understanding that you are the one in control of the use of your keys, right? So I decide when crypto leaves my account, comes into my account, I'm the one in control. So that's what's really important to understand and like have the knowledge to know how to do it the right way and to do it safely, but also make it easy. You know, immediately you're, you're making me think of not your keys, not your crypto, right? Like yeah. that's a real thing. And, you know, mm -hmm. people don't necessarily know understand what that truly means. Can you tell us a little bit about like, what, what does that mean? You know, you're talking about private keys, um, you know, help us understand what that is. Sure. Yeah. So say I'm like new to crypto and I say, okay, I, the world is my oyster. I can choose whatever platform I want to start 
you know, buying crypto, holding crypto. So I have a couple different options I can go with, one of which is a custodial wallet. So I sign up on a platform. They're in control of my keys. I can access my stuff. It's not the most secure option, but it's super easy. One step more secure than that would be a self-custodial um, hot wallet. So it's all online and your keys are in your control. You know, they give you your 12 word phrase. So you hold the keys. Um, it's not stored by the platform, but it is stored on your phone, which is has access to the Internet. So it is a step better, but it's it's not quite the most secure option that there is. Um, what we see is the best option, which is what Arculus is, is a um, self-custody hardware wallet or cold storage wallet. So your keys are actually generated and stored offline on a device that does not have immediate access to the internet. Um, so there's no fear of it you know, being compromised or hacked. So those are kind of the tears in my eyes. Um, so that's what's really important is you know, choosing where do you want to where do you want to put all of your crypto and, you know, sleep sound at night knowing it's going to be safe? And let's talk a little bit about, you know, um, I think some people may think that, you know, cold storage just is enough. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Like, like maximum security in your eyes, what that look like? Um, I think cold storage, you know, having your keys offline, if you're careful with, you know, what you do with them. Cold storage is a great solution. You know, you you are the one in control. You can decide what gets moved when. Um, the other cool thing about Arculus um, that I think makes us kind of unique is we use three factors of authentication. So it, as our video mentioned, it uses your biometrics, so something that you are, your pin code, which is something that you know, and then the card itself. So since the keys are stored on the card, the card would be required to sign any transactions so the card must be present at all times. So not only does your key get stored offline, but it also is required for any transaction. So it's like a security key, a hardware security key. I love that. And so I think that would that was three layers of protection that you exactly. just mentioned with with Arculus. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, let's talk a little bit more about you. You know, you're you're heading up R and D. Tell us a little bit about a day in the life of you. Like, what are you working on? Yeah, a day in the life can look very different <laughs> from day to day. Um, so I would say a lot of my time I spend with the developers, the computer um, engineers that are developing the card and the um, software, so the firmware and the software. And as you mentioned, my background is mechanical engineering, so I don't have a like computer science background at all. So it's been a really awesome learning experience. It's a you know, an area that I'm interested in and always have been, but never really dove much into. So I learn, like I said, I learn a lot every single day, which I love. Um, and then, you know, some other days I'm traveling to trade shows. Um, I actually just got back to, uh, I got back from Money 2020 recently in Las Vegas. Um, I love going to trade shows. I get to work with sales, marketing, the product team. And most importantly, I get to talk to customers or potential customers. I get to do demos, talk to them about Arculus, what Arculus stands for, how secure it is. Um, and just even some people that don't really know that much about crypto, talk to them about crypto and what self-sovereignty is, because like we keep touching on, it is very, very important. Um, so it's just awesome to get that back and forth, some feedback and see people get excited about security because we think it's really exciting too. Yeah, you know, it's one of those, to some people, you know, might see it as like a necessary, evil, you know, it'd be great if like, everyone was honest and you know, trustworthy and, you know, there weren't bad actors. But the reality is that that's just not the world that we're living in. And so let's talk a little bit more about security best practices. Um, I would love if you could share some, you know, security tips, any best practices. You know, I told, we, I mentioned before, I think it was something like, Three billion dollars this year alone, um, we've lost due to hacks, crypto. So it's like when you think about like the you know the gratis associated with that much money being lost. When if we were to take the necessary precaution, um, we probably could have prevented a lot of those cryptos, you know, being um, taken. So would love to just, you know, being an ex a security expert, hear your thoughts on like, what are some of the things that we can do? Like walk us step by step. 
Sure. Yeah. So with many um, cold storage wallets, Arculus included, you still receive a mnemonic phrase, the seed phrase when you set up your wallet. Um, so that's basically the word form of your keys. So, you know, you would write that down, store it in a safe, lock it away, make copies, keep it in a very secure place. Because at the end of the day, those mnemonic words are really the key to your crypto. You know, putting them somewhere they don't belong, giving them to the wrong person or giving them to anyone um, can be catastrophic and you could lose everything. So at its core, your, you know, your keys, which are also a form of your mnemonic words, um, have to, you know, be in your hands and you know, we're giving you your keys on a card, but you also have your keys written down as your 12 words. So it, it's important to not only use Arculus, but also to be safe about how you hold your mnemonic words. Um, in addition to that, just best practices of, you know, not using common pin codes or passwords or anything in, in general um, is really the best way. Um, Arculus does have one security feature, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so like I said, you have an Arculus um, unique pin code that you create when you set it up. Six digits. Um, if, you know, someone found my card or my, and my phone and however way managed to get in and they try to guess my pin code after three wrong tries, your card gets wiped. So your keys are gone. So even if you had lost everything and someone somehow got that far, um, Arculus will wipe out your card, you know, if it thinks it's being compromised what are some of the um uh, and thank you that's like super duper helpful um uh, i definitely want to see in the chat some key takeaways uh christine gave us some great pointers so definitely want to make sure that people are like tracking because this could be the difference between um being crypto rich or crypto broke <laughs> so i had to make a little uh christine <laughs> tell me though uh what are some of the like horror stories because you know fud tends to like motivate people to like pay attention and to like you know actually put into practice these great tips that you've been sharing around security so let's let's scare them a little bit like what are some of the <laughs> that sounds terrible but i mean like this is a really serious topic so i just want people to understand um you know what we mean and what's at stake so are there any like stories that you could share about those of us that did not listen to what you um, outlined as best practices? I mean, there are the ones um, that you mentioned earlier, all the losses that have come to um, in, you know, your crypto this year. Um, you know, it's it kind of all comes down to what wallet you choose. So that is part of the choice you have to make is how secure do you want to be versus how, I guess, easily accessible because some cold storage doesn't make it super easy to access your crypto. We think we do a really good job of that. But that aside, um, you know, choosing to use easier platforms, exchanges um, can sometimes put your crypto at risk. So that's one general horror story. Um, the other would be uh, the classic case of uh, losing your 12 word recovery phrase. We use 12 words. Um, obviously, if you lose that and you kind of lost everything or give it away to someone and someone can just clean out your wallet. So the, it is quite genuinely like your keys. So if you lose that or give it away, you are out of luck. There's nothing we can do to help you because we don't have those. There's nothing really anyone else can do to help you. So keeping your 12 word phrase is the most takeaway, like most important takeaway when talking about crypto. Yeah, I mean, and you mentioned it earlier, self-sovereignty, right? Like that's mm -hmm. part of the responsibility of helping make sure that, you know, the onus is on us, you know, like exactly. you can't blame anyone. You can't be mad at anyone um, if you're not taking that responsibility. Yeah, so, self oh, sorry. I'm sorry, I was just going to say self-sovereignty is putting you in the driver's seat. So you do not only have the control, but you also have the responsibility to, you know, manage it responsibly. So. I think that uh, it would be helpful for everyone to see a demo of Arculus. You know, we talked about a lot of the great features, talked about the three um, uh, authentication you know, methods, but let's show them what we're talking about. So we're going to pause on our chat and we're going to play a demo video. Will that work? Yep. Sounds good. Arculus cold storage. Without cold storage, any cryptocurrencies can be hacked from an exchange 
phishing, SIM swapping, and more. Own your own cryptocurrency safely with cold storage. Crypto Tutor's cold storage of choice is Arculus. Simply tap the card to your mobile device with the Arculus Wallet app using 3FA, your biometric, facial recognition, or thumbprint, for example, your PIN, and your Arculus key card to authorize and secure your crypto to your cold storage card in minutes. Go to the App Store and search for Arculus and download the app. First, open the app. Now, place your Arculus key card on a flat surface with the back of the card facing up. Depending on your phone model, correctly align the NFC antenna in your phone to the center of the card. Keep your phone still during the setup until you see a message display, create a new wallet. Success! Wasn't that cool that we could just show that instead of talking about it and expect people to like really like understand all the things they're saying? <laughs> that was awesome. That was great. <laughs> The crypto suitor, I'm telling you, you know, she's got such sass, such personality, you know, she's so smart. <laughs> yeah, she is um, awesome. So, so Kristen, I'm going to, uh, a little question from the chat. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. Allison Thompson said, what if you lose your card? Uh, can your account be restored? Right. Yeah. So that's, I keep touching on the 12 word mnemonic phrase that you get when you set up your wallet. Um, that's again, why it's so important that you write it down and store it, you know, in a safe, maybe make some copies and keep it in a couple different places just in case. Um, some people go with fireproofing. So just take all the precautions. W once you have your 12 word phrase, you can always restore your wallet onto a new card if you ever lost it. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. So another thing I wanted to ask is that you talked a lot about sort of testers and I wanted to dive in a little bit to the B2B aspect of Arculus. Um, what are uh, the types of clients or who are the types of clients that you work with and what kind of solution does Arculus provide on the B2B level? Sure. Yeah. I love this question. So um, we're really open to any client that values authentication and security. So <clears throat> it could be, you know, from bank, fintech, exchange. Um, so our solution offerings are really, really exciting. So we've been talking about our crypto our crypto cold storage wallet. So that is an offering that we have. We also um, can make a metal card with a authentication built into it. Um, so it's a FIDO2 protocol. It's basically a hardware key. So you can use it to um, do passwordless login to an app. It can also be used for um, something called step up authentication. So the platform or user can set a threshold, say it's like $500. So if I try to transfer $500 out of my account, I want you to authenticate. Um, you can also set up a pin that's stored on the card similar to a debit card pin. And so it'll ask you to type in your pin, tap your card. Okay, it's you, approve the transaction. So we have crypto, we have, authentic we have authentication. What's super exciting about it is that as we touched on earlier, our parent company is CompoSecure. We manufacture metal payment cards, so we can actually combine these technologies with standard payment. So we can make payment cards that do, you know, you can tap it at a terminal, pay for your coffee with, um, you know, USD, and then you can also use it to sign your Bitcoin transactions that you're sending to a friend. Um, or you can, you know, tap at a payment terminal and then use it to log into your bank and authenticate transactions through there. So we kind of think of it as going from, um, you know, old flip phones to newer uh, smartphones and iPhones. You know, we're taking all of the intelligence and technology and combining it onto one device that's smarter. So really excited about those. I just love how enthusiastic and excited you are about the work that you do. You know, could there be anyone better to be on the R&D team <laughs> leading charge? You're just so excited and like, you know, on a personal note, for folks that are watching this, that are, you know, even new to the space, for them to see you and in a few years, I mean, I think you said you started 2020. Yep. 
for you to be where you are, can we talk just a little bit? Because, you know, we've been, uh, we've had a few career panels throughout the course of the day. Um, and I always ask folks, I'm like, okay, how like your, your, your story, your origin story. Um, I, I, I would love for you to just share a little bit about, you know, you're so excited and you're doing such incredible work. You know, this space that we're in, why is it that it gets you so jazzed? Like, what is it about the world that we're living in in Web3 that gets you so jazzed? Yeah, I think it's just I came from a mechanical background, very like hold it in your hands, not not this like obscure blockchain things moving around. So it's not really the background I came from. I started at Compo Secure after I graduated. Again, that was more hands on making new payment cards, um, just kind of doing a lot more like design work. When Arculus started, it just like lit a spark in me that was like, there's this whole world of crypto and blockchain that I know nothing about that every time and I to this day learn new things every single day. And I just enjoy finding new things that I'm like, oh, I didn't know that that chain works like that. That's really cool. I wonder why they chose to do it this way. Let me go research that. So and Web3, I mean, there's so much freedom there, too. You know, um, we uh, earlier this year, we added a NFT viewer to our app and support for Wallet Connect to connect to some dApps, um, DEXs, um, NFT marketplaces. So that was really exciting, too. I think um, since I started with Arculus before it had actually launched last October, I kind of was there from the beginning before anyone knew what it was and through the development of getting it, you know, the first product out the door. And now I'm watching it grow more and more. And okay, we're adding these new features. And okay, we're going to add a couple more um, ERC20 tokens this, you know, this month. Um, so it's just, it makes me really excited to kind of grow in my career as Arculus grows. And we kind of started there together and we're <laughs> learning and growing all the time. So I just, I, I love working on it and I love learning. I, uh, I love that for you. You know, like a lot of people are, can't stand what they do. A lot of people are like middle going in every day and just, you know, begrudgingly. And just to see the joy, the excitement, the enthusiasm, and for you to be working on uh, such a critical part of the, you know, Web3 infrastructure, you know, we cannot underscore how vital security is. So, you know, thank you for your, your brilliance and genius in applying it in this way. And I'd be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge, you know, another female leader in a space where, you know, we're not as, you know, present as we should be. So what you're doing, uh, you're serving as an aspiration and an inspiration. And I just want to say thank you on behalf of Crypto for the Culture for joining us and sharing this, you know, really important information and just continuing to be your joyous self. Like, I just love seeing you happy and it makes me happy. So keep that infectious energy. <laughs> Thank you. That means so much. I really appreciate that. <laughs> well, with that being said, um, we are going to go to a commercial break. Awesome. Thanks, Thank you. Kristen. All right. Boom. Can, can, can we just have a moment? That commercial, did you see? Did I mean like that was good? Shit. I like it. I was, that was I was like, damn, we built that. <laughs> Don't you build where it's like, damn, wow, okay. Like there's the, the bar is never dropped. It's always risen when it comes to you, a sixty Z, the culture leadership fund. You know how y'all do. Hey, the the only the only thing that's dropped is the mic. Hey, mm -hmm. hey, the virtual mouth. Boom. So, so Chris, this is such a full circle moment, right? Because I remember back in 2020, we were in a, we were at a barbecue in, in somebody's backyard here in Miami. And this was before the crypto, you know, Miami became the crypto capital of the U.S. Mm -hmm. And we were chopping it up. And I remember when we started to talk about crypto, it was just like this, like mind blowing moment. It was just like this bonding moment because you know, we've been on this journey ever since. And I'm just so happy and grateful to host you at Crypto for the Culture. As Arthur Hayes says, Crypto for the 
culture. <laughs> and, you know, here we are on this virtual stage and you are the president of Web3 at A16Z Crypto. So can we just have success stories? That's what I have to say. That's <laughs> why. <laughs> That's why. <It's> crazy. <laughs> I'm it seeing you in the back. Hmm? No, I said it's been a, it's been an amazing journey. Mm -hmm. I'm um I'm super duper grateful to have you, and you know it's such an interesting story as I reflect on just all of your accomplishments. You know the fact that your you know the the fund the A16Z crypto fund. You know the portfolio includes you the labs, um, you know board eight yacht club, uh, crypto punks. You know under the Yuga umbrella. You know some of the most commercially successful NFTs. Period. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but let's talk about your origin story. You know, you transitioned from being a sound engineer uh, for a Grammy Award winning producer, super producer at that, Jermaine Dupri, mm -hmm. to being, um, you know, the Fresh Prince of Silicon Valley. No, I'm just <laughs> I had to. If Megan is watching this, thank you, Megan. Um, That'll be, that's the next reality show coming soon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, no, but, you know, you transitioned to being a VC in Silicon Valley. Like, tell us about that. You know, how did you go from one, you know, side of the spectrum to, to the other? Yeah, well, and first and foremost, good to see everybody. Um, and, you know, congrats again on everything, Lisa, for putting this together. Uh, and I know you're dropping lots of knowledge and inspiration, as you always do. So um, this is a, an amazing time. And I'm, I'm great, uh, grateful to actually be part of um, the the uh, crypto for the culture, because um, that's what we do it for. Uh, and so, you know, just to give you a, just a high level. So, yeah, I always actually love technology. Um, I grew up just always kind of being at the forefront of trying to find everything that was cool, whether it was the first flip phone to the, you know, sidekick to getting an MP3 player and or, you know, you name it. I always wanted to be at the at the head of the curve. And so that was always something that was big for me. As we did that, um, you know, I also was a big, I love music. It was my passion is where uh, I spent all my time, you know, went to school for it um, and actually got a degree in recording arts and entertainment business and then ended up working for Jermaine Dupree. Um, and so, but while I was in school, just getting my second degree, um, it, I came across this really interesting opportunity because I was also serving tables. I had to pay the bills and I basically, while I was serving tables, I noticed that everybody was starting to get smartphones. And so, but they would always leave their smartphones right there on the table. And so for, I was like, okay, there's something interesting here. We're living in this world where, where technology is eating everything. Um, you know, that's one of our quotes, technology is eating the world. But then now at the same time, like we have these paper menus and I was like, well, what if you could make an application so that regardless of your whole technological background, any um, you know, restaurant regard can actually have their menus on smartphones and tablets with high quality photos of each individual dish. So that was in 2010. Uh, and so I was like, well, I'm already a music engineer. I'm always on the computer. Maybe I can also be a computer engineer as well too. And ended up teaching myself how to code. Uh, I got accepted into an incubator that flew me across the country. I was always supposed to be in the Bay area for three months and ended up staying for eight years. Uh, and so that kind of, and then through that time also, you know, eventually got connected, um, with, with Mark and Ben, uh, and they, you know, was, they gave me a heads up that there was this amazing chief of staff position. It was the first time, you know, at the firm that they were going to have a formal chief of staff position. Uh, and so it was an opportunity too good to, to pass up on. And from there ended up actually, um, making my transition and where I supported, where I supported Ben and, uh, which, which ultimately led into, um, me understanding where the future of the world is gone. Mm -hmm. Damn, the future. <laughs> Can we just have a pause? Can we just have a pause right here? That was so unbelievably gangster because what I heard in that story is that, like, you know, you you saw a problem that could be solved and you recognized that you had transferable skills. You also recognized that you could teach yourself, you know, this notion of being a, a self learner, you know, mm -hmm. notion of not necessarily having to go to, you know, MIT to get these comm sci degrees and what have you. And you, interesting as well, even, you know, there's so much conversation about self sovereignty in our space. Mm -hmm. What you 
what you exemplified is the embodiment of being sovereign. So I could go on and on about that, but I don't know if we have time for all of that. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're going to take it offline. We're going to take it offline. We're, we're going to back. Oh, we'll have, for the, that's at the after party or the drink session. <laughs> Say it again for the people in the back. So, Absolutely. you know, um, we've got the CLF, the Culture Leadership Fund logo here. Shout out to mm -hmm. all of our peoples at the CLF on the heels of the most amazing uh, summit experience, might I add, that Crypto Tutors was, um, you know, we were honored with with being invited. So thank you to you and your team, Megan, Judine, Debbie Deb, all the peoples, Derek, all y'all. Um, Absolutely. You are all incredible. And, you know, the thing about you also, Chris, is that you're a champion of access. You know, you're you're somebody that ensures that underrepresented folks have access to opportunities. You know, a testament to that is you hold posts on the advisory boards of the Black Economic Alliance, um, New Story Charity, which I had to do some research on. And, and if I'm uh, correct, they provide homes and 3D printed homes to mm -hmm. people living with inadequate shelter, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so my question to you is, why are you so passionate about marginalized, empowering marginalized communities? Yeah, well, I think it's really, you know, it's important for all of us to have access um, and to put our best foot forward. And one of the things that I learned, especially working at the firm, was is what the, a lot of the opportunities come around access to information. You know, and I think that that's the number one thing that we can provide. Uh, like a great example is is crypto. You know, like how many people were interested in crypto in 2010 or 2012 or 2013 or you know, pick the date and when you first learned about Bitcoin, pick the date when you first learned about Ethereum. That was where a generational wealth transfer was happening. And if you didn't have access to that information, you didn't even know what was going on. But but millions of people or even or hundreds of thousands of people did. And, you know, so the goal is to how do you take, whether it's complex information, very unique opportunities, um, and be able to actually share that with the rest of the world. And so, you know, that was one of the reasons why we wanted to create the Cultural Leadership Fund was because you know, we saw all these amazing opportunities you know, that we were looking at from the investment side. And you, know, you look at the cap tables and you know, unfortunately we would get, especially from like, whether it's influencers, black, black and brown culture, you name it, like we would get, we'd get access on the much later stages by that time, you know, the wealth has already been distributed. The rounds are, you know, the upside is, is a, lot more, a lot more limited. And so we were like, what if we could actually reverse that and get people in as early as possible? Um, and so thinking about the world's greatest athletes, entertainers, musicians, and executives. And, and why, why focus on black culture? Because if you think about, you know, just how, how black culture has been transformative to consumer culture. So you think about what we did pioneering, you know, rock and roll to, um, you know, what Tiger and Serena did for sports, what Virgil's did for the fashion industry, um, you know, you can go on and on and on. Black culture, whenever we touch anything, like exponentially becomes uh, a, a 10 times huge, bigger opportunity. And just within the past 10 years, 10 to 15 years, really, has consumer culture really just started to enter the Internet. And so, you know, but and there is a, a some somewhat of a learning curve when it comes to technology. But the goal is to actually how do we accelerate that 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 knowledge curve and at the same time, you know, be at the forefront in order to kind of provide that the, the access to information and curate, you know, high quality opportunities. And so, um, you know, we ended up launching the first fund in 2018. It was it was the first fund in the history of Silicon Valley to be 100 percent black LP. So we're very excited about that. And even more importantly, um, all the management fees and carry that we take from the fund goes to a select number of nonprofits that help adv advance more African-American and diverse backgrounds into technology. And so. You know, I, I, I'm sure you've heard the term doing well and doing good. I, I, I believe that's the core energy that drives um, the Cultural Leadership Fund and Injuries in Horowitz, which is the reason why, you know, we've been grateful to, to launch three funds from now and have an amazing team that is working every day to um, support something that's bigger than themselves. I love it. I love it. I love it. And, you know, there's um, I guess it's an African proverb that says if you want to go fast, 
uh, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And, you know, in knowing you personally and just, you know, seeing how you how you maneuver and, you know, all the things that you touch, you know, you, you do have this, this Midas touch, you know. Um, but what I want to drill down to is you're a visionary and you sit at the nexus of tech and culture. Mm -hmm. So let's dive in a little bit deeper into what does culture mean to you? Yeah. Well, I mean, culture, it's interesting because I think even, you know, we're called the cultural leadership fund, but everyone uses the word culture now to where it's kind of like, what is this word culture? And, and so I think I really believe it as how do you see the world how, and how can you actually present those up, your vision and your aesthetic to a point where you actually start to gain a collective and start to have people to really start to come together. And so culture can mean fashion, it can mean art, it can mean music, it can mean so many different things, but it's really your own interpretation in terms of how you want to actually move and shake in, in, in the world. And then also bring others around to kind of to, to embody similar but different methods. And so, you know, for us, like, I believe culture and technology are, are, are moving at lightning speeds together. And because of technology, we're being able to have access to new points of culture that we've never would have seen before. Um, so that can do from, you know, looking at different dance uh, move, uh, moves, which has happened to breaking off because of companies like TikTok or, you know, YouTube or um, even just the how people are getting discovered on Instagram um, and in conversations that you've been able to have on Twitter or information that you've been able to learn on Clubhouse. Like these are things where culture is now translating into so many different mediums and it's all because of technology and being able to actually take your version and apply it in a way that works best for you. That's to me like what true culture is where it's like, well, it's not what you say, it's what you do is, is who you are. Uh, ben, he's Ben Horowitz, he, he wrote a book called What You Do Is Who You Are, and it's re it really defines a lot of the culture. And so I think that, you know, it's what you do um, that really helps kind of embody the, that spirit. And it goes across so many different mediums. Uh, and, you know, the most important thing is originality. Um, but at the same time, you know, we have, it's always a cross, a cross culture as well, too, because at one point you have, you have your what you love to do, but then there's always another medium that you're going to uh, work with. So it could be fashion, it could be film, it could be arts, music, entertainment, crypto. Um, and it's how you kind of can connect those two worlds together. And, you know, I think that that's really where you get um, the, the amazing reinvention of, of quote unquote culture that happens every day. I love that. And, you know, in the vein of just um, talking about how culture influences the way even someone like you and and you know team perhaps how do you evaluate tech like culture and and tech how does that play into uh the considerations of the organizations that you are interested in investing in mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well i think you know there's a there's a lot of things i think the most important thing that that we look for is or at least me specifically is this thing called an idea maze. And so like basically an idea maze is, is you as a founder, you've worked your entire life to get into this position. So say, you know, for me, like my idea maze was the cultural leadership fund. Like it doesn't make any sense for athletes, entertainers, musicians, and executives to be a part of um, uh, technology or venture capital. But for me, I started off in the entertainment industry. And so, I have that lens and then moving into the startup world and then moving into venture capital. And so you see how you think that, okay, I've hit this peak and then now there's a new mountain and then there's a new mountain and there's a new mountain. And over time you're learning so many different things that then has brought you to this point where you now say, Oh, wow. Like this is, this is the, the culmination of my, my life's work and I'm going to build it into a company. Um, a great example uh, is like John Zimmer, who is the founder of, of Lyft. He started off, actually, he learned about um, ride sharing, not, you know, in the United States, but when he was in Africa. Yeah. And he 
had, um, and so he had this company called Zimride. And basically in Africa, people used to ride in, you know, collective cars together. So one, they have one car, people would come in, hop off, keep on traveling and transportation. And so he discovered that secret um, while he was there. And then, you know, when he came back to the States, he, the, the original company was called Zimride, but then ultimately got trans, the name changed into Lyft. And so, but that's, that's an idea maze in terms of how you kind of gotten into those points. Um, the other thing which is kind of countercultural or counterintuitive is, is what we like to call good ideas that look like bad ideas. And so I know that that sounds like, it's like, well, what does that mean? Like, you know, a good idea that looks like a good idea is, okay, I want to make a cell phone that has, you know, 10x battery life, or, you know, I want to have uh, a brand new set of headphones. Okay, well, that's, that, those are all great ideas, but that means that there's a million people that also know that they're good ideas. And so then they all end up doing the same thing, which then ultimately bottles down the price and increases competitiveness. Bad ideas, they look like bad ideas are just bad ideas. And so you want to find this really small intersection where it's good ideas that look like bad ideas. Like who thought it was a good idea to sit in a stranger, to you know, stay in a stranger's home? I mean, that sounds crazy. But then you know, because of technology, that company like Airbnb has completely transformed the hospitality industry or, or sitting in the back of a stranger's car. You know, who would have thought that that was a good idea or creating, you know, the ninth so, um, you know, search network, which ended up being Google. Um, and so these are all extreme, but they all have the, the what, what's, what, what I mentioned before, which is your earned secret, like that you spent your entire life working on. And so when we're talking with founders, you know, even if the idea is changing, the most important thing is always going into the, 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 the full history and backdrop of who the individual is and, and how they see the world, because ultimately that's going to be the, the driver of the success of the business. So let's talk a little bit about pattern recognition, right? Because some of the things that you're describing, you know, even the notion of, you know, look for the good idea and the bad idea, um, you know, founders that are just so committed to what they are building that they just have this like unrelenting, um, you know, just inexhaustible energy. They mm -hmm. just refuse to like succumb and, and refuse to believe that what they're building isn't, a, you know, a necessity. Let's talk a little bit about that mindset. You know, um, what are some of the characteristics in terms of, you know, founders that you've worked with or that you've seen in your career? What are some of the attributes that they possess that, you know, no matter who they are, where they're from, what they look like, what are some of those commonalities? Mm -hmm. I mean, one is just always being able to learn. I think that, you know, there's super small situations and massive, you know, experiences that you have over life. And so, but always being open to, um, you know, being able to be receptive of new information is one thing. I think I'm, I'm very, very, very big on network. Um, so like, I always say like your network is your net worth and it's not who, you know, but it's who knows you. Um, so when you're thinking about opportunities, when you're thinking, when you need to make connections, we need to make, you know, at, at, on the team, I always say our relationships need to be pick up the phone relationships where we're, not, we're, not, we're if something needs to get done, we're not going to send an email. We can send an email, but we're also going to, you know, I'll be calling you too. Yes. Yeah, so, All right. What are we doing? What are we doing? I'm so, like, you can answer me. <laughs> And you're like, I don't answer for everybody, but you know what I mean? It's, it's, hey, these, these work days are work days. They're busy. So, um, but it is really important to have a quality network that goes across because that ultimately ties into, you know, um, sales from who, who your potential clients and customers are going to be to hiring and talent um, where you can have what we would call like the divine flame where you can actually, you know, attract great talent. I mean, Ben, what, the first thing he told me, he said, you know, what do you call a leader with no followers? And he's like, it's somebody that's just taking a walk. And so you're going to have to have what we call have that, which is that divine flame, which is to actually, you know, be resilient, have the the it factor to be able to attract great, great prospects and, and ultimately, um, you know, have the, the tenacity to stick it out. Uh, I know that in 2022, we make startups look very glamorous. Um, but in reality, there's a this is a long and and hard road to kind of get um, to get to where we're at and or to get to this finish line. And it often takes almost ten years. And, and there's ups and downs and hurdles. And 
uh, so many did, Ben wrote a great blog post called the, um, the struggle. And, uh, and it, I encourage anybody not to, as a downside, but just to know like, you know, there's, you're not alone when you're going into this. And so, um, you know, as a founder, I think the, the last thing is just is, is, is empathy for yourself and knowing that, you know, that this is a journey and you're going to be able to take the steps to ultimately get you to where you want to go. And for us as investors to, roll up our sleeves and support whenever we can. Yeah. And I think that that's, you know, uh, also too embedded in even our interactions with the culture leadership fund and the team being open to like introducing us to, you know, folks, um, at like tally and manifold and just, you know, that connective tissue. Um, you know, Chris, I want to go back to your career. I want to talk a little bit about the fact that now, you know, you're, you're coming up on 10 years at a 16 Z, you know, mm -hmm. you mentioned right I mean that in and of itself is an incredible incredible ride a meteoric rise but you know you you know you've been you've been grinding you know as you mentioned um and you started out as the chief of staff uh for Ben and now you're the president of web3 a16z crypto so mm -hmm. if you can tell us a little bit about some of the you know some of the tips and tricks you were able to leverage besides lion's wine you know i'm sure that that helps <laughs> i didn't have my bottle but uh we'll get it on the back end but besides love lion's wine. <laughs> love it. yeah shout out to lion's wine in case you guys need an after party drink <laughs> uh, we'll be toasting to that uh at, after the end at the end of this but um you know what are some of the trick tips and tricks that you've leveraged that have enabled you to consistently rise in the ranks um, in your career? Mm -hmm. I mean, one is you're just going to have to work hard. Um, and this is when you say 10 years to me, um, it's probably double. I think you, you <laughs> in terms of the hours and, and the, the commitment that you have to do, um, you always have to learn. I think that it, it's, it's, Staying up to speed. I mean, like my Audible. I'm on. I'm just listening to books. I'm reading every day. The the industry moves so fast um, and across so many different sectors, and so it's super important to always not to stay up on trends because trends change, but understanding mm -hmm. core foundations. So understanding like the foundation of what works in in venture capital, what works in technology, what are consumer and software behaviors. Um, really thinking about. Uh, you know, how you can add value. Um, you know, that's, that's another thing that has been really important. And I always recommend to people, it's like, I can't tell you the amount of times people reach out and ask for something and I've never even talked to them before. And what like, and so, you know, and expect all, you're like, well, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, I love you. You definitely shoot your shot, but at the end of the day, like the, the best way in order to, you know, move forward is actually to give first. And so by, you know, figuring out opportunities where you can be a value add, that's how you get brought into the, the next level of the rooms is, is actually coming with something. You know, it's like you, you you're, when your mom tells when you come to Thanksgiving, you know, you can't come empty handed. And so I think, oh, that that's, you know, so that, I think that that's that's super powerful when it when it comes to the career and always. So I always come into any circumstance or any situation with a how can I help or add value first. And once the social equity pool gets large enough, then you know that there's an opportunity for you to actually ask in return. And by then it's already super easy because you've already demonstrated that you're somebody that uh, is, is, a, is a giver. And I think that for anybody that's trying to take their, their company or their business or professional or personal career to that, to that next level, if that that's honestly the number one thing that that I would recommend. I think that that was the reason why we raised the culture leadership fund. That's one of the reasons why, you know, I, and I enjoy helping. I because when you help, you make things happen. When you make things happen, you're doing your job. And when you do your job, then, you know, that's like the Deion Sanders play good, look good, feel good style. But <laughs> but for but for venture capital. But so yeah, I mean that's what that's what I would say. You know, it, and the the beauty of everything is that it, the journey is still going on and. Um, you know, we're, we're learning along the way, are grateful for, um, you know, the, the doors that have opened and, and how we can keep them open for everybody else. I love the fact that you mentioned how important it is, you know, to lead with what you can give rather than what you can get. And I can only imagine how many, you know, asks there are of you 
Uh, but I do want people to walk away with the, you know, commitment to giving, you know, like adding value. It's so important that you're leading with, you know, what you can contribute. Um, so Chris, you know, as we're starting to, you know, wind down, I mean, we could do this all every day. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we're going to run it back. You don't know yet, but it's going to happen. Let's do it. <laughs> whatever, whatever you need, you already know. <laughs> I do. And, and for real, for real, like I have to say on a personal note, you know, we are friends. And, you know, I was so excited to be able to have you participate in this discussion. You know, the concept of, you know, converging crypto and culture and the concept of defying all odds, you know, there are a lot of people out there that, you know, it's a very challenging time for many people. Um, and it's really inspiring and it gives a lot of hope. And, mm -hmm. you know, you shared some practical takeaways. So I really appreciate that. Um, but I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, right? What does the future hold for Chris Lyons? Is it, you know, you know, the second coming of Barack Obama? We running for president. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get gray hairs too fast. <laughs> I heard, I heard, I heard it does something with your age. Um, yeah, no, look, I think that there's the, the future is, is, is really, I would call it limitless being only because it's whatever, you know, we want to actually bring to the world. I think I continue to love technology. I love, um, you know, working with the team here at Andreessen Horowitz. Uh, I love, you know, being, breaking down doors and you know for me like I all I've done my whole career is go after spaces where you know there was no trail to kind of you know lead new doors and so I'm always trying to find the thing that's never been done um and I think that's just you know and that started off you know just for wanting to work in technology where I realized that there was one percent of us that were in the space and you know, for me, I view that as a good thing originally, because if there's 1% of us, then, you know, I'm the only one that thinks like this, which means that I have a competitive advantage. And so that means that I can win deals. I have networks that nobody else has open to. We can, um, you know, and then I also can help make a difference to increase that percentage and, and, and show people that they can do it their way as well, too. And so whatever, you know, the future continues to hold, it's going to have those key pillars in it and uh, will be a good idea that looks like a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely, I absolutely love it. I mean, listen, you know, um, it's so important for, you know, people that look like us to uh, keep the door open for people that look like us because, you know, the, the construct of the financial arena, the construct of the tech arena, the construct of you know, even crypto, which is what led us to <clears throat> curate this conference experience. You know, we're going to conference upon conference upon conference. And we're like, why is it that there are so few women, uh, mm -hmm. black people? You mm -hmm. know, where are the underrepresented communities? Why are we not being given a platform to have these discussions? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that we don't exist. It was that in some instances, we were getting rejected as speakers. In other instances, we just weren't even considered. It wasn't a consideration. And that happens in, in, in a lot of different industries, which is why, mm -hmm. you know, it's so important. And the culture is so appreciative of people like you who are using your platform to unlock opportunity, access to opportunity. And, you know, we can't really underscore enough how, you know, even in all of your successes and accomplishments, you're still very humble. You know, like you're still very approachable. You've always been very kind. I don't know, like anyone who's interacted with you that doesn't have anything but, you know, um, kind words for you. Like you've never let that. the success get to your head to the point where you're like, you know, in <laughs> the sky. Well, that's when it hits you. That's when it hits you. You know. So, in terms of in terms of the uh, somebody saying just in terms of book recommendations, really quickly, I think that there's yeah. a ton. That I'm just I just pulled up my audible like really quick. I'm just one is called Ben's book. What you do is who you are. He also has another one called hard thing about hard things. You should definitely read that. Um, you know, I believe your mindset is everything. So there's this book called as a man thinketh. I think it's incredible. Um, Shoe dog by um, Phil Knight is an incredible story about entrepreneurship. So if you haven't read that, I highly recommend it. 
Um, I read this book called The Magic of Thinking Big, which is another book where just allows you to kind of go beyond what you your current environment is in order to create things that have never been done before. Um, if you want to learn about the future of crypto and VR and AR, there's a book called Ready Player One, which I highly recommend. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more about technology and how to actually get from, um, you know, what the fundamentals is, uh, it's a book called Zero to One. Uh, and so I would, I would highly recommend that. There's also um, my colleague, Scott Cooper. He wrote a book called The Secrets of Sand Hill Road. And so he's our managing partner at the firm, and he's literally the first employee outside of Mark and Ben. And it's crazy that he wrote this book because it really is, he gave away all the secrets. <laughs> and so, if it, and, I, and especially if you're an entrepreneur or a founder trying to get into this space, it's, it, you have to really understand what the other side of the world is. And so if you can know the game of venture capital, it actually helps you as, a, as an entrepreneur. And that was one of the things that I learned. Um, you know, I can go on and on and on, but I think that those are some really, really, really good foundations uh, to, to, to get you started. Oh, the last one that I'd recommend is a book called The War of Art. Uh, it's not The Art of War, it's The War of Art, because, you know, I do think at the end of the day, I mean, I come, I still come from the creative side and, uh, you know, there's always this other angle in terms of really trying to, you know, go past the road of success and you're always going to have opportunities that um you know make things challenging or make you feel like you're not going to make it or things are tough and you know the war of art really kind of helps you understand why our mentality is that way and how we can still move forward with it so um you know but that those are just a few mm -hmm. well that was uh you know that's a that's a, a war chest of you know how you come up and how you stay up and how you bring other folks with you. So thank you for just taking the time to, to be with us today and just impart your wisdom. You know, the concept of DeFi all odds is truly about how we are harnessing the power of technology to unlock access, unlock, you know, economic engines, connect with companies that are hiring. Um, but also DeFi all odds is everything that you embody, you know, like your, your personal story of how you started your career you mentioned being in the creative space, coming into tech, coming into venture capital, um, literally being, you know, one of the only people of color, you know, back in the day in the valley. And then to have this meteoric rise and continue to create access for other people that look like you. you know, this is it's God's work. It's incredible. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, you know, this is why this is success stories, you know, like that is why we invited you to speak and we're grateful that you chose to do so. Well, I, I think it's, it's, uh, the honor is always mine. I think that, you know, I've, I've always said this from the very beginning, like we have to all work together. We have to, we have to come together. We have to share stories. We have to look out for each other, provide opportunities, um, you know, and, 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 and actually, say what you mean you know a lot of people love you know talking about things and never doing them you know for me i've always just been a doer and then if the information comes out i think that that's great but what's most important is the fact that as you know the first wave as people started learning about entrepreneurship and technology is incredible i think that the fact that you know people are super super focused on understanding where the future of crypto is is going to be even more exciting um, when you think about, uh, you know, how creators are going to be able to have way more incentives just because of, you know, because of blockchain or what the future of, you know, token gated conversations or opportunities or even, you know, where the next generation of wealth is going to be from, you know, providing, uh, you know, unique services and companies. Um, you know, we're at a, we're at, I kind of look at the time right now as if this is the, uh, the beginning of the iPhone. Um, where, you know, it took a long time to just get, you know, just to get into the level of the iPhone. And now from there, then they had the, the application layer, which really kind of changed the entire ecosystem, you know, from creating the Instagrams, the Ubers, Twitters, Pinterests of the world. And I think that right now we're really about to, with, with a lot of the layer one businesses that have been created and, and also the awareness of, of the industry itself, um, the, the, the layer two and the applications are going to be incredible and it's going to really be built by everybody here in this room 
uh, that can see the world very uniquely and, and succinctly to how they want the future to go. And at the same time, being able to love, leverage the amazing infrastructure that crypto has been it will be able to provide. And so um, I'm super excited to see all the companies that you guys are going to be building, uh, the information, the, the game that you're going to be dropping. Uh, and, you know, most importantly, the fact that uh, you guys are continuing to bring all, this whole community together, and you know, Lisa, you, you're you're a champion for for success and a, and, a, and a magnet for good people. And I know that uh, we're we're you guys are just getting started, so you know, let's go. <laughs> we're just getting out of the, the, the starting blocks, um, you know. But I do. I just this is amazing, Chris. Thank you for your time again, and I'm so excited to see what you what you build next. We're rooting for you. We are following you and your journey. Um, we've got your Twitter handles uh, in our resource guide. We have a variety of the educational resources your team was kind enough to provide. Um, we took copious notes on the books that you recommended. So we'll be sharing that with folks as well. Uh, okay. But this is the first conversation of many. And so with that being said, thank you for joining us at Crypto for the Culture. Defy all odds, being the embodiment, the personification of defying all odds. And also, Success. <laughs> Amen. Let's go. Hey, well, it was a pleasure. I appreciate everybody's time. I'm wishing all you all the best as you go into this next chapter. Keep it going. And if you need anything, let me know. Oh, don't worry. I got you. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> we got you. Take care, Chris. Take care. Okay, I'm here. Sorry. <laughs> I was like, am I doing the intro? <laughs> <laughs> look, 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 we all got our Crypto Tudor shirts on. What's up? Hey, what's going <laughs> on? <laughs> Three, four. Tudor's panel. First Crypto Tudor's panel. Hey. Sheesh. All right, y'all. Um, I, I have to say, I've been quoting Arthur Hayes. His, like, tweets are just ridiculous and awesome at the same time. So, you know, this is the perfect... I, <laughs> I started, oh man, I'm starting to freeze. Don't worry, I'm gonna take care of it when I get off this um, intro. So um, we're about to get into the technical application, the technical application of what Crypto Hayes tweets about when he says, haters gonna hate, but my portfolio about to appreciate. I feel like that's the theme throughout the entire conference experience. Um, this is the technical analysis panel with the crypto tutors, making money while I sleep. Mm. Mm, making money while I sleep. Okay, so Moetti, Moetti Newby, okay, is a lifelong Florida native. He has a PhD in statistics from FSU, Florida State University, with a concentration in finance. He has over 10 years of experience working as a financial engineer and energy trader at Next Era Energy Resources. Moetti was an early crypto adopter and owned the first penny auction to in history, yeah, you heard it. The first penny auction website in history to accept Bitcoin as payment. He is also an active member of his community, serving as a board member for nonprofits called Inner City Innovators. And let's keep it 100, Dina. He was our original crypto tutor. <laughs> <laughs> he was the one, everybody, who gave us the game. Okay. I don't know if there would be a crypto tutor if there was no <laughs> tutor. I'm, so, I'm the OG teacher. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you are. We're happy to have you. I'm happy to introduce all of these crypto tutors to the Crypto for the Culture uh, community. And with that being said, fancy pods over and out, and I'll let the crypto tutors do what they do. All right. Thank you, Lisa, for such an awesome introduction. Um, hello, everybody. I'd like to uh, welcome you guys to the technical analysis and trading panel. Um, what we want to do here is really demystify what trading is looks like um the people behind the scenes um what you know kind of you know you might see on instagram or like twitter people talking about trading but what actually goes on behind the scene the mentality the philosophies um you know and, and we're we're constantly learning too so this is like you know part of trading is always learning and so part of this is, um you know even today uh, when I was, I was watching the arthur hayes segment and he said something to me that stuck out to me as a trader he said I'm wrong most of the time, but when I'm right, I make more money than when I'm wrong, right? And that instantly connected 
for me just from a trading perspective. And I learned that today and I'm going to, you know, and I'm going to incorporate that going forward. So, um, you know, but basically we're going to get more into that um, in the segment. But, I, you know, I just wanted to basically, uh, you know, summarize what this um, what this panel is going to give out. Um, a little bit of a disclaimer. Cryptocurrency is still considered a speculative asset. OK, this is a still a speculative space. You should not be putting your 401k on speculative assets. You know, there there are, um, you know, regulated regulated industries. And this is still a emerging industry where, you know, you don't put money that you can't afford to lose in this space. Also, trading is a very, um, you know, is a serious occupation. Um, there are people who, you know, consider this a business um, when they're not trading, they're studying. When they're not studying, they're trading. They are doing this full time as a full time job. It's not something you just want to jump into and out. So I want to just put that out there that um, you know we don't want people to to um, to invest money that, that they can't afford to lose. But, but but we do want to educate people, and that's what we're here for. So uh, with, without um, any further ado, I want to basically um, introduce our my, the other two panelists. Uh, I'll first start with uh, Nina Blankenship. Uh, my co-founder, who is also the CEO of Crypto Tutors, uh, she's a Japanese American uh, graduate of the University of Florida with a major in finance. Uh, she has formerly worked at LinkedIn in both New York City and Singapore, where she became an award-winning marketer for Lynn Asia Pacific Media Solutions team. She was also a LinkedIn learning author. Uh, Nina started crypto trading back in 2020. And she was so successful that she actually was able to purchase a Tesla Model Y. Did not have to go on the prices right. She basically earned it the hard way. So uh, that's an awesome accomplishment. Um, and then also Justin Blunt. Justin Blunt is, uh, what can we say? I mean, he, he is a uh, chart analyst expertise. Um, he is our um, technical analyst expert. Um, you know, he's put out hours of content on our Crypto Tutors channel on um, the, the topic of technical trading extremely passionate about cryptocurrency even more passionate about trading has over nine years of experience in the crypto markets which uh in you know in this space that makes you an og you are an og trader <laughs> um and he holds a bachelor's degree in political science from uh, florida atlantic university and had experience in many industries mortgage banking business consulting medical cannabis all the important things of the day so i want to basically welcome nina and justin to the panel and I want to start with a few questions. Um, I'm going to I'm going to first uh, um, throw this one at, I guess, both of you guys. So and, and you can anybody can jump in. So um, what were some stereotypes that you had um, before you started trading in crypto? And how do those stereotypes match with uh, reality? Yeah, I'll go first. Thanks, Moetti. Hi, everyone, for watching. Thank you for taking the time out to invest in yourself. Um, to up level or reskill yourself. For me, when I first heard about cryptocurrency, I heard about it only from watching the news, right? It being so volatile because the news doesn't cover anything boring. And so I only thought that, um, you know, the only choices of cryptocurrency were Bitcoin or Ethereum or certain altcoins. I didn't know there was another category of cryptocurrency, which is called stable coins that are pegged to the dollar or other one uh, one for one cryptocurrencies. Um, so that was the biggest misconception that I was wrong about. I was also wrong that um, I had a misconception just in my head that I thought you had to be rich because everybody was talking about the price of one Bitcoin. I think at the time um, when I was thinking about investing in it, it was about $8,000. Um, so I thought, oh, I have to own a solid you know, one whole Bitcoin, which is also not true. Um, I also thought that you needed experience trading in traditional finance, like trading stocks. Um, but turns out the majority of people actually enter in, in crypto and they'll just skip traditional finance as well. Um, but the most like, important one that I think that has really helped me longer term is just um, not... Um, I thought that trading was going to be so technical that I wasn't going to be able to understand it. And I kind of just psyched myself out. And so if you can have a mentality of not getting caught up in the hype and not being emotional, you're probably going to do really well as a trader. 
Absolutely. Couldn't agree more with you there, Nina. And good evening, crypto family and crypto nation. It is a pleasure to be here today. I'm just really thankful to, you know, be among such great people. It's truly an honor to be here. And getting on with the question, what were some stereotypes? I think we may have all heard this before. Trading is gambling. <laughs> you, know, you just just shouldn't do you know if you if you put your money into the market you put your money in crypto you're just gambling it and i think this is another mentality that holds many people back from even attempting to try to trade or even remotely understand it because they hear the word gambling and they probably think of all these negative connotations associated with gambling um it just it's just not quite the same now uh, what was the reality of this well it's a yes and a no. There's gambling behaviors. So what am I trying to say here? So when you're trading, you're, you're really taking data and you're, you know, you're taking past data and you're trying to like make an, a, an analysis and an opinion about where price is going to go. Um, and there's many things that you could do to trade. The main thing that separates trading from gambling is that you can control your risk. You know, if I'm at a slot machine, I can't put a stop loss on a slot machine. I can't hodl anything. I can't, you know, there's the once you once you once you put your money in there, that's that's pretty much it. But with trading, you know, the people think it's gambling because unfortunately, many people approach trading with a gambler's mindset. They don't do their due diligence. They don't research. They don't look at charts. And this may happen to many new people entering the market. They see, you know, green percentages and green candlesticks and they they put their money in thinking everything's going to be OK with no kind of analysis. Then at that case, yes, for gambling, because we're pretty much going on off of a whim, thinking that this is going to go up with no kind of data or anything to tell us otherwise. So um, I want to just demystify that, you know, trading can be gambling. You can have a gambler's mindset toward it. But true trading, you know, you're really looking at so many different conditions, charts, analyzing risk. So that's one big advantage is that you can control your risk in trading. With gambling, you can't control anything. It's just, it is what it is. And I'd say the second one would be, you know, going on to what Nina's saying that, um, you know, it's not as technical as many people may think prior to me even entering or even trying to trade. I'd, I used to think, oh, man, you have to be, you know, so smart to do this. You have to be a math wizard. You have to already know traditional finance and, you know, been, been an analyst. That couldn't be remotely further from the truth. What really, really you need to know is very visual, visual base. You need to really understand pattern recognition, I'd say, is one of the most important. So those would be, you know, some of the stereotypes that I had prior to trading. All right. Very cool. Um, so let me go on to the next question. Uh, how about um, we talk about the, your stories, uh, really the journey um, in, you know, in the crypto space? Uh, you know, uh, would you mind sharing with us, like, you know, what, how did you start it? Um, and, you know, going from A to Z, what did that look like? Sure. Um, Morty, you already know this, but <laughs> for those of you who do not know the genesis of Crypto Tutors, um, basically, Moeti, back in the day in university, helped me to get all A's in my math classes by being my statistics tutor. I would go into the math lab and get my tutoring and thankfully got all A's in my classes because of him. Um, Moeti also wrote his PhD on the history of the monetary system. So he's just somebody that I genuinely trust. And when I was working, I was working at LinkedIn. That's how I met Lisa, by the way, um, first in New York and then in the Singapore office. Then in 2020, COVID hit and I came back to the United States, got back in touch with Moadi and I was asking him, what are you up to? And Moadi, I don't know if you remember this, but you would not stop talking about stable coins. Right? <laughs> you're like so passionate yeah. no matter what i was talking to you about you would That's always true. change the topic back to stable coins and one of the things that really clicked with me and how i personally interpreted um being able to stake a stable coin which is when you're supplying um security to the blockchain and it's it's five, it's what he said would say it's five steps back in 2020 so lisa and i went ahead and we tried it out um, now it's a lot easier. It's just a few clicks. 
but back then it was like it technically was five clicks but it was like uh five steps but it was like 500 clicks to get there so that's when we were like okay we did it um but it was super complicated and then but what we did notice was every day we would see the interest slowly building up and even though it was like fractions of a penny because at that point i think it, we were gaining around 10 to 15 percent interest i really became passionate about it because i personally related it to certificates of deposits in banks you know my um, father and his grandfather were able to use certificates of deposits and back then my dad's like 80 years old just for like um, reference, they were able to generate seven to 10% interest at the bank using a certificate of deposit, which now is like not even possible. Mm -hmm. So when I heard that, I was like, wow, if you're able to have such a high interest rate over time through staking a stable coin through compound interest and just using a simple compound interest calculator on the internet, you could be a millionaire. And that's when the light bulb went off for me to think, OK, I need to learn more about cryptocurrency. And then, as you know, Lisa and I just studied it every day since. Yes. <laughs> so that's how we got started. You guys did very well. You guys have, have passed the class. <laughs> <laughs> right. Justin, what about you? Yeah, so my crypto journey and roots really traces back to 2013. Um, I was attending Florida Atlantic University at the time. And, uh, you know, like most college students, I didn't have too much money or capital. So I'm over here in my college dorm uh, researching stocks. I'm just like, man, what, what are some stocks I can get into that's just going to you know, make me wealthy, make me rich one of these days? And I don't know how um, I stumbled across uh this forum talking about Bitcoin while researching stocks and it immediately caught my interest. And I was just like, Oh, okay. Bitcoin never heard of it. It seems like a really interesting concept, like something revolutionary and new. Um, so ever since I had read that form and I can't remember the website, but I was intrigued and I stopped looking at stocks because I was just so intrigued with what crypto was and what Bitcoin was. So I did a little bit more research, you know, I ended up buying uh, just a tad bit of Bitcoin very little bit of Litecoin. I remember when Litecoin was like less than $5. Bitcoin at the time was around like $400. I also bought some other altcoins like Feathercoin and all these things back in 2013. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, I just got my toe, got my toes wet, just tested the waters, did not properly secure any of my crypto at the time. I had no clue what a cold storage was. There actually was not so many applications for Bitcoin at the time. Um, I lost everything that I bought. Like I even had a little bit of Dogecoin that I bought and then just, just <laughs> lost those keys, lost that wallet, that exchange no longer around. So I was just like, and then Mount Gox happened. That was the big story of the day, you know? And I was just like, you know what? I don't know. Maybe, maybe yes, I just invested in the wrong thing. So fast forward four years later, up until 2017, is when I really started getting uh, serious about investing in cryptocurrency. I'll never forget it. I was at the mall with my uh, with my wife now, um, and I just got this alert on my phone. It was just sitting. It was from CNN, out of all places. It was just like it reported Bitcoin hits four thousand dollars, and like I'm looking at this and my jaw's dropping because years ago I remember when the price was four hundred dollars. And now I'm getting news feed that is 4,000, like my jaw's dropping. It's just like WTF, like what happened? Well, how did I miss this? Like, oh my gosh, I got to do something right now. So what did I do? I, you know, invested oh, much more money than I had previously into the market. This was, keep in mind, October 2017. So this was on the tail end of that bull cycle right there. And I was able to see my portfolio, my initial investment gain exponentially. And, you know, within months, I'm just like, man, I'm up four or 500%. This is insane. But what happened? Well, that December, Bitcoin tops $20,000, and it was going to be the start of a nice long crypto bear market. So I see my initial investment go all the way up, and I, I'm thinking this is just great. Like, it's going to last forever. Things are going to be fine. And it totally wasn't because it came up, and it came all the way down, and I didn't make a dime. And at that time, we had ICO mania, and it wasn't 
it wasn't so it was not uncommon where you see people turning a hundred dollars into a couple thousand dollars or even a thousand dollars into well over ten thousand dollars i didn't i didn't capitalize on any of that so ever since then ever since i seen what happened to my portfolio and that extreme volatility is what really got me interested in you know chart reading understanding crypto more technical analysis market psychology like what moves markets because I just remember, I just, I was just intrigued. I'm just like, there's got to be a way to better enter the market and better time when you should be getting out of the market. Um, so after 2017, I uh, lived out that long bear market. Fortunately, I, I was still in crypto and I still had a lot of conviction in it. Did a lot of accumulation around 2018 into Bitcoin, ETH and some other altcoins that performed extremely well. Um, going up until the next bull cycle. And, um, you know, come November 2020, uh, yeah, November 2020 got laid off. And, you know, I was just like, you know, I had my crypto. I started a channel on trading view and just started from zero, just talking about my opinions, where I thought certain coins were going, like the shifts in the market and built a following. And that's how Nina discovered me. I don't know how. She, she came across one of my articles <laughs> and then we talked and ever since it's just been, uh, I've been passionately uh, involved with crypto too, to just spreading the good gospel of crypto and preaching how, you know, Bitcoin trading, cryptocurrency, these are, this is all freedom right here. This is true freedom. So that's part of my journey right there. <laughs> awesome. I, the one thing I liked it, uh, you, uh, about your story is that you, you talked about the highs and the lows of like, you know, the, the journey where, you know, you, you go to a, a moment where you actually quit and then you come wow. back. And that is such a uh, reality in this space. You know, when you're in the trading journey, it's like I, I actually feel like until you have a major failure, you're not really a trader <laughs> because, yeah. uh, you know, it's a there's not just this, this easy road to success. It's like, you know, that failure makes you really think about what does it mean to be a trader? And then you um, you really figure out like and, and that's what kind of motivated you. I need to basically, uh, you know, start focusing on the charts, you know, and, and it's all the failures that kind of motivate you to get there. So I thought that was very cool. Um, really quick, um, I guess one last question before we go to the technical, um, you know, indicator section is the uh, what any prerequisites um, that you would recommend that people um, look into before if they wanted to start trading, what prerequisites would you recommend? I, for me, I would just say mindset is the number one thing and don't get too emotional. Um, you know, especially when the news or the FOMO, I've definitely lost money and that is to be expected. If you go into crypto thinking you're never going to lose any money, that's just really ignorant and it's just part of the cost of your crypto education. So just mentally prepare. All right. That's easier said than done, but yes, I agree with that advice. <laughs> Very like you just kind of said that, like, oh yeah, just don't get emotional. Like we're just like, yeah, 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 yeah. But you know that is that is very, very very hard what she just said to do like don't get emotional you probably will get emotional then you'll realize in hindsight you should have just listened to her and not got emotional but that's very good advice but very hard to follow go ahead justin yeah <laughs> Woo! there's a couple of them <laughs> number one thing i'd say there's a couple i'm gonna give you give the panel here a couple and all of our uh, audience here trust in your indicators trust your indicators your indicators do not become emotional so you know, that takes away the emotional aspect. Just trust your indicators for one, the, whatever you're using, trust it because it does not come emotional. Uh, and two, definitely have uh, separate your trading firms from your long-term investment funds, from your, you know, your living expenses. You have to separate those, do not intertwine them. Um, the third one is going on to the emotions. Uh, really understand for people that are trading is that you, traders have two battling emotions typically. It's either fear and greed. It's either you're too fearful or you're too greedy. And both of them will not make you any money because if you're too fearful, you're not going to want to take a position, so you're going to miss out. If you're too greedy, you've taken a position, you've made some gains, which is great, but now you want more, so you don't end up taking profit, and you don't get more, and you just sit on it, and now you don't make money either. So if you're too fearful, if you're too greedy, it's going to be very difficult. Um, and these are this is part of trading psychology. It's like every day is a battle between fear and greed. Um, the th fourth one I'd say is look for confluence on indicators, meaning just don't rely on one indicator. 
look for multiple indicators that are telling you the same thing, whether or not, you know, a Bitcoin or an asset is just like, you know, way overbought or way oversold. We'll get into that later. Um, so fifth, don't focus on timing perfect tops or bottoms. You know, that, that's one of the things that's probably helped me back a lot is trying to just get that perfect top. Or if I can just get in at that perfect time, you're probably not going to time a perfect bottom. The goal is to get as close to the top or bottom. And the last thing I'd say is be patient. Man, be patient. If you do not have patience with your trades, you will get wrecked. You will. You have to be patient and you have to have a plan. And trading is a, is very much an emotional discipline. So we're going to talk about those emotions a lot. Okay. okay. Um, so now I think we want to move to uh, trading pairs, Nina. Is that uh, – are we ready for that? Yeah, we can go um, ahead and play this video. Okay. Um, it's – it's a strategy that works really well where you actually don't have to put additional money into the market to gain more market share. And so I just put a video together to visually explain it. Check it out. All right. Trading the pair. Over the bull run, I saw a lot of people say that they wanted to take on a second job so they could buy more crypto. There's another way to gain more market share of a token with trading the pair. Trading pairs are two different cryptocurrency tokens. In this sample scenario, we will look at two made up tokens that have existed for more than two years and have volatility that is not the exact same. This could be because of a short delay or maybe they are opposite of each other. Mentally prepare. This entire trading strategy may be executed in minutes or over years. Please do not invest in anything you cannot afford to lose. The price of coin A is $10. The price of coin B is $20. The trading pair is A over B, which equals $10 over $20. 1 over 2 simplified. The ratio is 1 over 2 because the price of coin A is half the price of coin B. Imagine your wallet that you own. You own one coin B token for $20. Now using the trading pair A token over B token, you sell one B token worth $20 at the one over two ratio, and you buy two A tokens worth $20. Right now, you have the exact same value minus the trading fee. You may be wondering, why would you do that? Well, I'm going to show you. Then you wait patiently for the price of coin A to go above the price of coin B. Now the price of coin A is $20 and the price of token B is $10. Now we have a ratio of two over one because token A is two times more expensive than token B. The value of our wallet has just increased from $20 to $40. Many people cash out. That's an option or you can wait or trade the pair and sell two A tokens, which are $40 in value, and you can buy four B tokens. Now that you have four B tokens at $40 in value, congratulations. In this scenario, we have just 4X the amount of tokens owned. When trading the pair, traders are not shaken by short-term volatility and are only focused on acquiring more tokens without having to put additional money into the market. nice all right so uh that's really i really like enjoy that video it's interesting like watching someone explain something that, that i kind of that i do but i um sometimes you don't really you you kind of move so fast that you you realize that explaining it to somebody you have to really break it down so like these videos are really um you know as you're trying to understand 
pairs trading. That's one of the best videos I've seen. <laughs> and, you know, you start start from the very beginning, learn as much as you can. Uh, so, um, all right, so we're going to go to Justin. Justin, you're going to um, go through a uh, uh, one of the technical sure. indicators just to give us an idea of what it looks like. Absolutely. I'm going to share my screen here, and I hope everybody could see this. So I'm sharing right now. Let me see that one. So, oh, boy. There we go. All right, so let me know. I hope everybody just give me a yay, a yay if you could see this chart right here. Hope everybody can right now. So real yeah. quick, briefly, um, I'm going to just share one indicator. Then Now, there's many that I use. Um, you know, but I'm, we only have time to talk about one. I could talk about this for hours. Uh, that's going to be the stochastic RSI. This is what I take with me and pretty much on all my trades. Now, a couple things here that I want people to really understand about how prices move in markets. Prices move just like waves. It's a wave. Just like, <laughs> just like we say here at Crypto Tutors, because that's really what it is. The way prices move in markets, whether it's crypto stocks, whatever, is in waves. So one one way to measure you know where our wave is at we got to discuss the anatomy of a wave this is why we use the rsi if you can notice and the rsi stands for relative strength index if you can notice these this rsi down here it moves very squiggly like just like waves in an ocean right now this is nothing new because uh you know the wave theory was actually developed by ralph uh, ralph nelson elliott back in the 1930s he's known for elliott wave theory but what are we trying to do? So let's quickly talk about the anatomy of a wave. We have a trough right here, you know, because uh, the trough of a wave is the bottom. Then we have a peak or a crest in nautical terms, which is the top. And in between that, we have momentum building up to the top. Now, what am I trying to say here? Is that, you know, we want to get used to looking at troughs and peaks because the, the, what we're trying to do here is increase the probability or likelihood that we're going to get a move to the upside or a downside. So to really end this, um, when we're in the stochastic RSI below the 20 here, we're in this trough zone. So when we're in here, that means the price movement for this time frame has already lost its momentum and now it's you know troughed out. So now when we're over here at a trough, we have a probability that going up you know, we have a much more likelihood, not saying that we're going to go up 100 percent, 5 percent or even 10 percent. We just have a better likelihood of going up. Similarly to when we're at the crest or at the top, our momentum has already gained steamed and is already maxing out. So when we're above the 80 here on the stochastic, this is what we like to say when it's overbought. So now the probability of uh, price movement going to the downside has a greater likelihood since that wave has already taken off and crested. And then what happens? The process repeats itself over just like waves do. So I wish I had more time to really talk more about this, but we're running short on time. But that is, this is by far one of the indicators that I love using most in crypto is understanding wave oscillators and wave movements, looking for those patterns. Awesome, man. Well, thanks a lot, Justin, for giving us a, just a little bit of a, a snippet of like uh, what we um, the education we provide on our, our YouTube channel and at Crypto Tutors. Um, if you want to get uh, more personalized um, tutoring, you can go to CryptoTutors.com, get one on one tutoring. Uh, we basically tutor all topics and we can talk about this for hours, as Justin said. Um, but we are running short on time, so we want to go ahead and uh, pass it back to, to over to Lisa. And continue moving on but uh thanks for everybody for uh you know uh viewing our um th this panel much love much peace well right. thank you so much later hey no commercial break no <laughs> okay <laughs> I've got the crypto for the culture thing over my face. I don't know if you guys can see that. <laughs> oh, man. Can I tell you? Really? We've been going at it since o'clock today. It's just been back to back to back to back to back to back to back. So, you know, we're not letting the energy abate. We're not letting the enthusiasm, the excitement, or any of that um, fall by the wayside. We're, we're super excited to be hosting each of you. And I'm going to get into um, all the dope you're building. <laughs> 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 I'm going to get into that. 
But I just wanted to take a moment, you know, uh, now that we're back here to welcome each of you to Crypto for the Culture. Uh, the theme this year is DeFi, all odds. I've been talking about this throughout the course of the day. Um, being, you know, DeFi being dual meaning and that, you know, going against this, you know, economic downturn, going against, uh, you know, challenges that that may prevent us from, you know, even getting that next opportunity, that next job. Um, but also it, decentralized finance, right? And, and that's why we brought each of you here today. Um, our speakers are going to be talking about crypto rewards and how living your everyday life, you're able to be rewarded, to be compensated. And, you know, we're going to start off, and I've been doing this for all of our panelists. So I'm going to give each of you your flowers, uh, as the kids say. So we'll start off with Crystal Quick. You know, uh, you're, you're a repeat. You're a repeat. This is two years in a row that you've been at. Yup, yeah, yup. Yeah. Last year you were in Singapore. This year in London. Uh, yeah. Two years in a row at Crypto for the Culture. But, um, you know, it might be a new, a new city, a, a new country, but it's still the same Crystal. And she's still Forbes under 30. So y'all better recognize. <laughs> oh, no, thank you. Thank you so much. It's a great honor to be here. And, you know, we're a very, very small company. So grateful for the support. And, you know, thanks for having us again this year, uh, you know, at uh, Crypto for the Culture, literally. So very, very excited. So yeah, my name is Crystal. I'm the co-founder of Bolt Global. Uh, started a company five years, 252 days ago. I'm not counting, not quite yet. <laughs> and uh, we've, oh, thank you. Uh, so we've basically built the YouTube of Web three, uh, and we've also integrated uh, the Binance uh, wallet within our own ecosystem as well. So basically content creators and their community members can send gifts. We call it gift bolts basically uh, to each other. And we're trying to cut out as much of the middlemen as possible, trying to incentivize and educate people to basically uh, tip their favorite creators directly without you know, Apple or Google really getting in the way. So we had a great ecosystem or we work with partners like Hisense as well, which is a smart TV manufacturer. Our apps are pre-installed, you know, across uh, the African markets, very fortunate about education. And that's why, you know, of course, meeting Lisa and Nina last year, it really spoke to my heart because I do fundamentally believe in the power of education and empowerment. Yay! So that's why we're all here today. And thank you so much for having me. And hello to Abigail, Chris, Pietro as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Crystal. Well, Abigail, um, you know, you're the product manager. You're working on the Gemini credit card, Gemini. Um, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background as well? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Abigail Wessel. I'm the lead product manager um, for the credit card over at Gemini, um, working on really bringing the product to launch um, from when I joined uh, to scaling the product, which is what we're doing now. Um, I have built a career in large scale product launches, um, spent the better part of a decade at Citibank, actually, um, launching products such as the double cash card, uh, Costco, uh, as well as the uh, city custom cash card, um, decided to switch over to um, the crypto side of the house. I saw that there was a lot of opportunity there, was really excited about the value, pro the core value prop of the Gemini credit card, which, which had already been created. Um, when I made the jump um, and was just really excited about um, the credit card as an avenue to get to bring to onboard really people who might not be as familiar with crypto into the new asset class, which is something that I'm very passionate about. Um, so I've been at Gemini for about a year and a half. I'm really excited about uh, the trajectory of the company and the product, um, kind of where we've come from and where we're going. Um, and I'm really excited to be speaking on this panel today. Thank you so much for having me. We couldn't do it. Without, we could not do it without people like you, Abigail. So welcome to crypto, as Arthur Hay said. I don't know if you saw that earlier. To the culture, um, in case the kids are watching, you know, I have to like you know censor myself. <laughs> um, awesome. Well, let's move over to Pietro, my neighbor here in Miami. Like we literally live around the block. Uh, who's the director of crypto partnerships at the Giving Block? Speaking about the block, you know, we got blockchain. We got the giving <laughs> It all works itself out pretty well. Uh, thank you guys so much for having me. Yeah, I'm the director of partnerships at The Giving Block. And what we do is we help nonprofits uh, accept crypto donations and help crypto holders and users donate to their favorite causes. So 
what that looks like is we've actually been uh, fortunate enough to work with over 2,000 nonprofits currently, and over the past year have raised over $100 million in crypto philanthropy. So we're giving back to the culture, supporting those in need, and really um, trying to empower folks that might not know crypto to take a shot at it, especially in the philanthropic space where it might be a little daunting. We try to make it as easy and simple for anybody looking to give or accept a crypto donation to make that possible. And um, we're super thrilled to be working with Crypto Tutors and uh, very excited to chat with the rest of the panelists here. Welcome, Pietro. We're super excited to uh, share you and the amazing work that you're doing at the Giving Block with the Crypto Tutors um, and crypto culture community. So thank you for that. Now, Christopher Uramain, you like how I did that, right? Because you spoke <laughs> phonetically, you were like, okay, this is how you pronunciate my name. Okay, did I say it right? Yeah, you're pretty close, let's say. Oh, I'll work on it. I'll get better with time, I promise. Um, Christopher, you are the CFO and the COO of Coin Miles. So tell us a little bit about you and uh, you know the work that you're doing at Coin Miles. Yeah, definitely. So first of all, very excited to be here, part of the panel. I think we've got a great, great group here. Um, so yeah, CFO, COO. So I'm an accountant by trade. Um, so a bit, bit more kind of the, the boring background, but no, got immersed into the crypto scene with, with Coin Miles. Um, so we are a crypto rewards app, as simple as that. Our goal is really to allow people to earn rewards on their everyday purchases. Uh, so we work with a variety of brands. We're over a thousand partners online, the, the Walmarts, the Nikes, Indigos, you know, big brands that people will recognize that they could shop on if they're buying their items on a daily basis. And then now they're earning cryptocurrency on there. So, um, we found it's a good way for you people to get exposed to cryptocurrency without having to go through a lot of the hoops that are typically involved with it. Um, people who want to get an exposure and eventually learn how you can kind of, you know, the, the benefits of cryptocurrency. So um, I, I guess I'll stop there as, as kind of a brief introduction, but I'm, you know, like I said, very excited to, to talk about more about you know, the crypto rewards scene. It's, uh, it's growing pretty quickly. I love how each of you spoke about how, you know, the rewards like approach is helping people learn about crypto, you know, like people hear crypto, they hear blockchain, they hear DeFi, and they're so intimidated and so kind of, you know, apprehensive. Uh, but when they're doing regular everyday activities, whether that be donating to their favorite charities or, you know, shopping at Sephora, you know, the idea of getting rewarded for these activities is such a great way to just kind of ease people into the space. And so um, I, I want to just throw out a few questions that apply really to each of you um, and whomever wants to go first, uh, by all means, can each of you share how the reward process works? So you're each in different domains, right? But it would be really helpful for folks to just get an understanding of, um, you know, how to get started at a coin miles or what they need to do to get access to the Gemini card and how can they can be rewarded there. And Crystal, you know, whether it be ads that were compensating people for watching um, or, you know, Pietro with the nonprofits you support facilitating the process of getting them crypto. So can each of you just take a moment or two to just walk us through how it works at your respective organ? Sure. I get, I'm going to, I'll jump in there. Uh, sorry, there we go. Um, yeah, so for on our app, it, it's basically you use a credit card that you already have. So you download the Coin Miles app, you'll see a list of all our partners, a lot of brands that everybody's familiar with. I use the example of Nike, let's say. Um, so you'll go through the Coin Miles app, you'll get redirected to Nike's website. So I think nowadays, especially with COVID, everybody's used to shopping online. We all are all familiar with that whole process. Um, so you would shop on Nike's website like you normally would. You would check out, you would pay with a credit card, any credit card you want. Um, what we have, we have, you know, um, agreements with our partners that we get a commission from them and so we share that commission with with our user base so that they could then earn that in in, in uh, crypto um so the the, the 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 saying is if you could buy a pair of nikes online you can earn crypto it is kind of up what we apply here is really that you shop you know as you normally would and almost like magic you'll see the, the transaction in your wallet so it's pretty a pretty seamless process Love it, because who doesn't want to get rewarded for doing the things that they do just every day? So thank you for that, Chris. Abigail, I know you have uh, some thoughts. Yes. Um, yeah. So for the Gemini credit card, 
um, all you all you have to do is is really sign up for the card, which is a pretty uh, seamless experience. And then the way that the card works, it's just like any other credit card. Um, and a majority of um, a large majority of Americans have have credit cards in their wallets and use those um, credit cards multiple times a day. Um, the way that our credit card works is that you earn three percent on dining, two percent on groceries, and one percent on everything else. And instead of cash back or miles, um, it's crypto back. Um, and those rewards are instant, which is actually kind of an industry game changer. Not um, any other credit card does it. So a win for, for us, a win for crypto. And I think um, having instant rewards is especially important um, when you're talking about crypto where things change um, and things are quite fluid. Um, and so with those instant rewards, um, one of the other benefits um, that actually ties, I think, very well into kind of the educational component um, is that you can change your rewards at any time, right? We like to say, oh, you can earn Bitcoin for breakfast, ETH for lunch, Doge for dinner. Um, and you can do that like any, there's no cap on kind of like however many times you want to change your reward. You could literally do it like every minute if you wanted to. Um, and what that means is that customers and cardholders can really explore um, different uh, crypto tokens, different things that they might be interested in, in a very risk-free way, right? Like this is a very easy way to dip your toes in. You're not um, investing all of your money. You're you're earning rewards on things that you're purchasing, things that you would, you would be buying anyway. Um, and if you don't already have an exchange account with Gemini, um, which is where your rewards go, um, we actually sign you up for one in the application process. There are no additional steps that you need to take to do so. Um, and if you already do have a, an exchange account on Gemini, uh, we link those seamlessly. Um, so it really is a very easy way um, for customers to start earning crypto rewards and start um, to start learning about. Because I do believe that the at least uh, this this was kind of my process when I started investing. When I started um, really kind of taking that first step, that was how I learned. Um, I think it's a very practical way um, to start to experience crypto. Awesome, thank you for that, uh, Crystal Pietro. Um, I can go first because I think Pietro has a very inspiring story and he we should save literally with no offense to anyone the best for last we'd love to hear the hundred million dollar story literally um, no I mean we we work for our users you know we work for the creative economy I mean what we're really doing right now is to kind of build a platform that empowers and allows anyone and everyone um, to create freely you know and to be rewarded for that you know, right i mean i was just thinking about it just looking at this panel today literally every single person here we are so creative you know lisa you use a comma to distinguish lisa your name and crypto tutors abigail it's a hyphen i'm doing a you know sort of a parenthesis sort of thing and you know everybody's sort of different in the way they express you know how they want to put their company name after their name you can see within this panel itself the way we express our identity is already different so a lot of people out there you know say you know in the frontier markets you know in um different cultures right they are dying to be heard literally i would say and that's why you know i think diversity culture and celebrating that is so important and the one good thing about crypto i think is it allows for anyone and everyone to be an equal participant you know I mean, the one big thing that I've always felt, you know, very strongly about is the idea of the underbanked, right? And a lot of creators out there, because of how YouTube and Twitch are like, you know, you can only cash out after you've made your first hundred bucks, US dollars. And if you can, if, and if you have a minimum of 1000 subscribers, you can start earning. And I, and I feel like that isn't very fair to anyone who's just really starting out. I mean, YouTube is no longer a place to post funny videos from your bedroom. It's just become a giant warehouse of video storage, right? And it rewards the very top. So we're trying to do it in our own small ways. And of, of course, we're not Google and I'm clearly not Sergey Brin, but I think crypto really helps to kind of uh, democratize that in our own little way. So yeah, I mean, you know, uh, viewers can get uh, tokens and rewards, you know, from watching ads, um, you know, uh, creators can get tips and gifts. We also run campaigns to kind of spur and cheer on, you know, different creative campaigns throughout the ecosystem. So, yeah, that's what we do. Awesome. Yeah, I think there's uh, like a thematic trend across what everybody's saying, which is like when you leverage the power of crypto and the blockchain really, and take your activity that you might be doing in your daily life on chain, that there are rewards and benefits to doing that. Um, some because uh, the technology is, you know, arbitraging away some inefficiencies. We see that a lot in the nonprofit space. Um, Crystal mentioned unbanked 
uh, individuals. Well, we also think of like underfunded organizations like nonprofits, for example, that really are looking to bridge the gap uh, and find new demographics of people that might want to participate in giving or people who are giving already, but want to add, you know, a little more flair and excitement to that process, right? Uh, traditionally, many of us might send a credit card, ACH or check in the mail to our favorite charity. Um, but what does that really do for you, right? Sure, you feel good about it. Um, but, you know, in the sense of donor rewards, right, depending on the way that you might donate, there might be PO apps or NFTs associated with like public statements of your contribution or participation, which you can then leverage on your social media and create community around. Um, those are really exciting opportunities, you know, for the nonprofits themselves. They also get to expand into something that's entirely new. Right. So in terms of reward, it's like, you know, your your traditional donor base might be 65 to 75 on average in terms of age. Now you're talking to millennials, Gen Z, the future builders, movers and shakers of this industry. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, those of us who've been fortunate enough to participate in crypto, um, might have a little bit of money set aside to be able to participate in giving back and, and fund that next level of uh, education and adoption that I think you guys are doing a fantastic job of ushering in as well. Awesome. Thank you for that, Pietro, because, you know, I was going to ask you um, to share a, an example or a story of, you know, one of your favorite nonprofits that you've been able to work with. <laughs> You don't have to say I see one in the room. You don't have to, <laughs> yeah. You don't have to say yeah. It's fine. It's fine. No, but I mean, I think that you hit the nail right on the head in relation to just providing, um, you know, talking the language of, you know, the millennials and, you know, the Gen Z. This is this is their language. And so being able to meet them where they're at um, is is awesome, especially for altruistic causes. Uh, so thank you for that. Now, Abigail, let's uh, circle back to you. What are some of the unique features of the Gemini credit card? You know, you talked a bit about being able to choose your your crypto, you know, how you want to be rewarded. Tell us, let's dive into um, some of the unique aspects of, you know, the Gemini card versus other credit cards on the market. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so and I can deep dive a little bit more into the um, into the rewards portion to start um, and and kind of explain how you know, switching between rewards works. We actually have a really uh, seamless uh, user experience where when you log on um, to your Gemini app, the credit card is uh, one um, item in the in the bottom fold. You click on that and then your credit card comes up um, and you can choose uh, view rewards or change rewards, right? You change it, you see a selection of, we actually have 60 plus rewards, close to 70 rewards, um, crypto rewards that you can choose from. Um, and it's as simple as selecting it, right? You just, you click it and you say, hey, all right, I'm earning ETH right now. Let's see, I, I kind of am more interested in mana, right? You click on that um, and it changes your next purchase. It could literally be within seconds. You could be in the checkout line um, and someone's asking for your card. You swipe, you, um, you know, NFC and um, that's it. You earn mana on that purchase. And so that's that's how, you know, that's how it works. Um, it's as easy as just clicking, clicking one selection um, in our app. One of the, uh, one, which is, which is, I think, also really important when you're talking about instant rewards. Everything about our card, um, and I think this is a differentiator for us, um, is, is to flexibility, right? Like it speaks to, all right, our consumers want that flexibility. Our consumers want to determine how, our cardholders want to determine how they are using their card. Um, and flexibil flexibility is a huge part of that, right? Being able to select your rewards plays into that. Um, it's also a zero dollar annual fee card. So all of the services that we're providing to the customer um, are, are at no, no annual fee, which I think is really key, especially when you're talking about kind of like a, we have a sleek, I have an example. I brought a prop. Oh, it's my actual credit card, not a prop. Um, but it's a stainless steel credit card, right? So it's sleek. That isn't something you traditionally get with zero dollar annual fee. It's also no foreign transaction fees. So you can travel internationally not get charged a fee on that. That's also pretty uncommon when you're talking about a $0 annual fee card. But I really do think that those are kind of ancillary to me. I do believe that um, that the reward structure, the instant rewards, and the fact that consumers can choose which rewards they want to earn at whatever given time, um, I think that is a key differentiator for our product and one um, that we continue to build off of. We're adding rewards every month. Thank you for that. Um, and you're hundred percent correct. People love options, love the 0%, you know, fee. Like that is something that people don't realize all of the hidden fees there are. Um, and, and, you know, segueing to, to you, Chris, 
let's talk a little bit more about coin miles. You know, I mean, I got introduced, um, you know, I think it was like I was uh, incentivized because, you know, I order a lot of food at this time. It was like Uber Eats. And I was like, oh, OK, perfect. Like you're going to pay me for doing that, which I do on like a daily basis. Great. You know, um, and so would love to just learn a little bit more about you connecting the dots, you know, you recognizing that there was a place for uh, rewards in in the crypto arena. Like what led you to connect those dots? It's funny you said because at the beginning of the of the, the introduction, we talked about the DeFi and the whole uh, the theme around you know, inflation is one of them. Right. And that's so relevant right now that it's something that. Um, you know, regular cash back doesn't provide a, 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 a call it a hedge against, right? And so where, where crypto and, and Bitcoin in particular is kind of known out there as being, the, you know, anti-inflationary. But uh, what we think in there is that there's a way to earn rewards at a, and, and Abigail mentioned this too, it's, there's no investment to, to, to our users, right? So it's, it's, we'll call it risk-free. So you have the upside to also benefit from as the price of Bitcoin, I use Bitcoin as a, as a main example, as it goes up, well, all of a sudden, if I earned $2 on my on my Nike purchase, and a year from now, Bitcoin is double, and I might not turn into four, and, and you know, it's exponential growth. Um, and something that, that that's pretty important to, to, our, to our user base that, yes, they may seem like small amounts at a time, a dollar here on your Uber Eats order, but with the, the accumulation of your day-to-day -day purchases, with the accumulation of the value of Bitcoin increasing, all of a sudden, after a year, you, you could be using it substantial rewards that effectively have paid for their purchase itself, right? All of a sudden your, your Nikes have been paid for in your rewards. So it's something that we think, you know, especially now in, in the current environment that people are starting to realize a bit more, like how do I find other ways to, um, I don't want to use the word protect myself, but really kind of stay ahead of the curve. And so, you know, cryptocurrency and, and crypto rewards is one of the, the, the key ways that we think is, is that you could do that in, in, in an easy environment. I love that because, you know, again, in the vein of just uh, the times that we're living in and the fact that, you know, you know, people are losing their jobs, you know, people are looking for, you know, alternatives. I think earlier we spoke about there being two billion people even unbanked, you know, like like the way that you all are building in this ecosystem in a way that lends itself to, you know, really driving that notion of like self-sovereignty, the fact that you can make purchases as you normally do, but then the rewards could literally wipe out the entire, you know, purchase that you made. Um, mm -hmm. Like these are extremely novel concepts that are, are new and exciting and also speak to just how important it is to learn about this space. So with that being said, I mean, you know, I would love to just hear from each of you as to, um, you know, what, what's coming next? What's on the horizon for the giving block? What's on the horizon for both, Gemini and coin miles. I'm happy to start since you said our, our name first. Yeah, yeah I think ahead. as far as what's on the horizon, I think, you know, we're tapping into the energy of crypto participants, which is while they learn, educate themselves, participate, potentially make money in the space, they're always thinking about what comes next. And oftentimes that means giving back to somebody that might have inspired them, a cause that they care about local, foreign, domestic, doesn't matter. Um, I think that's exciting. What we're trying to usher in is a new wave of, uh, of giving for nonprofits that are constantly struggling to meet their obligations to, their, um, to the, the people that they serve. Uh, and I think, you know, in the future, you'll see more of us, uh, ideally, you know, in your day-to-day -day life, as you think about how you might give back. Um, we're gonna be doing a lot of partnerships with the great folks like at Crypto Tutors, NFT platforms, you know, incorporating uh, roundups, give back features, et cetera, all over the place. And what we want to do is showcase that what, when you get into crypto, you know, it's not like what you hear with the FUD every day. It's not people participating in illegal activity, right? It's actually the nonprofits you know and love and recognize doing good things. Um, and we want to tell that story and, and really share that wealth with everybody else who needs it. Who's next? Because I don't want to talk because I want to make sure you guys. <laughs> get to I guess I'll, I'll go then next. Uh, I'll be uh, relatively quick as well. Um, so, yeah, two, two main themes for us is one, and it's kind of Abigail mentioned as well, is the different reward options. So we were actually on, on a, in a boot camp this week, have integrated a new, new blockchain in there to increase the ability for our users to select which rewards they want to earn, um, you know, get boosted rewards, things like that. All that that could encourage people to accumulate more. 
Um, and then on, on phase two is the root means to, and, and it's funny, PSO has mentioned this, it's, it's the nonprofit side. It's, for some people who are a bit more wealthy, who have a bit more spending habits, they can accumulate a few dollars for them. It, it, it has less of an impact, but then they can now have that ability to transfer that to a nonprofit organization or to have it being used somewhere else, even though for them, you know, $5 in rewards may, may not have as much of an impact. So we are putting in that, that angle as well as we're starting to scale up and see more, more and more, um, you know, balances being accumulated. So I think it's, it's quite exciting to see all the, you know, the things that are coming up in the next uh, little while for CoinMouth. Ladies, all right. I can I can go next. Um, I'll I'll also be quick. Um, yeah, a couple of things that we're focused on um, over at Gemini um, is, uh, is is creating kind of cross um, cross platform growth. I think one of the things, and this ties into again that educational um, aspect of why crypto rewards I think are so important. Um, we just ran an NFT promo um, for new and existing customers um, with our um, platform Nifty Gateway. Um, so that customers who weren't as familiar maybe with the NFT space um, could experience that as well. They got an NFT after spending a certain amount of money um, over the course of a month. Um, we're looking to do more kind of cross-functional promotions like that um, and things that really excite a consumer base um, in a multitude of ways. Uh, we're also focused on bringing new features um, that are beyond table stakes onto the product. Um, so looking forward to uh, to building those out, to launching the ones that are um, kind of already in progress um, over the next few quarters um, to, again, surprise and delight our cardholders and bring more people onto the platform so that more people can earn those crypto rewards. Okay, surprise and delight. Love to see it. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. It's coming soon. <laughs> and close this out, Crystal. No, thank, thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, so I, I'll keep mine short as well. So we're just really focused on, you know, mass adoption because we think we're just really in the very early days, I think, you know, of what the digital asset industry could be. I mean, we're just barely scratching the surface. And what I would say is that the big mass use case where anyone and everyone can be delighted and rewarded, I think it would be a combination of all the work that we're all doing here, whether it's rewarding, education, empowerment, media, entertainment, we all have to collaborate with each other and support each other. So we're looking to collaborate with the best in class partners with the same spirit. We're looking to onboard as many creators as we can to spread the mission and to help our partners along the way. That's what we want to do for the next 12, 16 months, as long as it will take us, really. I love that. Well, you know, thank you for to each of you for taking the time to speak about what you're doing at Coin Miles, Gemini, Bolt Plus, the Giving Block, uh, in the rewards arena. This has been a very thought provoking conversation. Um, we have resources where folks can learn more about what's going on in each of your worlds as we've, as we've compiled um, resources and related to each of your organizations. And, you know, we thank you for your time, for your genius and the inspiration to keep building. We need brilliant minds like you. And thank you for also creating space and opportunity for underrepresented communities. We um, are con we're celebrating and elevating you every step of the way. And, you know, uh, we're going to keep it rocking. We're going to keep it rolling. So uh, maybe we'll see you next year. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Looking forward to it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. thank you for hosting this. This is great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Tell all your friends. <laughs> Welcome to Crypto Tutors. Crypto Tutors. Crypto Tutors. Crypto Tutors. Hey. It's a way. Making money in my sleep? Making money in my sleep. Step by step, click by click. Waves, Bitcoin, stable coin, we got the tips. Bitcoin or BTC, a trillion dollar CAP. Don't sleep on cryptocurrency, just make some money while you sleep. Yeah, it's the two trillion dollar market cap for me. It's a wave, but this ain't no game. Stop for AMC. D5 is where you need to be. Why? Because centralized systems keep them fees high. Talking D high, maybe even neck high. But we fly, learn, and invest, and you'll see why. Your money, your time, don't
Oh my gosh, are we like, this is one of the last sessions of the day. It's mind boggling to think that we've been going since 12 o'clock um, because we've had so many incredible speakers from amazing organizations that are literally architecting and engineering the future. But I have to say, um, and this is like picking your favorite kid, which, you know, like you never want to do, but this panel, this panel right here, and I'm freezing because I'm so excited. Okay, let me stop moving. Um, let me try to contain myself. I am so very excited. This is our second all-female panel of the day, by the way. How often does that happen in, in, in Web3? Mm. Like, almost never. So this is super amazing. Um, but also, you know, the, the, the crypto for the culture, um, well, and thank you for joining us at Crypto for the Culture. This year's theme is DeFi All Odds. And, you know, bringing you all uh, to the virtual stage to talk about the work that you're doing uh, is incredible. And it's also, you know, free 99. So all of the people that are out there, you better make sure that you are, you know, giving all of our speakers their flowers for imparting their wisdom. And, you know, as I've done with everyone, I'm going to just give folks a little bit of background on each of you. I want them to understand, again, just how... When I say awesome, I think that people use that word really lightly. When I say awesome, when I say incredible, some of the most brilliant minds in Web3, this is what I mean. So we're going to start with Nyla Hayes. Nyla Hayes is a phenomenon. She is 13 years old. This is as close to the to the long necky that I could I could get Nyla. Like I was trying to like, you know what I mean? Like get my neck, like, you know, I was trying to stretch it out. Um, I even put my hair back. I was like, maybe she can see. She can see. It looks amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but you're the creator of the Long Necky Collection, which features diverse women with elongated necks, uh, inspired by your favorite dinosaur, the Brontosaurus. Um, you are featured in Time for Kids, uh, discussing emerging tech that is NFTs. You're the first artist in residence at Time. And not for nothing, but your collection of NFTs uh, is one of the top grossing. I think it's something around $6 million for the long neckies, um, you know, in, in terms of African-American NFT artists. So that, I, look, I know I said the same thing, girl. I see you shaking. you like, mm -hmm. Emily is like, yeah, wow. I told you, phenomenon. Each of you are phenomenon. But Nana, with that being said, it's safe to say that you're a li living legend. And I feel so honored and grateful to share you with the crypto for the culture community. So thank you. I know, right? Ah, we met on IG, just saying. Okay. Um, Maureen Marat is my Haitian sister from another mister. You were one of uh, the early believers in crypto tutors because I interviewed you on our uh, crypto couch, our YouTube show, where we were hosting diverse leaders, prioritizing diverse leaders in crypto, much like we're doing here at Crypto for the Culture, giving uh, folks like yourself an opportunity to share what you're doing in the, uh, the the Web3 world. And Maureen, you're a crowdfunding and J-O-B-S Act, a jobs act expert. Um, I had to spell it out. You're a lawyer in the state of New York, Florida, DC, and an entrepreneur with over 15 years of legal industry experience. Um, this is really exciting to have your, your perspective and the lens, the legal lens in relation to building in web three. So we're super happy to have you. Um, and you're Haitian, you know, you already know, you already know us. Up. I love you and Clev, Haitian sisters from other misters. Um, and Emily, hello, smart contractor, smart contract developer for Uniswap. Emily, before um, we get into your background, one thing that I have to call out about Uniswap is that I looked today, I think it had about like 1.2 trillion with a T trillion dollars in trade volume. Um, Emily, you majored in economics in 2011, discovered open source and Bitcoin that led you into becoming a web developer. But you discovered ETH was way more user friendly than Bitcoin and began focusing on smart contract development. Yes, am I, am I tracking? Emily, it's more like, developer friendly. I would say user friendly at this point. User friendly. Okay. Okay. That's see, that's me. We're all learning. Um, 
But the community aspect, you know, really resonated with you. And, you know, it's exciting to have you here. But Emily, before we dive into the conversation, I think it would be important for folks to um, just understand what is Uniswap? How oh, would you define her? Yeah, so Uniswap is a decentralized exchange as opposed to a centralized exchange. I feel like Coinbase is our good counterpart. Coinbase is a centralized exchange. And when you buy uh, Ether or Bitcoin or anything through, um, through Coinbase, they custody it. So they own the keys. You don't own the keys and you're trusting them just like you trust a bank. Um, so, and then when you trade, you're like, I want some Bitcoin for some Ethereum. They have their um, pools or like they have their funds on their treasury and they'll just kind of like change the numbers kind of on your interface and they kind of allocate more of what they have in Bitcoin to than Ethereum. Uh, whereas on um, Uniswap, um, we are a decentralized exchange on Ethereum. You cannot get Bitcoin on Uniswap, but you could get wrapped Bitcoin, which is like, a, you, you know, people can wrap Bitcoin on Ethereum and it's like kind of like a bridge situation. Um, and so when you trade on Uniswap, you are never giving up custody of your assets at any point. Um, our protocol, um, you put into a smart contract, you can verify how the code works, and you know that if you put your money into our contracts, um, how it will work and that you'll get what you need or what you're promised out because um, it's just, you know, code. Code is law, right? Like if you put your money into that, you know how it's going to operate. Um, and then we have liquidity providers um who provide liquidity um into these pools um and they know you know that everything will abide by the contract code and you basically trade across their liquidity so i might provide liquidity into uh, a pool for ethereum and uni token which is our token um and so whatever the ratio is as a liquidity provider you offer that ratio and then as i as people swap as you know if i want to swap uni to get um, ETH, I put uni into the pool, get some ETH out, and then the price of uni goes down um, as it becomes more scarce in the pool and the price of ETH goes up as it um, populates the pool. So it just kind of happens automatically without anyone in the middle doing anything. That was spoken like a true smart contract developer. Like, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, no, but thank you so much for just you know giving us that explanation because I just wanted to give people a little bit of an understanding so that they in the questions that I ask, you can like wrap their heads around, again, like the orders of magnitude associated with like what you're working on at Uniswap. Um, so thank you for that. So, you know, Nyla, um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, you and how you got your start. You know, you're a super famous NFT artist and one of the just sweetest, most kindest people I've ever <laughs> So did you like, you know, were you born an entrepreneur? Did you just like come out and just start selling like, I don't know, lemonade and, you know, I don't know. How did it work? But how did you get your start? Well, I would say everyone's born an entrepreneur. I feel like things happen in life that it changes your entrepreneurship. But I think when we're young, we all have this like creative mind and we want to do creative things. But then when we get into school or in work, people are trying to like change our mindsets and like, no, you can't do this. You have to do this, that, and the third. So I feel like everyone has like their own little creative mindset, but it just changes you know, over time because of life. But I think that didn't really happen to me because you know, one, I'm homeschooled and my mom is my teacher. So she's a very creative mind and she is really like open of like what I'm passionate about. So that's kind of like how I was when I was four as well. I was very passionate about just trying different things and, you know, just creating in general. And I, that's actually when I started doing art when I was four. And I just did arts and crafts at the time, but I was just really, really passionate about like doing different things. And I have to thank my mom for that because she was always like willing to help me with different things that I wanted to do. So I think that's kind of where my entre entrepreneurship kind of like started. And then in my family, we have a lot of men that are entrepreneurs in my family. And the thing that I really love about them is even though most of the things they tried failed, they kept trying and, you know, they're still entrepreneurs to this day. So 
I think those two things kind of inspired me to, you know, kept my entrepreneurship for my life. Even though when I was younger, I really didn't even know what an entrepreneur was. But, you know, now I think that's kind of like where it all stemmed from. But yeah, that's kind of how my mentality is with that. But then um, how I got started with art, like I was saying, was when I was four, I was just creating things and whatnot. And when I was nine, that's when I really got into like art and trying to figure out like my own style. So I remember it like it was yesterday. I was at my grandmom's house and I asked her, it was my first time ever having a phone. So it was my first time doing digital art. And I asked her, what should I draw? And she said, just draw what you love. So I tried to think of what I really liked at the time. And I loved the brontosaurus dinosaur. Yeah, I was a big dinosaur fan when I was growing up. I always was into dinosaurs rather than dolls. So the brontosaurus was my favorite. And then I loved culture. Culture always inspired me since I was young. I've been around different cultures through you know, fashion, music, and food. So that really inspired me. And then just being a female. I love being a woman. I've been around so many inspiring women in my life. So... I think those three things really inspired me to make my Law Neckies. And after that, that's when I kind of start creating them. And they turn into sort of a friend. Yeah, like a friend to me. And basically after that, I knew I kind of wanted to start selling my art or putting my art out there so people could see it. But I didn't know, like, what to do with my art. So I thought I was going to have to just put it in, like, a flea market or a... A museum or just like a festival but I, we really didn't figure out like what to do with it until my uncle um he texted my mom last year in March because my family knew I was doing art and was really into it so he was like you guys should check out nfts we I just saw something about nfts and I think you guys should try it out because maybe this is the place now look at our art out there and we were thought, okay, this sounds great. So we looked into like what an NFT was, what's the NFT space, how to mint, where you put an NFT on. And basically after that, it's been history. You know, we've been, me and my mom, we, we've been like in an amazing NFT community. We've met so many people in the space, you know, it's just been an amazing experience. And I can't believe it's almost been two years. So yeah, that's kind of, where I all, all that began. <laughs> and that is how you build in Web3, okay? Like, I love the fact that, first of all, I love your mom. I, we're gonna have to bring her back. I don't know if she's around, but tell her that I said hi. Yeah, uh, she and, loves you too. <laughs> okay, tell her, I, we all said thank you. Um, but I love the fact that like, you know, you, you know the, the childlike wonder that a child possesses and just this like anything is possible, like to see how that translated to, you know, you saying, what can I do with this art? You know, even the notion of what can I do with this art? Should I do, you know, festivals? Should I, should I, you know, galleries, museums, whatever? And then you were introduced to an entirely new concept, which was NFTs. And instead of saying, well, I don't know what that is and leaving it there, you were like, let me, your, you and your mom were like, let us understand what this is and how it works. And, you know, that's why it was so important for us to bring you into Crypto for the Culture building in Web3 because, you know, you did just that. And it's so cool that this is just the beginning of your story. Like we are just getting started. So thank you for that. Um, Maureen, I'm gonna pass the uh, virtual mic to you because we're talking about building in Web3. You know, Emily was talking about what's going on in the Uniswap ecosystem. Nyla was talking about the, the long necky NFT collection. Um, what advice do you have for founders and entrepreneurs building in Web3? from a legal standpoint? What are some things that they should be aware of? So great question. I wanted to say um, something that someone told me when um, Nyla was talking about um, some of her family members, you know, trying their hand at entrepreneurship, but kept going. Um, someone told me that entrepreneurs don't fail, we pivot. So if something doesn't work out, right, you figure out for some reason you get this energy in you, you're like, okay, it didn't work out. I'm going to try something else. So. Uh, I just wanted to share that. Um, but in terms of what people should be 
aware of or should know, I think the first thing is don't be afraid of the lawyers. They're not all out here to tell you no, <laughs> even though it might sound that way. Um, I mean, I'll admit that I guess training wise, um, we're trained to like find holes or find problems, but that doesn't mean that we only want you know, we want things to fail, right? We want them to do very well, which is why we look for where there might be potential, you know, issues or pitfalls. Um, the other thing I would say to entrepreneurs is that, um, especially around what we're talking about tonight and building in Web3, this is very uh, community um, and ecosystem building focused, right? So if this is not for you, then don't waste your time, right? I mean, I feel like there are definitely some people who come in thinking or at least telling us that they want to build in a community or ecosystem. And then you end up seeing like, you know, the same things that are happening outside of Web3. So it's like, that's not that's not what we're here for, right? We really want to build community, but we want to be inclusive. It's not to build a community so you can just bring the same people in. Um, and I guess the last thing I'll say in terms of advice is that, um, and maybe nobody wants to hear this, so this is why I'll say it last, <laughs> is that um, oftentimes when we say, oh, this regulator, so for a long time, especially during crypto winter, I guess we're kind of in crypto winter, but the last one, let's say, not this one, we were like, oh, the SEC and CFTC should provide, you know, red line rules and specific guidance and all that. And I don't think people realize what how restrictive, you know, red line rules and things like that can be. But at the same time, just because there aren't specific rules or specific um, provisions on how things should be done in the space doesn't mean there, there aren't rules or precedent or policies that still apply, even though it's not specific. So one example is the Howey test that's been beaten to death over and over again. You know, it's almost 100 years old. So yeah, maybe it's outdated. But if we take away the orange grove, take away land in Florida, and you just look at the elements, then you could see how they could look at that test and say, okay, these are the certain these are certain things that occurred during this transaction and how it could line up with a specific type of crypto transaction. Not that it happens every time, but I'm just saying, you know, just to try to show that there are comparisons and there are ways that, you know, we can see how, even though this is very innovative and very different, how um, laws that exist today can be applied. So the goal is not to skirt the law or to avoid it, but to kind of work within it. And office, oftentimes it's kind of good to be in the gray area because I think that's how you get the attention of the policymakers so that they can be more understanding as opposed to having this strict rule that no one can, you know, no one can navigate. Yeah, I love the fact that you called out, um, you know, a hundred year framework. <laughs> Right. No, but seriously, a hundred year framework, which is, you know, they could have just slapped it on, you know, crypto and been like, okay, we're done with this. It's regulated. But the reality is that that gray area is causing a lot of conversation, is causing a lot of discussion. And, you know, at the very least, uh, it's exciting that we're in a place where there's that conversation, that dialogue, that discourse is hopefully opening up minds to be more thoughtful with with the governance that is ultimately rolled out. We remains to be seen what it's going to look like, but right. um, we're 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 thankful that you shared that insight. Now, Emily, let me ask you this: um, you know, being a smart contract developer, uh, what are some of the coding languages that are the most important uh, and and common to build in Web three? I think we were talking about Solidity earlier, but let's talk a little bit about some of the technical um, skill sets required. Yeah, to become a developer in the space, and we have a lawyer, we have an artist, I guess I represent more the, more the developer side of software. Um, yeah, there's a couple different routes you can take. Um, so I am a Solidity developer, which is smart contracts, which I think is the fun, the really fun part. Um, and um, so I work on the Ethereum blockchain, and the Ethereum has something called the EVM, which is the Ethereum virtual machine, um, and Solidity compiles down to the EVM. Um, and there's a couple other languages that also couple, there's more than a couple. Um, there's a few others like Viper, which is probably the next most popular. People are working on something called Huff. 
Um, and so, yeah, there's this one thing to understand the language and then it's another thing to understand how the EVM works because there's a lot, lot of quirks with how like the Ethereum, you know, the lower levels of Ethereum function. Um, there's important concepts like reentrancy, which any language would have to deal with. Um, what, and reentrancy is what caused the DAO hack. There's one DAO hack. Um, and so there's a lot of, yeah, uh, really fun, cool stuff to dig into when you're learning about smart contracts and how the base layer blockchain works. Um, and yeah, it's, it's super low level. Uh, you, you cannot put anything unoptimized. Like, you know, when you're, when you're doing front end, you have to sort stuff and you just take a JavaScript sorting library. You know, you're not really paying attention. When you're, when you're putting in a smart contract, every iteration is cost money. And so you have to, you can't just, you, you would never sort on chain. That's just not something you would do. And so you have to learn, you know, how you, you know, separate things, put like, uh, intense computationally intensive things. How do you get those off chain and only put whatever you need on chain? There's a couple of really cool examples, but I don't want to talk too long. Um, but I'll, I'll say that. Uh, well, I really like the idea of a Merkle distribu distribution contract, which is what Uniswap did for their airdrop. Um, we like retroactively rewarded all of our past users with an allocation of our tokens. We wanted it to be a community token. Um, we had to scrape a lot of data and then we had to store on chain like who's owed what token and that's thousands upon thousands of people and that's way too expensive to store on chain storage you know every node has to hold it is super expensive um, and so what they did to keep that information on chain is use the merkle tree um, and then you need to only post like a 32 bits 32 bytes merkle root and then that filters down to a ton of leaf nodes which has the information for who's what uh, who's owed what amount of tokens based on their usage. Um, and then they we offer them on the front end a proof and they can submit a proof, Merkle proof to say what they're owned. And that's not a very popular pattern. And so, um, yeah, smart contract development gets super, you have to get really creative. You have to like optimize like crazy. Uh, it's super fun. There's also front end um, interacting with the blockchain instead of a database is different. And so if you're a front end developer, instead of, you know, knowing SQL and, you know, um, relational databases, you can learn different JavaScript libraries like Ethereum, which know how to store and pull data from the blockchain and interact with it. And that's another really useful skill that companies need. So, yeah, so two slides. Okay, first of all, Emily, I don't know if you know, but we're recruiting you to be the next crypto tutor. So there's that. Um, just so you know, it's coming. Actually, all of you, but uh, we'll take that offline. Um, to to and thank you for that uh that explanation that was super insightful um and it just gets me so excited because like you know i don't think that a lot of times folks get to see like you know female engineers like working on such unbelievable like tech and just to hear how excited you are i can just imagine you know the folks you know that that nyla you know that are nyla's age are just like oh my gosh like it's, it's normalized, you know, it's normalized to see people like you, Emily, to see people like you, Maureen, to see people like you, Nyla. And uh, to close us out, you know, to close us out, Nyla, I'm curious from, from your perspective, what advice would you give to, you know, um, a, a, another little girl who's watching this, you know, that wants to get started, but, but is afraid? What would you, what would you tell her to get her to take that leap of faith? That's a great question. Uh, I think I would tell them not, not to let fear control you. I think let love control you and, you know, be fearless. And, you know, success doesn't come from money. True success really just comes from your heart and what you love to do. And I think that's what I would give them. Just keep doing what you love to do, whatever you're passionate about. Just keep doing it and don't believe that you can't do it because believe me, you can. Look at me. I, I am not a professional artist and I am a, a young person. And when I first got into the NFT space, I thought no one was going to like my art. I thought people were not going to take me serious because I was a kid. I am a kid. And, you know, I is was the total opposite. It was they walked me in with warm arms they liked my art they believed in me and they kept in the they just basically walked me with love so i think it's really just a leap of faith but i believe that you could do anything you want to believe want to do if you just have love for it and you be, are really passionate about it so that's my advice for them oh 
Damn, I knew you were gonna close out strong. I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. For you to be 13 years old and just like wise beyond your years, you know, I, I don't even know what to say, but I'm so grateful that, you know, you are the future. I'm so grateful that each of you took the time to um, be with us and, you know, share these insights and your wisdom. And also the fact that, you know, I have to say this being an all female panel and just like showing the real face of, of, of Web3. Um, you all are doing amazing work and I am so grateful that we had the opportunity to share your stories. Um, we're going to make sure that the folks that are tuning in and, and all of the crypto for the culture community is able to keep up with your journeys. Um, I believe we have your social media handles. If there are any, you know, educational resources, because we all know the biggest barrier to entry is education, um, education of the mindset, you know, overcoming that I can't do it mindset um, or the technical aptitude, you know, to build in this space. So we want to make sure that uh, folks are able to, to keep up with you all. Thank you so very much. And um, that's the wrap for building in Web3. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Making money while we sleep. I check one, two. Hello. All right, Hello. good. Hey, gentlemen, Hello. how are you? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> All, All right. right. So, so you know that we couldn't possibly uh, kick off this panel. You know, we were talking about building in Web3, and uh, the resourcing is part and parcel to how we build in Web3. So super excited to have you all here at the Crypto Venture Capital and Funding Panel. Um, I don't know if you saw the panel before this one, but let me tell you, the ladies, I don't want to put the pressure on you, but I'm just saying that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> that's a very tough act to follow. Uh, but, I have, but I have faith in each of you, which is why you know, you're here and we're so excited to share you with the uh, Crypto for the Culture community. Before we get started, I just wanted to introduce our moderator. You know, Jeff Johnson is a personal mentor uh, to Nina and I and the team at Crypto Tutors. He's helped us build pitch decks. Um, he's helped us refine our narrative. Um, he's really the man with the master plan. And that's exactly why we wanted to make sure that he was the person to speak to each of you. Now, Jeff is the director for Virginia Tech Corporate Research Park. Uh, this is a $450 million tech center, um, or excuse me, this $450 million tech center is a leader in research, innovation, and growth from scratch to commercialization. Jeff uh, has mentored and supported hundreds of founders of early stage and high growth tech companies who've raised funding and launched successfully. He has a personal mission of helping women and people of color to be on a cap table, uh, and without further ado, please welcome Jeff Johnson. And I pass the virtual mic to you. <laughs> Hopefully uh, the sounds found, sounds good and everybody can hear me. Uh, listen, Lisa, uh, what a great, great honor it is to be among these leaders. Uh, I'm looking around my screen and I've read your bios, gentlemen, and uh, I am thoroughly impressed with who you are and what you do. And it's a pleasure to know you. And it wouldn't be possible without really uh, two of my rock stars, and these are two people who are not only leaders, um, but they're great people and they're great women leaders. And that's kind of where my passion is, is really around um, helping leaders succeed. I get joy out of, of seeing others succeed. And so that's why it's a pleasure for me to be with you guys here. Um, boy, I tell you, um, Lisa and Nina, they, they, are, they are the epitome of... Um, entrepreneurs who are really successful in making it happen. And entrepreneurs like that can't be successful without people like you. And so it's important that our listeners and everybody who's joined us from around the world hear from you uh, and, and really hear what it is you look for uh, in helping to be a catalyst for the growth of these kinds of companies. Uh, one other thing is I've been listening all day uh, Lisa and Nina, by the way, and I've been blown away. I've learned a lot. I don't come from the space, so you guys are gonna, um, you guys are gonna really teach me a lot as well. 
So without further ado, uh, let me start. Um, I just thank you again for that warm introduction, Lisa. This panel really is all about crypto, venture capital, and funding. When I talk to entrepreneurs around the country, most of the time at the top of their needs list is access to capital. And what those of you who are part of this crypto for the culture uh, experience right now should know that less than 3% of venture capital go to women and entrepreneurs of color who are founding and leading high tech, high growth, built to scale companies. Now, wait a minute, everybody. I've heard this all day and I've heard it mentioned in passing, but I wanted to, I wanted to marinate because this panel is a panel that really is the key to helping um, alleviate some of this. And, and why do we care? And why do I care? Because it's been said before, access to capital can provide an opportunity for entrepreneurs of color and women to lead these high tech, high growth companies like the kinds we're talking about in crypto and web three, such that they can build wealth. So what they do with that wealth to help us go at the wealth gap that exists. And not only that, reseed that wealth gap into the community such that we can pull more people that way. And so that's why it's important. That's why I'm passionate about it. And that's uh, why I'm here. So this is the perfect, perfect panel to watch if you are starting or thinking about starting your own business, because these leaders here will talk to you about what they look for, what they do, how their businesses and what they do. We will discuss how to gain funding and how to prepare. So we want to make sure at, that you're ready at the point where opportunity meets preparation, that you're ready. It's one thing to say, hey, we're going to be a great company and we're going to support this, but we need to be right where that opportunity exists. Um, we, we, we are um, here on this stage with me, first and foremost, is JK. JK, where are you? There you go. <laughs> JK, perfect. JK is the principal at Coinbase Ventures, and he's responsible for investing in early stage crypto and Web3 startups with a primary focus on companies building Web3, developer platforms, and tools. Welcome to you, JK. Thank you. Happy to be here. Great. Next. Now, Kristen, where are you, my friend? All right. Yeah. Perfect. Kristen. Now, I'm going to pronounce your last name. Is Navarez? Perfect. Navarez, Espanol? Sí, Espanol. Ay, ay. Okay. Bienvenidos. Um, he is a partner, is a venture partner at OP Crypto, the parent company of OP Venture Fund, and the OP Fund of Funds, everybody. OP Crypto Funds support early stage startups and oncoming, uh, and also oncoming fund managers looking to make long-term impact through blockchain technology. Christian is also the co-founder of Web3 Familia, right? an education platform with the mission to onboard, ready? One million Latinos to Web3. So welcome to you, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Great. Uh, finally, Zach. Zach's sitting back. He's relaxed, right? Zach's all cool. Always. <laughs> Listen, we got the last panel of the day. So no you know, pressure. we followed a great panel. So I think we do anyway. So Zach is the VP of accounting for Propeller Industries, I believe. That's right. And Prope Propeller Industries is a strategic finance and accounting partner for venture stage companies. From infrastructure to taxes to security, Zach is a wealth of knowledge to prepare your existing company for success. So again, welcome gentlemen. Thank you for being part of this panel and bringing your expertise. Thanks so much for, uh, for quarterbacking this. Yeah. All right, let's go it, let's do it, okay? Here's a softball. All right. What advice would you give to founders of crypto and Web3 startups when it comes to VC and funding? Who want to take that one first? 
Yeah, I, I can I can take that one. So you know, you know, again, just given you know my background. So just for reference, so I joined Coinbase Ventures about six and a half months ago, um, leading investments into infrastructure and, and developer tools. Um, prior background, kind of across product engineering, corporate strategy, having worked at Microsoft, and you know, been in the crypto space since since 2016. So you know, I've seen you know plenty of different innovative you know founders, you know, really kind of on the on the cutting edge. And I think like a couple of things that I particularly look for is one, you know, how do you tell your story from the perspective of really having a deep understanding of the problem and how you're going to be differentiated in solving that problem? And that goes all the way back to, you know, what's what's your founder story, right? What's your origin story? Um, you know, give me the context that will help me understand that you are the person to take this uh, company and vision forward. Um, we typically at Coinbase Ventures, we're investing at the earliest stages. Sometimes we're talking to companies that are, you know, pre-launch, pre-product. And so, you know, when we think about things like traction, yes, you might not have generated revenue, but what are the proof points of demand, right? I think Arthur Hayes, he talked about this earlier, like, you know, what is the different signal that you're getting from overall customers and how does that inform the product decisions that you're taking? And then finally, you know, making sure that there's some type of value alignment, value alignment in terms of, you know, what you're trying to bring to the market and how, you know, of that venture fund that you're speaking to, how they can help you achieve those goals. Yeah, fantastic. Anybody want to add to that? I mean, I could, give, like I could jump in. Yeah, I could give a, a, a different perspective um, because we, as part of our fund, as part of our fund of fund thesis, we back emerging fund managers, and um, there's three types of individuals that sort of we come across um, with different backgrounds that are raising their own funds. So either you come from traditional finance, um, investment banking, either private equity or trading, and sort of have been dabbling into the ecosystem and uh, raise your own vehicle, right? And then you've word how you've warehoused a couple of deals that you've deployed your own capital into. And sort of that's how you your vehicle was born and someone like us would come and back you, right? Another way to sort of um, launch your own vehicle would be either you are an operator, um, you've created your own startup within the Web3 ecosystem, you have an exit, um, and then you have some capital and then uh, you raise your own vehicle and then you come to us and people like us would back you. And then lastly, either you work at a Web3 native sort of a venture capital firm and obviously you have some experience there and then uh, eventually spin out and then raise your own sort of fund. And um, that's another sort of individual that we would back. And in general, sort of all three, there's not the, there's no one right way to sort of go on uh, and raise your own vehicle. Everyone has their own journey, but this would be the three different sort of most common um, journeys that people have um, in becoming uh, emerging fund managers and raising their first sort of um, Web3, uh, Web3, or just in general, emerging fund managers raising their own vehicles. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. And to look at this from even another angle, uh, so I'm a CPA by trade, and we typically represent uh, either the VCs in doing the due diligence before we start, you know, cutting checks, or we represent uh, these emerging startups. Uh, maybe they haven't raised capital yet, or they've raised a, a seed and they're getting ready for ABC and, and all the fun that comes with that, those processes. And uh, the biggest thing I can say is make sure that not only JK, as you said, know your story, but uh, yeah, make sure you have your, your proper foundation there as well. So that means knowing your numbers, that means having a proper financial model. So it may sound crass sometimes, but you need to know how do you make money? How is this going to be economically viable and be able to succinctly answer that question? Because in one form or another, that question will be asked. Great, great. So you, you, all three of you captured kind of the essence of a lot of the time that I spend with founders, preparing them to talk to you, basically, right? Uh, and if we do our job really well, they'll hit these three things. And, and this was really interesting. I heard JK talk about starting with the problem. We couldn't understand that um, more. And I think for those of you who are watching this, I thought that these were all three unbelievably, uh, uh, I mean, insightful kinds of comments from each of you. But starting with the problem and understanding what problem you're solving and from who, for who, right? And I think I heard mention 
um, the whole idea of value proposition and who are you delivering value to? And then finally, I heard something around, I'm going to call it customer discovery, where you've actually gone out and talked to customers. So when you three say to this founder, how do you know what you know? I'm going to say, and I know Nina and Lisa and the rest of the crypto team would say, oh, we talk to customers and we, we gain insight and we know and we have quantified that. How important is it for you? Uh, when people are building these companies to have talked to customers for them, because you're all investing at the early stage, sounds like. Can somebody talk to that? Yeah, I think the the customer reference is very important, right? If you even think about like in the in the crypto markets and from a VC perspective, like deal cycles are actually extending. And that's mainly because, you know, VCs are being more deliberate um, in the due diligence phase, right? And that can be a matter of, you know, collecting founder references that can be, you know, talking to customers to validate, you know, what is their level of willingness to pay. And so, you mm -hmm. know, the customer discovery, that's, that's the thing that makes me perk up, right? Because not only can you connect your understanding of the problem and the solution that you're building, but you're also validating that this is a real need um, that yeah. needs to be brought to the market. Yes. And just listening to your customer base means that you'll be able to pivot because no startup, no product, no service is perfect on that, that MVP on that 1.0. So knowing that you, one, have the process in place to get through the iterative uh, cycles here of 1.1, 1.2, in whatever form that means, just one, having the understanding that you have to do that, and then two, actually executing on that is a huge deal. And then, yeah, and then you, for you, us, go ahead. Go ahead, Kristen. No, and then for us, right, the customer would be who are the founders that you're backing, right? And then if you, you need to have sort of your thesis, um, a solid thesis in place to sort of attract the right founder, um, whether it's, you know, you're investing in the metaverse or you're investing in DeFi or you're investing in infrastructure. So if you have that set thesis, obviously you attract the right um, founders. And obviously because of the subject matter expertise beyond just capital, um, you'll be able to add more value there. Yeah, great, great point. You used the term, I hope everybody on the call, and I think uh, Zach, you used it. You said pivot. I think you said pivot, is that right? I sure did. Okay, good. So let's raise up pivot, everybody. At some point, uh, you may have, if you're doing your customer discovery, you may have to pivot, zoom in, zoom out, new segment, whatever, uh, unless you got it right the first time. Of course, you're the smartest one in the room. And everybody on this call knows that you get it right the first time, right? Don't we? Of course. Everyone bats <laughs> a thousand. Come on. Perfect. Hey, what sectors, when you think about the sectors, you guys, what sectors has your companies invested in that have re done really, really well? Yeah, I think I, at least from the Coinbase Venture side, right? So we have close to 400 companies in a portfolio, took a very broad indexing approach across overall crypto and Web3. Um, now it's they're coalescing across five core sectors, one being DeFi, um, two, uh, Web3 protocols and infrastructure, uh, three, developer tooling, of course, uh, four, NFT metaverse and GameFi, and then five, you know, kind of your traditional centralized uh, uh, finance or, or CFI. So I think like those are the five sectors that we're overall prioritizing. From my purview, I primarily focus on, you know, tooling for developers, right? We need to make it easier um, for developers to build applications on top of the blockchain. And so those are, you know, various areas um, that really excite me. Great. Who else? I mean, and then from our perspective, so I could talk a little bit about our venture vehicle and our thesis there where um, we focus on DeFi, GameFi, DAOs and the creator economy, but I'll focus more on the GameFi or the gaming aspect of Web3. And it's a space that um, we've deployed into and backed um, many projects and sort of our, our, our winners there have been, you know, Merit Circle, Aurori, which are sort of gaming guilds or gaming focused Web3 on um, projects um, and, and sort of that's that's been sort of the, the winners for us. Um, and I guess we entered at the right time, but who knows? So obviously, in the next three mm -hmm. to five years, um, it's a it's a space that's going to continue to evolve and, and and let's see where where we end up. And likewise, it, it's a it's a complicated answer because we look across a few different verticals. So we look at the infrastructure, we look at foundations, we we look at. Uh, Web3 is a very broad category, and I'm sure we could spend the next hour and a half just talking about 
that and what that even means. Um, NFT and gaming, of course, and then media. So those five verticals are all very interesting in their own unique ways to be very careful with the language there. Um, mm -hmm. And beyond that, it depends. So I think, Christian, you hit it on the head when it comes to the team. At an early stage, the team is sometimes as important or more important than the product or service itself. So if you have a good team or if you have a great team, it almost doesn't matter what what's being built because you're investing in the people. And then you can build processes, you can build infrastructure, you can provide capital around that. But having that core team is is everything. Yeah, I couldn't under I couldn't underscore that that more. Um, you know, if you if you're in if you're in any of my classes, um, pursuing your executive MBA or with innovation and things like that, you're going to hear me say this, and I want to say it out loud because Nina and Lisa have heard me say this. I have also told them that you guys bet the jockey as much as you do the horse. And it usually resonates with people because you're looking at what, when we talk about the jockey, what are you looking for in founders? Tell me what it is, what is that umph that you guys are looking for in founders and share it with all these founders who are on this call right now so they know either how to get it, how to make sure you know they got it, or, or at least to convince you that they can. Go ahead. Uh, just to kick it off, uh, one quality that's usually pretty universal in some of the best founders out there is knowing what you know and what you most importantly, what you don't know and surrounding yourself with with the people who know things that you don't know so that you have a, a solid complementary team. And so whether that means bringing in the right partners, whether equity, contract, whatever the case, or bringing in third parties who maybe can fill in those gaps. That's a big, big foundational point. I guess. Yeah, plus one. So that I would say, you know, like looking for that hustle and grit, right? Like, you know, you know, kind of thinking about, you know, not necessarily like, you know, how, like what was your origin story as it relates to, you know, kind of developing like your crypto native experience, right? I mean, uh -huh. you know, I always love to hear, how did you enter into this space? Like, what was that light bulb that you had to say? Everybody's got a story. Exactly. Yeah. I'm ready to go into Web3 full time. And again, going back to my earlier statement, how does that inform, you know, your understanding of the problem and, you know, the solution that you're trying to build? So, you know, really looking for like the hustle and grit. I think that's the most exciting aspect for me. And then to, piggy, to piggyback off of um, Jonathan, yeah, grit and conviction, right? Like, do you know the space? Why do you know the space? Um, and, and I think what Zach said is, is, is just on point, right? Like know what you know and know what you don't know and obviously know how to leverage that and, and, and be okay with sort of um, asking for help or surrounding yourself with good teammates that are going to sort of complement what you don't know and double down on your convictions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So founders know what you don't know and show some hustle, grit and some conviction when you come to see these guys and other and others as well, because know that they're they're betting on you as much as they're betting on whatever idea or innovation you're bringing forward. And that kind of that's kind of what I'm hearing more than anything else. That's that's great. That's great advice. Um, OK, so I'm diving in and thinking about, OK, so you've got this this these great founders who are on this call and they're saying, listen, I, I am the one I'm in these sectors that you you have in here. Once those numbers make sense and I've said it's a great business model, what else are you looking for? Well, to make sure that the foundation is there. So they have an entity properly set up. They have all their legal documents in working order so that due diligence is uh, as close to a breeze as it, as it ever could be. But uh, even in the best of times, it's still due diligence is, is tricky. Um, mm -hmm. But the low hanging fruit to make sure that there's no potential hiccups. So, you know, uh, having a cap table in order and understanding how that's comprised uh, and then documentation that. Uh, people get really sick of me saying that word because I say it a lot, but you need to make sure that you have all of your documentation, whether legal, financial, operational, or otherwise in proper working order. Right. We need for everybody on here, if you're on here and you're in my panel, we want you, if you are underrepresented to be on that cap table, that Zach wants you, we want you to have a position there um, that you can actually grow from. Who else? 
Yeah, I would say I would add on to that, like after understanding like business model traction, you know, the founder themselves, you know, that's when I'm probably spending some time looking at the competitive landscape and, you know, finally communicating like, you know, what's their differentiation, right? Why do they need to bring this solution to the market? Um, and then and then going back to, you know, what was mentioned earlier, I typically at the end of each call, I typically ask for one to two customer references because I want to be able to kind of connect with the customer and I want to validate everything that you're telling me. And in most cases, that's what can make a deal. Heavy mm-hmm. importance on you know uh, customer validation. Okay, great. And so it's and, part of your due diligence. And so you may I, call and reach out to some of my customers. Correct. That I said I that I said with conviction why I knew this was a great business for you to invest in. Right. Spot on. Yeah. Go ahead, Kristen. You were jumping in. Um, yeah. Now, just to add to Zach, right? Once you're moving forward, sort of with like a second or third call. Uh, meeting be organized right like have a data room have an organized data room and make sure you sort of are proactive and sort of seeing what the next question or request or ask may be from a, a sort of a vc for that due diligence process and and have that ready to sort of the more prepared you are the faster you can move mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know one one of the things that we're we're doing and I'm writing down if you see me nod it's because I actually am taking notes from you guys cuz you're all brilliant and smart and I'm going to learn something from you I heard elements of what I would consider the pitch deck but let's talk about that for a moment cuz that's going to be the primary vehicle that many on this call will be using to raise money right and um what do you like to see in a pitch deck what are you looking for? And so for those of you on the other side of this call, we should be taking notes. Uh, a succinct story. So, I mean, this sounds terrible, but it it pains me to have to go through a pitch deck that's 37 slides long. Um, it, it's just, it shouldn't be homework. This should be fun. So uh, a succinct story, what's the problem? What's the solution in 30 seconds or less? what are we doing here? You know, what, what is the the end goal? Uh, and of course, making sure that we understand who is the team. And then it's funny how, I don't know if you guys have seen this as well, but sometimes the ask is not obvious. So mm-hmm. why are we talking? You know what, do you need money? Right. Do you need uh, additional founders? Do you need a network? Right. Uh, what are we doing here? Right. And then if we are talking about funding, how are you going to use the funds? So use of proceeds is a big deal. Because that shows that one, you're paying attention, and then two, we know where the money's going, and that's that's obviously very important. Perfect. Yeah, I think plus one is everything Zach said. I think you know, since I invest primarily into infrastructure and developer tools, is more technical in nature, right? Kind of going a layer deep um, beyond just a solution. Like, tell me about the technology. Like, what trade okay. you make. Um, And then, you know, kind of understand like your overall differentiation. I really like to see like the competitive positioning uh, for the company that you're you're pitching. And then, you know, couldn't agree more, uh, Zach, in terms of, you know, making the ass very, very clear. And, and And to add to that, I mean, to Zach's point, keep it concise, keep it sweet and short. And obviously for you, it's you have certainty in your project, um, walk in with confidence and the way you sort of transfer that certainty either via words or the presentation should be in a smooth way so people could understand um you know that transfer of certainty and they able uh, sort of maybe move forward on that yeah okay so you want to have some confidence as, as well in what you're doing um i'm going to drill down on technology for a second because i get a chance to work with a lot of uh principal investigators and um, as some of you may know, I do a lot of work with NASA and others who are these incredibly principal investigators and creators. Um, but many of them, I have to spend a tremendous amount of time, and I'm looking at you, JK, because you mentioned it. Um, I'm having to spend a lot of time with them, telling them rise above the technology first and make sure we have a, a problem that we're solving. And, and, and then I'm kind of looking at you, uh, Kristen, uh, I mean, um, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm looking at you, uh, Christian, when, when we talked about falling in love with the technology and just forgetting about or not 
bringing along the business aspect. I mean, do you guys see that? I mean, I guess, JK, you mentioned this whole wanting to go deep. Man, they will take you deep. I mean, you guys will be talking deep and 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 and, and uh, others will be over there going, wait a minute, hold on. Zach would be saying, hey, wait a minute. All right. Who's the customer again? And so tell me about, you know, when you talk about going deep, um, you know, about challenges and cautions around too deep, if any. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, again, trying to be concise is, is very important. So you kind of go from like, this is my this is my problem statement. Um, this is my, you know, validated hypothesis based on like, you know, the customer feedback that I've that I've received. This is the mm -hmm. solution that we're going to build to address that to address that specific problem. And then this is like the technology stack, right, that I've decided to bring to the market. Because again, we're investing into dev tooling. And you know, your 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 customer is a developer. That is the persona that you're trying to sell into. To. So, you know, what's going to make those developers excited based on some of your technical choices? And so at least providing some level of perspective um, at, on our side of the house is, is very helpful because this is a very technical space. We heard the pitch right before, you know, building in, in Web3. Um, and I thought that was absolutely amazing. And so, you know, being able to kind of infuse that type of, you know, kind of technical strategy and critical thinking into your talk track, I think is very important. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Good point. And I, I think in general, if you can sort of convey the messaging and graduate beyond the technical aspect and sort of highlight the use case of that technology for like a commercial use, mm -hmm. um, I think that's very powerful. And sort of if you could sort of translate that messaging in a simple, concise manner that, you know, a, a quick example, when you send an email, do you really understand what the tech behind the email going from point A to point B, you don't, right? So I guess just making sure that one, obviously you understand the tech stack, the tech that you're using, um, elaborate that, but build from that and sort of showcase the business case or the use case available that eventually you could sort of um, scale that and, and, and make it commercial. Yeah, great point. Great point. And, you and know, one of the things I would- Elevator pitch. Go ahead, no, no, go ahead. No, I, I'm just nailing down the elevator pitch. It's it's amazing how many founders um, have not perfected the ability to say, this is my business. You know, this is what this technology does. And this is why you need it. This is why someone needs it. And here's why you should be a part of this team. And yeah. it's very specific, like that in that duration of time, just very simple, plain English. And then when we want to nerd out, that's when we dive in and that's when we have the three hour long call and, we go through as deep as humanly possible that, but getting through that first stage is how you get to second, third, fourth levels and how we can really get into the, the fun nerd stuff. Yeah, that's, that's important. You know, they're flying along at, you know, 10,000 feet and then we're going to dive down and nerd out for a little bit. And then I need to be able to come back up and continue flying and kind of exactly. Right. And that's a skill. So for everybody on here, that's, that's non-trivial. We say oh, it's not easy. It, it's it's non-trivial, everybody. Um, not everybody can do that, but it's it, it's it's a skill you build with practice and work. Um, and it and it sounds like that's going to be very important. What would you say to founders who have not yet found their perfect investor? And the reason I, I ask this question is because I run into um, companies who have talked to 10, 50, you know, a hundred, you saw the stories. I've talked to a hundred investors, you know, and I didn't really get a deal. Um, what would you say to, to them around, for those who are, are still looking for how to match, you know, what they do with potential investors? Any thoughts on that? Well, I think Go ahead. No, please. Check in. Yeah, I think that's a matter of, you know, again, understanding, right, it, all of the investors, like most nine times out of 10 have a, a website and understanding, like, what are their key theses, right? I can list it out, like, are the five focus areas that, you know, we are are targeting. So just having a clear understanding of, you know, like, what, what they're investing in, you know, reading through perhaps, like, some of the content that they've published and looking at, you know, some of the similar um, deals in your space. Um, that they've uh, that they've invested in and essentially like, you know, how do you kind of tailor that messaging uh, to that mm -hmm. specific investor? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Um, and I would say work the network. So everyone has friends and family and you know, professional colleagues and such. So if you haven't found that right person yet, you know, I, I, we talked about hustle at the jump here. That's all part of the game here. And the other caveat I would put to that, see how much you can do without funding. So yeah. one scenario we like to walk through, and this is one of those things that ne never should see the light of day, but just for your own knowledge as a founder, go through that doomsday scenario. So what if it doesn't make money or what if you can't bring capital in? What then? You know, what yeah. is the plan? What is the absolute worst case scenario to keep this going? And you'll be very surprised to see what you figure out in, in those specific situations. Yeah, hey guys, I think uh, I think I'm getting a hook. Um, <laughs> you, you don't want the hook from 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 Nina and Lisa, but I'm thinking I'm getting the hook because I'm enjoying this a lot. And you know, in terms of closing thoughts, I first of all want to thank each of you for your wisdom and your honesty and and your authenticity. And each of you obviously come across through this screen as being very authentic and you care. Um, and you, you are um, the folks others want to, to reach out to. And so what I'd like to say, you know, in closing, thank you guys for your time. For those of you who are listening, you know, there's some real key strong takeaways about starting with the problem, you know, focusing on your team, knowing your numbers, um, tell your story. Everybody's got a story. Um, you know, one of the things we do is if you're not familiar with doing this, we do a process called storyboarding. I storyboard the pitch before I start to build all the data and numbers into it, et cetera. This is the arc of my story. And so you guys know it. So I want to thank you all. Thank you, uh, Lisa. Thank you, Nina, for giving us an opportunity. And Thank each one of you, this esteemed panel. You guys are fantastic. Hopefully we can reach out to you again. And let's get this back. Let's get the band back together. Cool? Cool, cool. Yes, maybe. Good. Thank you. Thank you for having us. All right. Thank you very much. I think that's it. And I think they'll move us to the next one. Nina, Lisa. Wow. I can't believe we did it. Oh my goodness. I just want to say thank you for being an amazing uh, business partner, uh, best friend, Nina Blankenship. You are a phenomenon. Um, I want to thank the Crypto Tutors team. I want to thank, you know, our panelists who, you know, just gave us the game on how to secure funding and lending irrespective of the market conditions. But as we close out Crypto for the Culture, defy all odds. We want to leave you with this public service announcement. You have the power to be the change that you want to see. There's no denying that these are perilous times we're living in, but this is also a unique moment in the history of humanity where the possibility of users having more control over their data, digital creators owning their work and can capitalize on their creations Users are even compensated for our time, which we covered in crypto rewards, and internet that's more secure and efficient, which creates better incentives for everyone involved. And guess what? All of us, wherever we are in the world, providing you have an internet connection, are invited. <laughs> the third iteration of the internet, Web3, offers the possibility of, for crypto's rallying cry. Where's my hat? For crypto's rallying cry, we're all going to make it to be brought to life. We need you, the global citizen, to build the future. So these ideas, this, this we're all going to make it ethos won't just be a utopian idea or ideology. But we at Crypto Tutors also recognize that education is one of the biggest barriers to entry. And that's why we built an award-winning crypto educational company. That's why we're working alongside Cash App, Fidelity, Arculus, A16Z's Culture Leadership Fund, Ifani, Foundry, Trust Machines, Manifold, Tally Labs, Red Panda, Health MD, Vibranium, to curate this experience where we also brought you diverse leaders and our allies, the most brilliant minds on the planet, might I add, to discuss economic empowerment, 
collective advancement, and how to harness the power of technology to maximize our earning potential while retaining our intellectual property. Our wish for you is that you leave today feeling uplifted, empowered, inspired to build a future that we all want to see. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts for joining us at Crypto for the Culture. Join us and together we shall defy all odds. <laughs> Lisa, you did so good. I'm so happy. Everybody loved your energy. The chat was blowing up and everybody was thoroughly engaged. If you're watching this and you haven't RSVP'd, please go to cryptofortheculture.io, fill out the form. We're going to send you this recording, the giveaways, the, um, the resources, all of the education that you need to set yourself up for success. Thank you and please watch next time. D D D D D D D D